Preface to Our Search for a Wilderness, an account of two ornithological expeditions to Venezuela and British Guiana by Mary Blair Beebe and C. William Beebe. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sue Anderson. Our Search for a Wilderness, an account of two ornithological expeditions to Venezuela and British Guiana. Preface. In the following pages, we have set down the tale of two searches for a wilderness. These two private expeditions were undertaken for the purpose of learning something about the birds and other wild creatures of countries further south than any we had yet visited. Both trips were successful, for the regions we explored were wilderness wonderlands, full of beauty, abounding in the romance which ever enhances wild creatures and wild men, and they were part of the great zoological dark continent, which we hope to devote our lives to studying. On our first search, the collecting of live birds was incidental, although we brought back 40 specimens of 14 species. On the second search, however, we took with us an assistant, Mr. Lee S. Crandall. By his assiduity in trapping and in arousing the interest of native coolie and black boys, he assembled a splendid collection of almost 300 living birds of 51 species. These we brought to the New York Zoological Park, where no less than 33 species were new to the collection. In addition, many small mammals and reptiles were collected. Part 1. We left New York on February 22, 1908, on the Royal Mail Steamship Trent, and after touching at Jamaica, Colon, Savanilla, and La Guaira, we disembarked at Port of Spain, Trinidad, on March 9th. Leaving this port in a Venezuelan sloop, we cruised among the Caños north of the Orinoco Delta and explored the country about the Venezuelan Pitch Lake, La Berea. To Mr. Eugene André of Trinidad, we are deeply indebted for a hundred kindnesses which did much to make our trip a success. We wish also to express gratitude to Mr. Molay, Mr. Andus, and especially to the late Mr. Ellis Grell. Part 2. On the 15th of February, 1909, we sailed from New York on the steamship Copenhagen of the Royal Dutch West Indian Mail, and with only a single stop, Barbados, reached Georgetown, British Guiana on the 24th of the same month. In British Guiana, we made three expeditions, two as the guests of Mr. and Mrs. Gaylord Wilshire, having as our objective points two gold mines in the midst of the wilderness, the first at Huri in the northwest and second on the little Aremu in central Guiana. On these expeditions, we were spared all the usual annoyances of transportation. Food and servants and everything in the mines were put at our service to facilitate our study of the nature life of the country. The third trip to the Savannah region further south was made at the invitation of Mr. and Mrs. Lindley Vinton, two Americans living in Georgetown, who placed their home at our disposal while we remained in Georgetown. During our entire stay in British Guiana, we received unfailing courtesy and kindness from the governor, Sir Frederick Hodgson, down to the great black hospitable wilderness police. Professor J. B. Harrison allowed us to use the old aviaries at the botanical gardens, and with Mr. James Rodway of the Georgetown Museum and Mr. B. Howell Jones, extended to us all the courtesies in his power. Wherever in this volume it has seemed best for any reason that certain chapters should be written by one of the authors alone, 
the writer's name has been given at the head of the chapter in all chapters not thus designated the authors have collaborated mary blair beebe c william beebe january 1910 end of preface Chapter 1, Part 1 of Our Search for a Wilderness by Mary Blair Beebe. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Our First Search, Venezuela. Chapter 1, The Land of a Single Tree. Part 1. One day, late in March 1908, just as the tropical sun was sinking from view, our barefooted Spanish crew pulled up anchor from the muddy bottom of Port of Spain's harbor. Slowly the sails filled and the spray began to fly from the bow as we steered straight into the crimson path of the sunset. Behind us the lofty Trinidad ranges glowed softly. Great velvety peaks and ridges, purpled by distance, gilded by the last rays of day. Then the twilight passed swiftly, as if the sun had been quenched by the waters which covered its face. The mountains became merged into the darkness of the sky, and the city of busy life behind us melted into a linear constellation of twinkling lights. We had chartered a little sloop of twenty-one tons, the Josefa Jacinta, manned by a captain, a cook, and a crew of three. At her masthead flew the flag of Venezuela. With a month's provisions in the hold and all the varied paraphernalia of a naturalist, we were headed for the northern part of the Orinoco Delta in search of the primitive wilderness of which we had dreamed. Jamaica, Colon, Savanilla, La Guaira had passed in quick succession, and we were surprised to find Trinidad the most modern and wide awake of all. The well-appointed hotels, the trolleys, electric lights, museums, and newspapers of Port of Spain, the wireless station even now flashing its aerial messages from yonder peak, all boded ill for our search for primeval conditions. Was there no spot left on earth, we wondered, which could truthfully be called an untrodden wilderness? Jungles, untouched by axe or fire, where guns had not replaced bows and arrows, where the creatures of the wilderness were tame through unfamiliarity with human beings. The Southern Cross rose and straightened its arms. The Pole Star hung low in the north. As the night wore on, an ugly sea arose, and half buried our little craft in foam and spray. A cross wind disputed our advance, and the strong tide drove us out of our course. But our captain had navigated these waters for more than half a century, and we had no fears. The following day was as wild as the night, and no living thing appeared in sky or sea save a host of milky jellyfish stomolophus miliagris they kept below the surface and seemed to suffer no damage from the roughness of the water in an area of a square yard we counted twenty and for hour after hour we passed through vast masses of them extending to the furthest waves visible on either hand and as deep down as our eyes could penetrate myriads upon myriads of these lowly beings each vibrating with life and yet unable to guide its course against the tide or to do aught but pulsate slowly along later in the day although the water grew less rough the whole company sank lower in the muddy depths muddy because the brown waters of the great orinoco held sway over all this gulf and scatter out at sea the sediment washed from the banks far inland. Finally, the storm passed, and we saw a blue cloud to the north, hinting at the great mountain ranges of the Spanish main. Ahead, a low green mist along the horizon 
told us we were nearing shore. This became more and more distinct until we could make out individual trees. By noon we had left the tumultuous waters of the Gulf of Paria and were floating quietly on a broad stream between two majestic walls of green. We had entered our wilderness and the silence and beauty of our reception seemed all the more vivid after the noise and turbulence of the wind and water behind us. Our first impression was of a vast solitude. It was midday and the tide was almost at its height. With limp sails we drifted silently onward, not a sound of life coming from the green depths about us. We skirted the mangroves along the south bank, moving more and more slowly, until at last we rested motionless on the water between the blazing sky overhead and the muddy depths beneath. The tide had reached its highest and, like the living creatures of the jungle, rested in the midday heat. The captain gave a gruff order in Spanish and the anchor splashed into the water dragging the chain after with a sudden roar and jangle which echoed from shore to shore, jarring the silence as would a shriek of pain in a cathedral. A chatter came from the mangroves near at hand, and high up among the dense foliage we saw the first life of the continent, a wistful little human face gazing out at us, a capuchin monkey striving with wrinkled brows to make out what we were. At his call, two others came and looked. Then, as our sail came down with a rattle of halyards, the trio fled through the branches with all the speed which four hands and a tail could lend. We spent the afternoon in getting our floating home ready for use. No more waves would be encountered, so everything was unlashed. Stereo glasses, camera plates, and ammunition were placed ready to hand. The galley stove was moved far forward, and a mosquito-proof tent of netting was erected under the tarpaulin in the stern. The sun had sunk low in the west when we saw a long, narrow dugout canoe coming downstream. An Indian woman and her baby were crouched in the bow, while in the stern a naked Indian paddled swiftly and silently. His skin shone like coppery bronze in the sunlight. His long black hair was bound back from his face by a thong of hide. In front of him rested a bow and arrows and a long fish spear. Silently he approached and in silence he passed, unheeding our salutations. One more beauty of this wild wonderland was vouchsafed us before nightfall. We had been disappointed in the birds. Where were the myriads of waterfowl of which we had heard? We had seen nothing, not a single feather. But now the scene slowly changed. The tide was falling rapidly, swirling and eddying past the boat and the roots of the mangroves began to protrude, their long stems shining black until the water dried from them. Mud flats appeared, and suddenly, without warning, a living flame passed us, and we had seen our first scarlet ibis. Past the dark green background of mangrove foliage, the magnificent bird flew swiftly, flaming with a brilliance which shamed any pigment of human art. Blood-red, intensest vermilion, deepest scarlet, all fail to hint of the living color of the bird. Before we could recover from our delight, a flock of twenty followed, flying close together with bills and feet scarlet like the plumage. They swerved from their path and alighted on the mud close to the mangroves and began feeding at once. Then a trio of snowy white egrets with trailing plumes floated overhead. Others appeared above the tops of the trees. A host of tiny sandpipers skimmed the surface of the water and scurried over the flats. Great cocoy herons swept 
majestically into view curlews and plover assembled in myriads lining the mud flats at the water's edge while here and there like jets of flame against the mud walked the vermilion ibises terns with great yellow bills flew about the sloop and skimmers ploughed the surface of the tide in endless furrows macaws began to pass shrieking as they flew two and two together and then night closed quickly over all from the zenith the sun had looked down upon a stream as quiet as death it sank upon a scene full of the animation of a myriad forms of life as dusk settled down and hid the shore from our eyes another sense was aroused and to our ears came the sounds of night in these tropical jungles a thousand cries moans crashes all mysterious unexplainable in time we became so accustomed to them that we could distinguish repetitions and details but this first night brought only a confused chorus of delightful mystery now broken by a moment of silence now rising to an awe-inspiring climax one sound only remained clear in our memory often repeated now uttered in lower now in higher tones a terrible choking sigh it might have been the last death gasp of some great monkey or the pitiful utterance of hopelessness of a madman with the turn of the tide we raised anchor and drifted through the night mile after mile for six hours and then anchored again and thus it was that we came to our wilderness not until we had been in the mangrove jungle for many days did we begin to realize its vastness its mystery its primeval character just four hundred and ten years ago christopher columbus sailed through the gulf we had left and gazed on the dark forest in the heart of which we now were throughout the whole extent of the mangrove wilderness we found no hint that conditions were not as they were in fourteen ninety eight one of the most astonishing things about the mangrove forest is the apparent diversity of its plant life until one actually comes within reach of trunk and leaves it is impossible to believe that all this forest is composed of a single species of plant the foliage of some of the trees is light of others dark here stands a clump of pale beech-like trunks there a dark rough-barked individual is seen the manner of growth of the young and old trees is so different that a confusion of mingled trees shrubs and vines seems to confront one but everywhere the mangrove reigns supreme it is the only vegetable growth which can gain a footing in this world of salt water in fact it makes its own footing entangling and holding mud and debris about its stems and ever blindly reaching out dangling roots like the legs of gigantic spiders far out on the tip of a lofty branch a mangrove seed will germinate before it falls assuming the appearance of a loaded club from eight to fifteen inches in length one day it lets go and drops like a plummet into the soft mud where it sticks upright soon the tide rises and if there is too strong a current the young plant is swept away to perish far out at sea but if it can maintain its hold roots soon spring out and the ideal of the mangrove is realized the purpose for which all this interesting phenomena is intended the forest has gained a few yards and mud and leaves will soon choke out the intervening water the mangroves have still another method of gaining new territory aerial roots are thrown out from branches high in air 
swinging downward and outward with a curve which sometimes winds three or four yards ahead. Like hawsers thrown from a vessel to a wharf, these roots clutch at the mud beneath, and where the current runs swiftly, they swing and dangle in vain until they have grown so heavy that they touch bottom some distance downstream. We made use of these dangling roots as anchors for our canoe, bending the elastic, unattached end upward and springing it over the gunwale. Throughout all this region there is not a foot of solid ground. In one place we pushed a tall chute some eight feet in height straight down through the mud and it went out of sight. A man falling on this mud out of reach of aid would vanish as in a quicksand. So the wild creatures of the mangroves must either swim, fly, or climb. No terrestrial beings can exist there. We once selected a favorable place and for 50 yards made our way over the roots and branches before exhaustion and an impassable gap of mud and water stopped all progress. As never before, we realized how safe from man are the denizens of these strange swamps. Monkeys fled swiftly before us, birds rose and flew overhead, while we painfully crept and pulled ourselves along over the slippery stems. More wonderful even than the coral polyps are these mangroves, for by this plant alone all this region has been rescued from the sea and built up into land. In future years, as the mud banks become higher and are fertilized by the ever-falling leaves, other growths will appear, and finally the coasts of the continent will be thus extended by many scores of miles of fertile soil. A network of narrow channels stretches through this wilderness and allowed us to explore the far interior in our shallow curiara, or dugout. Thus we spent days and weeks in search of the creatures which lived in this land of a single tree, and here we learned how delightful the climate of such a region can be. Every night we slept under blankets, and during the day the temperature ranged from 66 degrees at 5 and 6 o'clock in the morning to about 86 degrees at noon, although we were within 9 degrees of the equator. One could paddle all day with more comfort than on a hot summer day in the north. By day, mosquitoes were generally absent, and only a few biting flies reminded us of the terrible insect scourges of the tropics. Life was delightfully new and strange, with the spice of danger ever attendant upon the exploration of unknown lands. End of chapter 1 Part 1。Chapter 1, Part 2 of Our Search for a Wilderness by Mary Blair Beebe. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The fishes attracted our attention from the first. When we came on deck before sunrise for a plunge, our little vessel would be surrounded by hosts of catfish. Pseudonipterus nodosus, all, like our sloop, headed upstream against the tide. They would bite indifferently at bait, a bit of cloth, or a bare hook, and were delicious eating. On the bottom, our hooks would sometimes be taken by great fierce whiskered cats, bedecked with long streamers, which gave no end of trouble before they were quieted. They were pale yellow, and the head and back were encased in bone. Maestro, the cook, called them the crucifix fish, and later showed us why. On the under surface of the bony armor is a large cross with a halo about it just above the arms. The crew never caught one of these fish without making the sign of the cross in their right palm. When the tide was half down, the funniest of puff fishes Calomesis citacus, or tambourines, as the captain called them, 
would take our bait. They were from three to five inches long, white below, and pale greenish above, crossed by seven black bands, the first across the mouth and the seventh at the tip of the caudal fin. There was also a black patch at the base of the pectoral fins. The iris was bright lemon yellow. When gently scratched on the lower parts, or sometimes even when just lifted from the water, they would swell up into a round ball. They were covered with short, stiff bristles, which stood out on end when the fish was inflated, and their comical appearance was increased by the four rodent-like incisor teeth in the front of the mouth. When thus inflated with air, they were helpless for a time, and if thrown back, floated belly upward at the mercy of the wind and current until they were able to collapse to normal size. On one of our first excursions among the mangroves in our small canoe, we made a most interesting discovery. Here and there, sprawled out on the mud flats, were small crocodiles, and occasionally a large one would rush off into the water at our approach. Hugging the edge of the tide where the ripples lapped back and forth on the black ooze were many other living creatures. For a time, we could not make them out, but finally, drifting silently upon a whole school, we knew them for four-eyed fish, anableps, anableps, strange creatures which we had hoped to see. We came to a tiny bayou, shaped like a bottle, from which four little blue herons flew as we approached. We placed our dugout, cork-like, athwart the mouth, and anchored with our crossed paddles. The air was warm. Bees hummed about the tiny four-parted flowers of the mangroves, and a great blue morpho butterfly flapped past, mirrored in the water beneath. Then came tragedy, never far off in this land of superabundant life. A small clay-colored crocodile made a sudden rush at a ripple, and a quartet of four eyes shot from the water in frantic fear. One was slower than the rest, and the fierce jaws of the diminutive reptile just grazed him. Another fell back downward in the ooze, and in a twinkling was caught and dragged into the depths. No wonder the poor little four eyes are ever on the lookout for danger, and spend most of their time where they merge with the ripples along the shore when such enemies are on the watch for them. A whir of wings sounded, and a kingfisher alighted within arm's reach. But such a kingfisher, the veriest might, clad in a robe of brilliant emerald and orange. So small was he that it seemed as if the tiniest of minnows must choke him. He seemed to be of the same opinion, for while we watched him, he caught only the insects which passed him in mid-air or which were floating on the water. By far the most numerous and in their way the most interesting of the mangrove's inhabitants were the crabs. There were untold millions of them, all small, all active and keen of vision. If we sat quietly, they would appear from everywhere peeping out like little gnomes from their perches on the mangroves, forever playing their noiseless little fiddles. These tiny tree folk not only played, but danced. Let us picture a scene constantly enacted, so close to us that we could all but touch the performers. Two crabs approach each other, now fiddling vigorously, now waving their diminutive pincers back and forth over their heads as a ballet dancer waves her arms. They move never in straight lines, but sideways, now running back a few steps, now forward, until at last they meet, and each, grasping the other's claws, raises them aloft, and then, for five minutes, they circle about in most ludicrous imitation of a waltz. All this usually takes place on the lower surface of a mangrove trunk, the inverted position apparently making no less secure the footing of the little dancers. We could not decide whether this performance was in the nature of courtship or 
just pure play what we did discover concerning the lives of these crabs was full of interest hundreds of the smallest sized ones lived in holes in the mud and when the tide went down they came out and ran about intent on some all-important business of their little existence another class of larger individuals had their holes near the roots of the mangroves one rarely two good-sized crab apparently taking possession of each root here he disported himself running up and down from the water into the air with no change of speed and here strangest of all he grew to resemble his home root there was as great diversity among the roots as among the larger trunks whitish black mottled and all intervening shades it was a fact of which we had hundreds of daily proofs that the crabs were so like their particular root that often we could not detect the quiescent crustacean when within a foot of our faces there was one group of five black roots forming a rough circle about a single mottled root as we approached a crab ran down each stalk into the water and as we peered down and saw them go into their holes we could at a glance tell the mottled crab from the five black ones even the roots which were as yet a foot or more above the bottom mud each had their occupant which thus had to swim upward from his hole before he could grasp his swaying perch a third class of crabs lived among the higher trunks and branches of the mangroves and except where there was a high road of some large trunk dipping into the water these less fortunate fellows had to scamper in frantic haste up the roots of their larger brethren the indignant owner would rush at the trespasser with uplifted pincers sometimes forcing him to leap for his life where an unusually large tree was frequented by many crabs their carapaces bore a close resemblance to its pattern and hue but among these more aerial and roving crabs the mimicry was on the whole less striking than among the sedentary class in the latter protective coloration was carried to a greater degree of perfection than i have ever seen it elsewhere these were loath to leave their roots and swim preferring to run swiftly down until they reached the mud this habit made it easy to catch them merely by taking the end of the root aboard and shaking it when the unsuspecting crab would rush down in all haste into a pail or jar held at the bottom they have many enemies not only among fish reptiles and birds but even some of the mammals such as opossums and monkeys catch and devour them in large numbers we saw a beautiful hawk bright chestnut in color with a pale creamy head and black throat dashing at them and skillfully catching the unfortunate crabs in one outstretched foot scores of other beings of still more lowly degree swarmed about us but as the tide lapped out of our little bayou the four eyes again attracted our attention they began to get restless swimming back and forth and shuffling over the mud until at last in desperation at the ebbing of their element they made a dash to get past us into the open water of the caño some dived but so buoyant are they that they can scarcely stay below a second and soon popped up on the surface again others scrambled rolled and squirmed along over the ooze on each side of us many making good progress and escaping we caught several and placed them in an aquarium for study when hard pressed in deep water these curious fish progress by a series of leaps up on their tail end and down again up and down again describing a series of curves and making very fast time when examined closely we see that these fish have only two eyes but these are divided in such a way that there appear to be double that number there are two distinct pupils 
one elevated above the head like the eyes of a frog, the other separated by a band of tissue and below the water line. So when the fish floats in its normal position at the surface, the upper pupils, fitted for vision in the air, watch for danger above, while the lower pair keeps a submarine lookout for insect food and aquatic enemies. Monkeys are perfectly at home in this land of branches, the ever-cautious capuchins and now and then a long-limbed spider monkey swinging through the trees with as easy a motion as the flight of a bird. Biggest of all are the great red howlers who keep to the deeper, more narrow channels and in the evening and again at dawn send their voices to the furthest limits of the mangroves. They do not howl, they roar and the sound is perfectly suited to such a wilderness as this before the first signs of day light up the east a low soft moaning comes through the forest like the forewarning of a storm through pine trees this gains in volume and the depth until it becomes a roar it is no wind now nor like anything one ever hears in the north it is a deep grating rumbling roar a voice of the tropics a hint of the long past ages when speech was yet unformed we grew to love the rhythm of this wild music and it will always be for us the memory awakening sound of the tropical wilderness the wealth of life in this region was evident when we began to explore a river flowing down from the highlands in the far distant interior of venezuela we could spend a year here and not begin to exhaust the wonders on every hand with every high tide the captain would pull up anchor and shift our craft a little upstream until at last our keel touched bottom and we could go no further we anchored firmly and buoyed ourselves by ropes to the nearest trees so as to keep on an even keel this our home for a time was in a little bight of the Guarapiche River, where two tumbled down, long deserted Indian huts still retained the name of La Ceiba. We were so close to the left bank that at low tide we could walk ashore on oars laid down over the mud. Here the birds came and fed and bathed. Here the howling monkeys roared over our very heads, and macaws swung and shrieked at us. One night, during a heavy downpour of rain, we were suddenly awakened by a medley of cries, imprecations, shrieks, and yells. Flashing the strong electric bulb, we saw through the sheets of rain a very large curiara run afoul of our shoreline, piled high with luggage, with several screaming women perched high on the bundles and boxes. Four pigs tied feet upward swelled the chorus in their fear of a watery grave and four men told us what they thought of us in the present and where they hoped we would spend the future centuries until the world's end our captain out of his hammock in a moment and in tremendous basso profundo he silenced all save the pigs and rapidly gave directions to our crew to row upstream against the swirling current clear the curiara, and shift it out of the danger zone. Between breaths, he incidentally described minutely to the terrified natives what he knew would be the ultimate fate of such fools as tried to descend a river on the wrong side. It was a miracle that the whole outfit did not overturn, a narrow dugout measuring about 20 feet in length by two in width striking full force against a rope in the blackness of the storm early in the morning the roaring of the monkeys would awaken us and after a hasty breakfast we would start out in our little boat at this time everything is dripping and fresh with dew and there is a bite and tang in the air which reminds us of canadian dawns it is still dusk and the lines of mangroves on either side show only as black walls for some minutes hardly a sound breaks the stillness except for distant roars and the drip drip of our paddles then 
a sudden splashing and breaking of branches shows that we are discovered by a pair or more of capybaras, Hydrocorius capybara, these enormous rodents which would pass as guinea pigs in Gulliver's land of giants. Now an overhanging branch drenches us as we brush against it, and as it is pushed aside, a whole armful of orchids comes away, the pure white blossoms, Epidendrum fragrance, filling the caño with their sweetness. Now the delicate foliage of a palm is silhouetted for a moment against the brightening eastern sky, and a mass of great convolvulus blossoms shines out from the shore. By this we know that we are not many miles from dry ground, and other growths are already beginning to dispute the dominance of the mangroves. Silence again, to be broken by one of the most remarkable and startling outbursts of sound which any living creature in the world can utter, a series of unconnected sighs, shrieks, screams, and metallic trumpet-like notes suddenly breaking forth apparently within thirty feet is surely excuse enough for being startled. The hubbub ceases as abruptly as it began, then again it breaks out, now seeming to come from all directions, even from overhead. The author of all this is the chachalaca, a bird not larger than a common fowl, but with a longer tail. It spends most of its time on the ground or among the lower branches of the trees in the swamps. It was seldom that we caught sight of one, but we shall never forget the first time we heard their diabolical chorus. The sun's rays now light up the narrow path of water ahead of us, and a thousand creatures seem to awaken and give voice at once. Two splendid yellow and blue macaws fly overhead, their screams softened by the distance. A flock of great white-billed, red-crested woodpeckers drum and call. From the bank comes the rolling cry of the tinamou and the sweet penetrating double note of the sun bittern. Hummingbirds squeak in their flight as they shake the dewdrops from the orchids above us. Squirrels with fur of orange and gray scramble through the branches, fleeing before the little capuchin monkeys. Then one after another three splendid swallow-tailed kites dash past us at full speed, brushing the surface of the water and floating upward again. Swallows, emerald and white, catch the flies which hover near us. A big yellow-breasted flycatcher alights for a moment on the bow of our boat, and a tropical day is fairly begun. These and a hundred other creatures about us bathe, sing, and seek their food during the fresh hours of early morning. Then, as the sun rises higher and its heat draws a hush over all, the notes of the birds die away leaving the insect vocalists supreme. Butterflies click here and there. A loud humming tells of huge wasps winging their way on murderous missions. But above all rises the chant of the cicadas. The commonest of these grinds out harsh, reverberating tones, whirr, 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 rolling the R's in the first utterance for a minute or more then ending in a series of short, abrupt whirs. Then another cicada, a giant species, sends his call through the jungle. He has two strings to his bow, one a half note higher than the other, and on these he plays for five minutes at a time. It is Chinese music to the very tone. Sometimes his tune ends in a rising shriek, and we know that one of the big blue wasps has descended on him and stabbed him in the midst of his love song. The day wears on, and even the cicadas become quiet. The sun is overhead and the air full of tropical heat. In the shade it is always comfortable, and in the full glare of the sun one perspires so freely that the heat is hardly felt. As we paddle lazily along, a great tegu lizard Teus nigro punctatus scrambles slowly along the bank, now crawling over a muddy expanse, now taking to the water to avoid a bushy tangle, 
folding back his legs and swimming with long graceful sweeps of his tail. As we watch him, he leaps at several little crabs and catches them before they can escape into their holes. We eat our luncheon in the shade of a clay bank, the first hint of dry land we have seen along the cano, and here we watch the little crocodiles basking in the sun and the crabs scuttling over the mud. A bird of iridescent green and orange swoops down to our very faces and hangs swinging in a loop of a tiny liana on the face of the bank. The next instant it vanishes into the earth darting into a hole hardly larger than the crab holes around it. We have found the home of a jacamar. At the end of the short tunnel are four round white eggs laid on the bare clay. While examining the nest, we hear at our very feet the terrible night noise, the muffled, choking sigh, which has come to us every night since we entered the mangrove wilderness. We are standing in our narrow dugout, which the least movement will overturn, and for an instant it is indeed a question whether we can control ourselves long enough to keep it from filling. Now the mystery solves itself as a large anaconda, Eunectus murinus, nine or ten feet long, slowly winds out from a hole in the bank beneath the surface of the water and slips into the depths of the muddy current. Then the tide laps a little lower, and a big bubble of air caught in the entrance of the serpent's lair frees itself with a sudden gasping sob. When the tide is rising or falling over these large openings in the mud, the air escapes from time to time with the terrifying sound which has so long puzzled us. Our mysterious nocturnal creature is thus explained away in the prosaic light of day. An hour later, as our dugout rounds a sharp bend in the cano, there comes to our ears a series of rasping cries, hoarse and creaking as of unoiled wheels. The glasses show a flock of large brown fowl-like birds in a clump of bushes overhanging the water. Their barred wings and tall delicate crests tell us that they are the bird of all others which we had hoped to see and study. We are floating within a hundred feet of a flock of Hoatzins, these strange, reptile-like, living fossils which are found only in this part of the world and which are closely related to no other living bird. As we draw near, the birds flutter through the foliage as if their wings were broken. We find that this is their usual mode of progression, and for a most interesting reason. Soon after the young Hoatzins are hatched, and while yet unfledged, they are able to leave the nest and climb about the branches, and in this they are greatly aided by the use of the wings as arms and hands. The three fingers of the wing are each armed with a reptile-like claw, and at the approach of danger, the birds climb actively about like squirrels or lizards. It has usually been thought that when they grow up they lose all these reptilian habits and behave as conventional feathered bipeds should. But we find that while of course the fingers are deeply hidden beneath the long flight feathers of the wing, yet these very feathers are often used, finger-like, in forcing aside thick vines the birds thus clambering and pushing their way along. It was with the keenest delight of the pioneer and discoverer that we watched these rare creatures. Although they do not nest until July and August, yet we found them in the very trees and bushes which held the remains of last year's nests, thus revealing their sedentary life during the rest of the year. And day after day and week after week, we learned to know that they would be found in this or that tree and nowhere else. They were veritable feathered sloths. They fed chiefly upon leaves, but fish also entered into the bill of fare of at least one individual. We shot two, one for the skin and the other for the skeleton. 
and we found the plumage in a very worn and ragged condition, the wing feathers especially so, where the branches and leaves had rubbed and worn away the barbs. Throughout the noonday heat, these birds were also to be found in the foliage overhanging the water, ready when disturbed to flop and thrash a few yards through the mangroves and bamboos. After many days of pure delight, our notebooks filled and our photographic plates more than half gone, we decided to see something of the Venezuelan dry land. We would go on and on until we had left the mangroves with all their unpeopled mystery behind us and see what new surprises the village of the Guarauno Indians and the jungles of the foothills would afford. At nine o'clock one night, when the stars alone cast a faint weird light over everything, we sent two of the crew ahead in the rowboat to keep our bow straight and then began a long night of noiseless drifting with the tide. It was a night to remain forever in our memory. The men relieved their monotonous towing with strange, wailing chants. On each side, the mangroves slipped past, black and menacing. Invisible creatures snorted and splashed in sudden terror as we rounded each turn. Great fireflies burned on the trees and were reflected in the water, and to our ears came the roars of the four-handed folk, the calls and screams of night birds, the metallic clinks of insects and ever the gasps and chokings of the serpent's burrows hardly less sinister now that we had solved their mystery throughout all the night we passed up one cano down another past miles and miles of black foliage all alike to us almost indistinguishable in the starlight yet early next morning as we rose to rout the cloud of mosquitoes about our head nets the captain said in his soft Spanish tongue, the mountains of my country should be in sight ahead. And indeed, an hour later, as the day dawned, we could discern the blue haze in the north, which marked the highland out. Toucans, big muscovy ducks, and snake birds flew past us. Great brown woodpeckers and flights of parakeets swung across the cano. Dolphins played around us, but we heeded them little all eager to press on and see the new land. So we sat far up in the bow and watched the mountains take form and the palms upon them become ever more distinct. From a land of mystery untrodden by man, we were soon to come upon a bit of land so prized by man that nations had almost gone to war over it. La Brea, the strange lake of pitch, hidden in the heart of the forest with its strange birds and fish and animals lying on the borderland between the foothills of the northern andes and the world of mangroves which for many days had held us so safely in its heart end of chapter one part two chapter two part one of Our Search for a Wilderness by Mary Blair Beebe. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Lake of Pitch. Heretofore we had sailed and paddled through a land of mangroves and water, where, with the exception of one or two tiny muddy islets in the forest, there was no solid ground. One day, the last of innumerable turns of a narrow cano brought our sloop in sight of real earth, the first dry land of eastern Venezuela. A rough wooden wharf supporting a narrow gauge line of rails appeared, and beyond rose a steep hill, dotted here and there with little thatched huts, each clinging to a niche scooped out of the clay. We were at the village of Wanoco, the shipping point of the Pitch Lake. A few steps beyond the last hut, and one was in the primeval forest. So limited is man's influence in this region of rapidly growing plants. For five miles, the little toy rails zigzagged their uneven way through the jungle. On one side was a swamp, into which one could penetrate but a short distance 
before encountering the advance guard of the mangroves, the front of the vast host which stretched eastward mile after mile to the sea. West of the track, the land rose ten or twenty feet in many places, but even where level, it soon lost its swampy character. At the end of the line, the strange pitch lake itself appeared as a great plain on the borderland between low swamps and the foothills of the mountains. This was our tramping ground, and we found it a veritable wonderland of birds and beasts and flowers. One of the first things which attracted our attention were the orioles or caciques, great black and yellow beauties with long whitish beaks and an infinitely varied vocabulary. In the north, our eyes were gladdened by the sight of a single pair of orioles flying about their nest in the elm. Here, in a single tree, there were sometimes over 150 inhabited nests, most of which were two feet or more in length. The more we watched these birds, the more interesting they became. They showed a real intelligence in the selection of a site for their nests. Monkeys, tree snakes, opossums, and other bird-eating creatures were abundant hereabouts, and for a colony of these conspicuous birds to conceal their nests successfully would be impossible. So their homes are swung out in full view of all, but one or two precautions are always taken. Either the birds choose a solitary tree which fairly overhangs some thatched hut or else the colony is clustered close about one of the great wasps' nests, which are seen here and there, high up among the branches of the forest. The Indians and native Venezuelans never trouble the birds, which have been quick to realize and take advantage of this fact, and weave their nests and care for their young almost within arm's reach of the thatched roofs. No monkey dares venture here, and the mongrel dogs keep off all the small nocturnal carnivores. But a colony of caciques which chooses to live in the jungle itself would have short shrift were it not for the strange communal guardianship of the wasps. These insects are usually large and venomous, and one sting would be enough to kill a bird. Indeed, a severe fever often ensues when a man has been stung by half a dozen. So the birds must in some way be immune to the attacks of the wasps. Perhaps their wonderfully complete armor of feathers, scales, and horny beak accounts for this, while their quickness of vision and of action enables them to save their eyelids, their one unprotected spot. Although the caciques cannot have learned from experience of the terrible wounds which the wasps can inflict, yet they are keenly alive to the advantages to be derived from close association with them. The wasp's nest is built far out on the tip of the limb of some forest tree, and the long pendant homes of the caciques are placed close to it, sometimes eight or ten on the same branch, and others on neighboring limbs so near that the homes of insects and birds rattle against each other when the wind blows. One such community was placed rather near the ground, where we could watch the inhabitants closely. Frequently, when one or two of the big birds returned to their nests with a rush and a headlong plunge into the entrance, the whole branch shook violently. Yet the wasps showed no excitement or alarm. Their subdued buzzing did not rise in tone. But when I reached up and moved the branch gently downward, the angry hum which came forth sent me into the underbrush in haste. From a safe distance, I could see the wasps circling about in quick spurts, which meant trouble to any intruder, while the excited caciques squeaked and screamed their loudest. Whether the slight motion I gave to the branch was unusual enough to arouse the insects, or whether they took their cue from the cries and actions of the alarmed birds, 
I cannot say. The nests are beautifully woven, of very tough palm leaf shreds and grass stems, in shape like tall vases, bulging at the bottom to give room for the eggs and young birds, with an entrance at the side near the top. We found still another instance of the unusual ability of these birds to adapt themselves to changing conditions. Those nests which are already deserted or with young ready to fly had simple rounded tops arching over to protect the entrance from the sun. But in the nests which were in the process of construction now at the beginning of the rainy season in early April, there appeared an additional chamber with a dense roof of thatch in which one of the parents, the male at least in one case, passed the nights safe from the torrents of sudden rain. Another larger species of cacique, dull green in color, built solitary nests three feet or more in length, but seldom near the homes of men or wasps. Here and there in the jungle, some lofty tree raised its huge white bowl free of vine and liana and smooth as a marble column towering far above all its fellows and out on the very tip of one of its swaying branches the nest was woven safe from all tree climbing enemies the notes of these birds were like deep resonant cowbells ringing through the jungle clear and metallic. During our stay in the village of Huanoco, we had abundant opportunity to observe the relations of a tiny hamlet like this to the great world of primeval nature all around. The jungle pressed close, instantly filling any neglected corner with a tangle of vines and shrubs, ever ready to sweep over all and reforest the little clearings about the huts. Sloths were rare near the village, as it had long been a favorite Sunday amusement to go out and bring in one or more of these defenseless creatures for dinner. But tree porcupines, Sphingurus prehensilis, with bare prehensile tails and faces like little manatees, were common, as were those gentle little creatures of the night, kinkajous. Cercoleptes caudivolvulus, or couchy couchies, as the Indians call them. Catching porcupines and sloths is about as exciting a sport as picking blackberries, the porcupine being too confident in its battery of spines to attempt to escape, the sloth relying with pathetic faith on its wonderful resemblance to a bunch of moss or leaves. The English sparrows of the village were beautiful olive-green palm tanagers and great sulphur-breasted flycatchers which shrieked kiskadi at you as you passed by. The French in Trinidad tell you that the bird says kiskadi, but the Spaniard, true to his poetic temperament, says no, senor, el pájaro dice Cristo fue which seems especially appropriate at this Easter season. Every day, one or two wild chachalacas would fly from the jungle to an open space near one of the huts and feed fearlessly with the chickens for an hour or longer. To our northern minds, the most remarkable thing was the innumerable variety of all forms of life. Seldom did we find many individuals of any one species, but always there was a constantly changing panorama. We would make a careful list of birds seen near our house, noting certain ones for future study, and the following day scarcely one of these would be visible, but in their place birds of strange form and colors. The same was true of the insects and the result was as bewildering as it was fascinating. Our habits of observation had all to be changed. Except when birds were actually nesting, we could never be sure of seeing the same species twice, although there was never any doubt 
that each day would add many new forms to our lists. Though we tramped for miles along the narrow Indian trails and spent many days in swamps and dark jungles, yet we were troubled scarcely at all with noxious insects. Jiggers there were in moderate numbers, but one could collect more in one day in Virginia than in a month here at this season. During our entire stay, we saw only about three or four minute ticks, while mosquitoes were absent except at night. If we dug in rotten logs, we were sure to unearth centipedes and scorpions, many of them, but otherwise we rarely saw them. Once indeed, a mother scorpion, Centurus margaritatus, with half a hundred young ones on her back, was discovered in a shoe bringing to mind the old nursery rhyme. We found that much of the jungle was almost impenetrable, and on one of our first excursions, we were fortunate enough to find a means of making the birds come to us from the deeper recesses of the forest. As we left the doorway, a silent little shadow fitted into the pomerosa tree in front of us and soon among the glossy leaves came a sound which we had heard day and night but the author of which had thus far evaded us it is impossible to put into words but it may be imitated by a monotone whistle of about four notes to the second of a above middle c the glasses showed a mite of a pygmy owl glaring at us with wide yellow eyes and firmly clutching a dead bird half as large as himself. Later, when standing at the edge of an impenetrable tangle of thorny vines and vainly trying to discover what bird was singing in loud ringing tones within it, we thought of the fierce little owl and, concealing ourselves, gave the call of Glaucidium. The effect was instantaneous. The song near us ceased, and with angry cries, a pair of beautiful black-capped mocking thrushes flew almost overhead. Black-tailed euphonias and grass finches followed. Banana kits whirred about us, and within a few minutes, thirty or forty birds had testified to the hatred in which the little owl is held. A great surprise to our northern eyes was the yellow woodpecker, not uncommon here, and clad in bright yellow plumage from crest to tail. It was very conspicuous in flight, but when it alighted, merged with the lichened bark and spots of sunlight. One bird was very tame and frequented a tree close by our window. One of our first walks led us through a narrow valley or gorge to the westward, shaded by ranks of tall palms and with isolated banana and cocoa plants, hinting of native Indian clearings long since overwhelmed by the luxuriant jungle growth. Wasps and other hymenoptera outnumbered other insects at this season, and one could have collected scores of different species in a few hours. A few Heliconia butterflies drifted across our path, and now and then a giant morpho shot past like a meteor of iridescent blue. Other great butterflies, Caligo ileoneus, were iridescent blue and brown above, while the undersides of their wings were mottled and with a great eye spot on each of the hind wings, which gives them the name of the owl butterfly. But however much, in an insect cabinet, the expanded reverse of the wings suggests the face of an owl. The spot, as we observed it in the forest, seemed rather to render the insect invisible. These great fellows would shoot up to a lichen-covered trunk and drop lightly upon it, and unless one's eyes had followed closely, the butterfly vanished like magic. Creeping up to one, we secured its picture the motlings on its wings merging it with the lichens, and its owl eyes becoming the painted facsimiles of darkened knot holes or of little atoll-like fungus rings. 
one is constantly impressed by the abundance and variety of these protective adaptations. Instead of one's eyes becoming more accustomed and trained in detecting these deceptions, the puzzles increase and one becomes suspicious of everything. Every few minutes we are halted by a curled leaf which resembles some great caterpillar or by a partly decayed fruit which may prove to be a curiously marked beetle. Many of these are such exact counterparts that we have to touch them to undeceive ourselves. After seeing some bats hung in the shadows between the buttressed bases of great trees, we imagine them in every patch of moss or dried leaves. The resemblance to inanimate objects is never violated and often remarkably heightened by the little creatures of fur, feather, scale, or armor of chitin. The bats never alight in a close compact mass, but each isolated, with its wings partly spread and often extended irregularly, one webbed hand higher or further out than the other, thus presenting a dull irregular outline, at which we should never have looked twice had not the little beasties become frightened and flown. A butterfly, Peridromia feronia, mottled and pearly on the upper side, snaps clicking to a lichened trunk and lights head downward with wings flat. Beneath they are white and conspicuous. The inverted position allows the hinder wings to be pressed flat to the surface of the bark, while the slight shadow caused by the prominence of the body in front is thus below and invisible. Another brilliant red on the upper side and irregularly marked below never alights, as far as our experience went, except on some lichened trunk. In this case, however, the wings were held tightly together and the insect always in a head downward position. The insect took to wings so quickly that only a hint of the red was visible. We never could tell what new form of protective resemblance would next come under our notice. Here and there in the woods we found trees which had fallen in a clear space and had torn out their roots in the fall, forming a great bank of earth and mold held together by the network of root fibers. Hanging suspended by slender root tendrils were many small pellets of earth slowly swaying and disintegrating we found that some of these were not mere accidents of inorganic forces, but were the nests of a small mud wasp made in a roughly circular form and molded to one of the many rootlets. Lizards, perhaps more than any other group of backboned animals, became part and parcel of their surroundings in form and color. We sometimes found dull gray and green fellows on the trunks of trees or on the ends of half-rotten logs, which almost defied the efforts of the eye to disentangle them from the lichens and moss amid which they clung. When one of these did move, it was with such celerity that the eye unconsciously swept onward, impelled by momentum, and overshot the spot where it stopped. Then another careful search was necessary to rediscover the reptile. This same glade was the favorite haunt of two kinds of small mannequins, the gold-headed and the white-breasted. The former was a mite of a bird, barely four inches in length, jet black as to body and wings, but with a cap of gold pulled down over its head and ears. If his eyes were black and beady like those of his near relatives, the harmony of his headdress would be disturbed. So Dame Nature had sifted the gold over his eyes as well, and the yellow irides are almost invisible among the feathers. Such coloring renders him part of his beloved gorge. If he sits in the shade, his body vanishes, and his head is not but a spot of sunshine. If his perch is in sunlight, 
the tiny headless body conveys no hint of a living bird. His cousin, the white-breasted, is black and white, and the four outer feathers of the wing are very narrow and curved. These are the strings upon which he plays an aeolian song of love, for every time he takes to flight a loud humming sound is produced. The females are dull olive in color, but easily recognizable by their orange feet and legs. Sometimes three suitors will buzz and hum together about one of these somber little ladies in the gloom of the gorge. The rotten trees and palm stubs were filled with interesting insects. Big black palm weevils, Rhynchophorus palmatum, an inch and a half long, and huge brown cockroaches, three inches from head to wingtip, Blaberus trapezoideus. With a machete, we cut open one log, which was like bread in consistency, and found two centipedes, three scorpions, one of them a whip scorpion, a huge beetle larva, a small snake with a faint band around its neck, Homolocranium melanocephalum, and most interesting, a parapatus. Perhaps the reader here wonders to himself what a parapatus is, and it is a pity that this most important creature has no common name. We may call it a worm-like caterpillar or a caterpillar-like worm, for its claim to fame rests upon its position as a so-called missing link. We know that in long ages past, the ancestor of the butterflies, beetles, wasps, spiders, and crabs was a worm-like creature, primitive in structure, and in no way hinting of the beautiful organisms which were to be evolved in succeeding epochs. Hiding away from light in the warm moisture of decaying wood, the little parapatus has lived on and on, age after age, with little apparent change, until we find it today combining the simpler characteristics of the lowly worms with those of the vastly higher caterpillars. The parapatus which we unearthed, or rather unlogged, was of a rich dark reddish hue. It was caterpillar-like in general appearance, but not divided into segments, while the number of its very simple feet and its method of progression brought to mind the millipedes. The long slender antennae were constantly in motion, changing and extending, feeling about and retracting. Glancing at the leaf of a low shrub, we saw what we supposed to be two bits of dried, rolled-up leaf entangled in a strand of spider web and being whirled about by the wind. When we saw that this motion continued, after the breeze had died down, we became interested. We discovered that the two objects were tenid moths of a dark pearl color, waltzing about with the most graceful and airy motion imaginable. With closed wings, they whirled round and round by means of their legs alone, and most remarkably, both going in the same direction, although this was frequently changed the reversal being almost instantaneous and without an instant's loss of the smoothness of the rhythm. Now and then their circles overlapped, but at the first danger of collision, the tiny dervishes both retreated without stopping their dance. Presently one flew away, and the other shifted to another leaf nearby and recommenced his waltz alone. It was a surprise to find these little winged millers in the role of graceful dancers. The reason of it remained a mystery. These incidents are quoted at some among the myriad interesting things of the little jungle folk which we observed in the heart of these great jungles. As we walked on, virgin forest surrounded us with great trees centuries old, chained and netted together by miles upon miles of lianas. Now and then we entered a clear glade festooned by a maze of ropes and cables with here and there a lofty monkey ladder 
leading upward by a wavy series of narrow steps. The cicadas filled the air with the oriental droning of their song, and a big red-crested woodpecker called loudly from a half-rotten, vine-choked tree. From the underground came a soft rolling trill, a crescendo of power and sweetness, and when our Indian carrier whispered, Gallina del Monte, we knew we were listening to the call of the great blue tinamou, one of those strange birds, looking like brown, tailless fowls, but of so generalized a type that they form in many ways a link between the ostrich-like forms and the rest of the bird world. The bird which was calling soon became silent, but creeping slowly along, we were fortunate enough to discover its nest on a bit of sunny turf near the end of a log in a particularly overgrown clearing. All the delights of bird nesting seemed consummated the moment we caught sight of the two wonderful eggs before us. The nest was merely a hollow scratched in the grass, but the sun was reflected from two shining spheres of metallic greenish blue, like two huge turquoises, polished as by the wheel of a lapidary. Never were such eggs. They seemed of hard burnished metal, more akin to the stones lying about them than to the organic world. And yet, even as we looked, there appeared a tiny fracture, and in a few minutes the beak of a tinamou chick had broken through to the outer air. The glistening cradle of stone would soon fall apart and give to the tropical world another life, one more moat among the millions upon millions about us. Now and then we would come across a huge low mound clear of undergrowth, dotted with holes from which well-trodden paths led off in every direction. Some of these were six inches in width, so that we could easily walk in them. A twig poked down the holes and twisted about, would come up covered with angry ants, great brownish-black fellows with a grip like a bulldog. Even this simile fails, for these insects will allow their heads to be pulled off before they will let go. Everywhere the ants attracted our attention. Huge black giants, Neoponera commutata, which seemed never to have anything to do but parade slowly up and down the trunks of trees, and the ever-busy parasol ants, hustling along in a single file, waving their green banners and clinging faithfully to them while falling down terrific precipices three or four inches deep. We dug into their nests and found their fungi gardens, one part of which would be freshly planted with neat black balls of chewed up green leaves, while in another part the fungus was well grown, a meshwork of gray strands whose fruit was ready to be plucked and eaten. The hunting ants, Eseton, surpassed all the others in interest. Day after day we would come across their great armies, and we spent many hours of keen enjoyment watching their advance. We had read of their appearance and habits. We had heard them compared to goths and hordes of savages, but no description prepares one for the actual sight. We watched in particular one large army which carried on its operations only a short distance from our house. Long before we came within sight of the ants themselves, their presence would be heralded by the flock of birds which kept just in advance, feeding upon the insects which flew up from the van of the ant legions. In one such assemblage, most of the birds were wood hewers, big cinnamon-colored creeper-like birds which hitched up the tree trunks and now and then swooped down to the ground, snatched an insect, and swung back to the trunk. This flock of birds showed other methods of feeding. Hummingbirds appeared from nowhere, dashed down to a tiny insect, and vanished into space. Anis blundered along, 
looking as if their wings and tails were too loosely attached for use. Ant birds crept low through the bushes and carried their prey to a twig to eat. Two American red starts and several tyrant flycatchers caught their prey by a sudden dart and a snap of the beak. One species in particular, the streaked flycatcher, was always attendant on the ants and always fearless, watching us and yet never missing a chance to snap up a passing insect. End of chapter 2, part 1chapter two part two of our search for a wilderness by mary blair bb this librivox recording is in the public domain as we drew nearer a strange rustling sound reached our ears like the regular pattering of raindrops and before we knew it we were standing in the midst of thousands of active ants whose rushing and scrambling about over the dead leaves caused the loud rustling in a few seconds twenty or thirty ants had climbed upon and above our shoes and their sharp nipping bites sent us in haste to the flanks of the army where we freed ourselves from the fierce creatures these ants are not large varying from a fifth to a third of an inch in length dark in color with lighter red abdomens until one becomes accustomed to these scenes of carnage the sight is really terrible especially when one lies down flat and takes an ant's eye view of the field of battle yet such is the fierceness and savage fury on one side and hopeless terror or frantic efforts to escape on the part of the victims that it needs but little imagination to stir deeply one's sympathies in place of the steady advance of a well-drilled army presenting a solid front of serried ranks the formation of the hunting ants may be compared to an innumerable host of cavalry scouts who quarter the ground in every direction the whole army slowly advancing and including new territory in the scene of operations frequent flurries or louder rustlings follow the discovery and the subsequent terrible struggle of some quarry of noble size a huge beetle or mighty lizard one fact impressed us from the first every creature aroused by the ants seems to know instinctively of the awful danger whether through odor or sight or sound the alarm always carried its full meaning insects which ordinarily would escape the collecting net by a single quick motion here dashed away with such terror that they often flew against our clothes or a tree and were hurled to the ground lizards took shelter under our shoes or shot off like streaks of light for many yards our presence and that of the predatory birds was disregarded in the efforts to avoid the danger which generations of inherited experience had made the most vivid in life insects which usually feigned death as a means of escape when disturbed by these ants used all the motor organs given them by nature to flee from the dreaded foe escape seemed to be the result of accident with all wingless creatures even with those possessing good eyesight for the first blind terrified rush as often carried them to certain death in the thickest of the host as it did to safety in the van or on one side of the ant army even wings were not a surety of escape twice i saw moths arise heavily from their hiding places with half a dozen of the little fiends clinging to their legs and wings one was snapped up ants and all by a big flycatcher and the other fell among the quartermaster's brigade in the rear where every ant within reach dropped his load and hurled himself upon the newcomer here and there one might observe good-sized balls of ants rolling about and in the center would be some hard-cased beetle or other insect who gave up only after killing and maiming a score of his assailants 
we dropped five big black ants into the midst of the marauders and witnessed a combat as thrilling as the contest between the Greeks and the Persians. Four of the insects alighted on a small rounded stone over which three hunting ants were scurrying. Without hesitation, the black ants fell upon the brown warriors and tore them limb from limb with the loss of only half a leg. This is not a very serious handicap when one has five and a half robust limbs left. The fifth big fellow dropped upon a mass of ants piled like football players upon a struggling scorpion whose sting was lashing the air in vain. The big ant started another ripple upon this pool of death, which soon smoothed away, leaving no recognizable trace of him. But the quartet of big-jawed fellows on their rock citadel fought successfully and well. No ant which crept to the top ever lived to return for help. The four flew at him like wolves and bit him to death. Soon a ring of hunting ants formed around the stone, all motionless except for a frantic twiddling of antennae. They were apparently excited by the smell of the blood of their dead fellows, and only rarely did one venture now and then to scale the summit. When we left, two hours afterward, the army had passed and left the stone and its four doughty defenders, who showed no immediate intention of leaving their fortress. The ground over which the hunting ants passed was absolutely bare of life, and, contrary to the rule in human armies, it was among the camp followers and foragers that the most perfect discipline reigned. In the rear of the main army were lines upon lines of ants laden with the spoils, legs, bodies, and heads of insects and spiders, bits of scaly skin of lizard or turtle, joints of centipedes and scorpions, and here and there a piece of ragged but gaudy butterfly wing borne aloft like the captured standard of some opposing force. We followed three lines of supply carriers and found that they converged on some sheltered hollow in a tree or under a boulder or root. Here were massed countless hordes of ants clinging together like a swarm of bees. In the center were the queen, eggs, and young of these nomadic savages resting thus temporarily until the far distant scouts should report another shelter when the whole community would shift to the new home further along on the line of march the army in which we were especially interested seemed to be carrying on their hunting in a rough circle about the temporary home and perhaps this is a common habit certain ants apparently serve some function of direction or means of communication, for they keep to one place for half an hour at a time and twiddle their antenna with every ant which approaches. It was when the hunting ants discovered the nests of other species of ants that warfare, true to its name, was waged. One could watch as from a balloon, mimic Waterloos and Gettysburgs, and, sad to relate, in the case of inoffensive species, plunder, murder, and abduction by the wholesale. After studying the ways of these merciless creatures, we could seldom walk through the quiet sunlit jungle with blossoming orchids everywhere overhead and the songs of birds and the pleasant hum of insects in our ears without thinking of the tragedies without number ever going on around us. Used as we were, to the small lightning bugs of our northern summer nights, the big luminous elater beetles, Pyphorus species, were ever of interest. The two thoracic lights are placed on the outer posterior edges and give out a pale greenish glow of great intensity. We could easily see to read and write by their light, and by placing a half dozen of these insects in a glass, we could use them instead of our electric flash. When we examined them carefully, we were surprised to find that there was another area of illumination on the abdomen, 
below and just behind the insertion of the third pair of legs. When fully illuminated, this area was brilliant and of a figure eight laid on its side in shape. The light, however, was radically different from that of the thorax, being yellowish and candle-like, giving an illusory impression of an opening from the incandescent interior of the insect. When the insect settles to rest, the only visible illumination is from the pair of thoracic lights, but in flight the abdominal searchlight comes into play, burning brightly with a strong yellowish glare quite different from the green thoracic lights. As we lay at night half asleep, we would sometimes be awakened by the droning of one or two big elaters, whose intermittent flashes would illumine the whole room. More than once we had to capture the intruders with the butterfly net and banish them before we could get any sleep. We chloroformed two of these luminous beetles and pinned them in an insect box. Two evenings afterwards, when we had occasion to add more insects, the box was opened, and, to our surprise, the little lanterns were still aglow, and hardly less brilliant than when the insects were alive. They had been dead forty-eight hours, and yet their light still shone ghostly white, lighting up the other insects in the box. One evening we found a tiny wire worm, the larva of some small species of elater, which was highly phosphorescent, although only about one half of an inch in length, the whole head, the posterior segment, and a spot on the side of each of the others was bright. Watched as it moved smoothly and rapidly along, it reminded us of a ship passing at a distance at night with the lights streaming from the portholes. Our trips to the pitch lake on the early morning engine will never be forgotten. A warning toot from the diminutive whistle hurries us through our breakfast, and we hasten to the track and see our cameras and guns loaded on one of the little square wooden empties. We mount the wood-filled tender of the engine, which with many complaining creaks and jolts gets under way, backing slowly around the curve which hides the last sign of civilization and buries us in the jungle. For nearly twenty years these little toy engines have bustled and elbowed their way over the snaky rails until the jungle and its people have come to look upon this narrow, winding steel path as part of the general order of things. The underbrush creeps close, and only the constant whipping of the engines and cars beats down the growth between the rails. As we start, the last bats of night dash into the dark jungle, and their diurnal prototypes, a flock of graceful palm swifts, swoop about overhead. To our ears there comes the finale of the morning chorus of distant red howlers and the first deep-toned bellings of the giant caciques. All along the line, beasts and birds show their lack of fear of the rumbling cars. A party of chattering little monkeys sit and gibber at us and rub their dew-drenched fur. Their parents and great-grandparents had found nothing to fear in this strange thing which, five times each day, crawls back and forth on its narrow trail and why should they do more than look and wonder? As we come in sight of the muddy banks of the little river, a great parrot shrieks in derision at us from the top of a dead stub by the track, executing slow somersaults for our benefit. Instinctively, we look for a chain on its leg and a food cup nearby. A splash draws our eyes downward, and from a maelstrom of muddy water, shoots a villainous stingray. A school of little staring fore-eyes skips over the water, and near the swampy further bank a sprawling, half-grown crocodile watches us, as quiet as a stranded log. The air blows cool and damp on our faces, and we long for the keen power of scent of a dog. Even to our dull nostrils, every turn of the road is full of interest. A swamp thickly starred with dainty spider lilies 
comes into view, and we inhale drafts of sweetest incense. Easter Sunday is at hand, and the very wilderness reminds us of it. With every breath of air, the great palm leaves flick myriads of drops to the underbrush below, with a sound as of heavy rain. The trunks are black and soaked, and there is not a dry frond for miles. A sudden curve brings another loop of the river into view, with a foreground of scuttling crabs and mangrove seedlings. Here a wave of coarse, salty marsh smell fills our lungs not stagnant, but redolent of the distant sea, the smell that makes one's blood leap. The next quarter mile is covered with lilies again. From their perfume we enter a zone of recently cut grass, and the incense brings to mind northern hayfields and the sweet grass baskets of the Indians. What new pains and pleasures would be ours could we possess the power of scent of some of the, quote, lower, Quotes, animals. Temperate succeed tropical vistas. We see what at first appears to be a grove of young chestnuts rising from rhododendrons and guinea grass. A spotted sandpiper heightens the illusion, and the picture is complete when a familiar milkweed butterfly floats by and alights on a red and yellow tansy. But just then a macaw shrieks from a nearby tree. The roadbed turns and reveals a tangle of palms and scarlet heliconias. A monkey climbs up a leaf large enough to shelter a half hundred of his kind. Strange palm fruits come into view, some like enormous clusters or bunches of grapes, each fruit as large as an orange, or again a huge feathery dependent frond of dust-blown blossom and fruit protected by an overhanging spathe like a huge umbrella. The jungle never gives up the struggle against the invading rails. Beneath the cars, the constant friction only dwarfs the growth, and we find here miniature plants blooming, fruiting, and scattering seed, plants which elsewhere reach a height of five or six feet. It is an interesting case of quick adaptation to unfavorable conditions. The vegetation presses on every inch of the track, striving ever to close up the long scar through the heart of the forest, and only by systematic cutting is the way kept open. The advance of the jungle host is most interesting. Thirty feet from the rails the growth is primeval, a dense mass of entangled and interlaced vines, shrubs, palms, and giant trees, the boles of the latter shooting up and up through the mass and bursting into bloom high overhead. Nearer the track, we find a phalanx of green banners and the wonderfully brilliant red and yellow flower stalks of the quick-growing heliconias. In front are the rough scouts, the real advance guard of strong, thorny vines, growing in close entanglement, a living chevaux de frise, inconspicuous, and yet offering the greatest resistance. Under this shelter, the larger but slower growing components of the jungle take root and gather vigor, until, if not cut out with the hardest labor, they soon rear their heads from their nursery of vines and brambles, and the shining rails vanish from view. All the creatures of the forest cross and recross the track freely, even in front of an approaching train. Waterfowl, sun bitterns, and the weird-voiced trumpeters walk up and down, and flocks of seed-eaters drift here and there, gleaning seed from between the rails. The trumpeters were a great surprise to us, as this is the first instance of their being found north of the Orinoco River. One day we see the leaves part and a long, low-shouldered, reddish form slouches across before us without even a glance at us, and we know it for the first South American puma, Felix con color, which we have seen. Another red lion, as the natives call it, with two cubs, was seen not long before. 
only the sloth is barred he comes close to the endless swath he wanders from tree to tree up and down peering dully out across the track but he cannot cross the twenty-foot treeless embankment is as impregnable to him as a sheer wall of rock with a weird cry he turns back and starts in another direction through the branches we reach the lake long before the dew is dried and before the freshness of the dawn is dissipated hurrying over the planks and the temporary rails laid for the workmen's hand cars we push on a half mile or more to the southward where nothing hints of man's proximity to the north and west are irregular peaks running off into a blue and misty range the foothills of the spanish main to the south the high woods are close to us and tower high overhead but even with the eye of yonder lofty soaring vulture we could see no mountains in that direction nothing but flat green miles of mangroves stretching to the horizon over the immense delta of the orinoco the pitch lake itself is surrounded on all sides by dense forests the front ranks of which are made up of the marvelously tall and graceful moriche palms there is one oasis in this pitchy expanse parrot island it may be called to this shelter guarded on all sides by soft quaking pitch amazon parrots come at dusk by hundreds roosting there until the next morning near the northern edge is the mother of the lake just above the deep hidden source of supply where the pitch is always soft and where no vegetation grows it is a veritable pool of death and nothing can enter it and live the lizards and heavy-bodied insects which scamper over the rim are often clogged and drawn down to death a jaguar leaping after a jacana slipped in shortly before we came and made a terrible fight for life half blinded its struggles carried it only further outward but fortunately the end came mercifully soon all the rest of the lake is a varied expanse of black pitch bubbles short grass clumps of fern and sedge with occasional isolated palms Flowers of many kinds and colors spring from the heart of the raw pitch itself. Jacanas rise before us with loud cries and flashing wings of gold. One may walk over the lake at will, morning and evening, but in the heat of midday, in many places, one's shoes sink quickly unless one keeps constantly on the move. White is not a very common color in nature, and yet here, in striking contrast with the inky blackness of the pitch most of the birds show large patches of this color in the distance are always to be seen snowy egrets and immature blue herons spots of purest white while near at hand absurdly tame a big hawk forever soars slowly about or perches on some great frond of a tall palm it is a white headed chima chima hawk with plumage of white save for back wings and tail the two most abundant small birds are chiefly white in color both are flycatchers one with white head and neck white headed marsh flycatcher perching in the reeds and making fierce sallies after passing insects while even more beautiful and conspicuous are the little terrestrial flycatchers white-shouldered ground flycatchers or cotton birds which scurry along the ground over pitch and fallen logs their tails continually wag from side to side and they come within a few feet of us uttering low inquiring notes peek peek they too are clad in white except for back nape wings and tail we follow one about watching it through the ground glass of the camera when we blunder into a thicket of dry crackling twigs a sudden rustling sound draws our attention and we look up and find ourselves within a few feet of a dry palm stub around the roughened stringy bark peers a green head with wide yellow eyes 
and we stiffen into immobility. The position is anything but comfortable. Thorns are scratching us. Flies are tickling our faces, but we dare not move. After five minutes, which seem hours, the big yellow-fronted Amazon parrot withdraws, and we hear a scuttling within the stub. Silently, and with the greatest caution, we step backward, and after a rest we arrange our plan of attack. These birds usually nest in hollows in the tops of the tallest, most inaccessible trees, and this is a golden opportunity, one in a lifetime, for a photograph of a parrot at home. The entrance is rectangular, about three by six inches, and some five feet above the ground. Painfully, I pick my way to the side of the stub, and bracing myself, focus on that spot of black on the trunk. Then Milady rustles the weeds in the rear of the stub. Again a rustling, and on the ground glass of my grayflex flashes the green head. Snap! I have her, and with the slowest of motions I change plates. While she is engrossed with the disturber in the rear, I advance a step and get another picture. Then, screwing up my speed button, I push slowly forward, and just as she is about to hurl herself from the stub, I secure a third photograph. Off she goes to the nearest palms, shrieking at the top of her lungs, and is joined by her mate. We cut a hole in the trunk near the ground, and there find the nest of the parrot, three white eggs, one of which is pipped, and a young bird just hatched reward us, all wrestling on a bed of chips. The diminutive Polly is scantily clothed with white down, and while in the shade lies motionless. When a ray of warm sunlight strikes it, the little fellow becomes uneasy and crawls and tumbles about until it escapes from the unwelcome heat. During its activity, it keeps up a continuous, low, raucous cry, like the mew of a cat bird. Far out on the expanse of black pitch, six feet in the depths of this dark cavity, this little squawking mite surely had a strange babyhood to fit it for its future life in the sunlight among the palms. It was the yellow-fronted Amazon parrot, a common species with dealers everywhere, but we shall never see one in a cage, uttering inane requests for crackers, without thinking of the interesting family we discovered at the Pitch Lake. We found strange fish in the pools of water scattered over the lake. Some must have wriggled their way over dry land for some distance to get there. There were round, sunfish-like fellows, aquidans, and others long and slender with wicked-looking teeth, Hopeless Malabaricus. Most curious of all were the loricates, or armored catfish, with a double row of large overlapping scales enclosing their body from head to tail. Like the hoatzins among the birds, these fish are strange relics of the past, preserved almost unchanged from the ancient fossil Devonian forms. Days passed like hours in this wonderland, and the time for returning to civilization came all too soon. The strange living beings which filled jungle and air and water made us long for the leisure of months instead of weeks, in which to study all the infinite variety of life which surrounded us. Our last view of Venezuela was like the first, a panorama of silent, majestic green walls guarding a stream of brilliant copper. Every one of the untold myriads of beating hearts beyond the walls, resting silent in the noonday heat, waiting for the coolness of evening to awaken them to activity. To some it would bring song and happiness with nest and mate. To some, combat. To others, death. End of chapter 2 Chapter 3, Part 1 of Our Search for a Wilderness by Mary Blair Beebe. 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Woman's Experiences in Venezuela The doings of the creatures in fur, feathers, and scales kept us keenly interested from morning to night. Yet in our wilderness search there were many unnatural history experiences. Some disagreeable, others thrilling, but all so wholly delightful in their charm of strangeness to the woman who enjoyed them, that the picture of our wilderness seems incomplete without them. Life on board a Venezuelan sloop is quite unlike any other experience in the world. Neither the woman who sits under the awning of a luxurious yacht, nor her more adventurous sister, who sails her own catboat over turbulent waters, can form any idea of the daily life aboard such a craft. The night we set forth in our tiny sloop from the island of Trinidad, headed for an unexplored part of the Orinoco Delta, it was hard to realize that we were at last bound for South America, the land of our dreams. As you know, we were, for the present, owners of a sloop flying the Venezuelan flag and manned by five men, of whom only the captain knew a word of English. The charm of exploration and adventure laid a spell upon us both, el señor naturalista and me, and we watched in silence the sunset sky and the dim receding shores of Trinidad. But there was a certain stern reality about that first night aboard the Josefa Jacinta that soon broke in upon our reveries. When we descended to the tiny cabin to unpack, the sloop had begun to pitch heavily, and we set ourselves to solve the problems of unstable equilibrium, which constantly shifting angles of 30 to 40 degrees presented in both floor and walls. By courtesy, we called our domicile a cabin, and we found that it would hold two people at a pinch. We unearthed our unused pneumatic mattresses and rigged up our gilded foot pump. For 15 minutes, William worked. Then the mate was called and took a hand. Were we on a sinking ship and manning the pumps for our lives, greater exertions could not have been made, and the reward was a thin film of air within the rubber bed. Then we unscrewed the decorative but useless contrivance, and William began to blow. This proved effective, and in a few minutes we had placed the soft, air-filled cushions in our respective bunks. We dubbed these bunks catacombs at once, for the tiny niches into which we later crept were more like the vaults of a tomb than aught else. I doubt if either of us will ever forget that first night. Beneath the flooring and behind the planked sides of the vessel was a mysterious underworld, densely populated by rats of a most sportive disposition. How they managed to live there we never discovered, for we neither caught sight of one throughout the voyage, nor were we ever troubled by raids on biscuits or other edibles. There seemed to be some kind of a running track extending around the hidden depths of the sloop. A race would start near the stern, the contestants tearing around William's bunk. Then the footfalls would die out toward the bow to become audible almost at once on my side, a medley of sound indicating a mob of invisible rushing creatures galloping down a mysterious home stretch. For some time we expected the goal of each race to be some part of ourselves or our luggage, but the heat would invariably end on the underside of the partition within a few inches of my ear, and then would follow a general melee and fight punctuated with shrill squeaks and squeals and vicious blows and sounds of tumbling, rolling bodies. Were we in the mood, 
we might have learned much of rat vocabulary but we did not know then that these strenuous rodents never penetrated to the upper portions of the sloop and this uncertainty kept alive our interest in their maneuvers throughout the night silence was unknown during this first night and while the rats were resting other things occupied our mind and kept away ennui and sleep the gurgle and splash of bilge water was a steady accompaniment of the pitch and toss of the sloop while now and then a sinister trickling came to our ears we called up to the captain and inquired about it and were assured that it was only a leak he had looked for it many times but could not locate it this gave us food for thought besides adding decidedly to the slowness of the ticking of the watch marking the passage of the hours of darkness i lay in my berth as long as i could endure it dreaming now and then of being buried alive then rising with a start and striking my head against the coffin lid of my catacomb at last i abandoned it for the floor of the cabin sloping and under five feet in total length though it was i found it was better to be huddled in a forlorn little bundle on the floor than in that hole which by no stretch of the imagination could be called a berth overhead the crew worked fitfully all night long i could move the hatch curtain look up and see the sturdy old captain with his hand on the rudder a picture which was to become familiar to us through many nights what a picturesque old figure he was rugged and stern yet as gentle and courteous as any gentleman of the old school and bearing his threescore and eight years with wonderful vigor now and then his deep voice would rise above the roar of wind and waves in hoarse commands in spanish to the crew then he would push the rudder hard up the boom would swing over with a jerk which made the whole sloop tremble and a wave would wash over the deck and send a trickle of cold drops down upon my face smothered exclamations from the crew and the sound of their bare feet splashing along the deck would end the audible part of the maneuver then i would shift to meet the new angle of the floor and wait for the next race of the rats now and then the captain would reach behind the hatch curtain for his watch and examine its dripping face by the light of the candle in the compass box faltan las cinco a la una he would mutter and i knew that midnight had passed and that somewhere in our wake morning was on its way to end this night of nights the tempest increased and tossed our sloop like a flying leaf sometimes it seemed as if we never would right ourselves after heeling far over into the depths but the calm face of our helmsman dispelled all uneasiness and i lay staring into the darkness feeling myself the veriest atom amid this fierce tumult to this moment i cannot tell how long it took us to get from trinidad to venezuela across the awful gulf of paria to me it seemed an endless space of time day succeeding night with choppy seas ominous noises in the pitching cabin hot sleepy hours on deck in the shade of the sail with the great green waves forever rolling after and breaking partly over us by the captain's reckoning however it was the noon of only the second day which revealed the distant shore and soon we forgot all the discomforts of the past hours in the wonderful beauty of the scene before us the still brassy waters and the rich green mangroves entering the wide caño san juan we dropped anchor in the lee of a solitary guard ship a poor derelict a rusty and worn-out freighter whose last days were to be spent here in the calm waters at the edge of the mangrove forest 
Our little sloop was soon overrun with young custom house officials from the guard ship, curious but courteous, and far more appreciative of the stiff rounds of rum which our captain willingly served to them under our direction than of our gilt-sealed letters of introduction. If we would but take their photographs on board the ponton, they would row us close along the shore while we waited for the fulling tide, as the captain called it. Of course we agreed. Shouldering their rusty muskets, they stood in a row to be photographed. Young, inexperienced boys, whose idle days on the derelict were spent in drinking, smoking cigarettes, and lying in hammocks playing the mandolin, watching for the rare sloop or schooner which might enter Venezuela by this desolate and unfrequented cano. We promised to send them the pictures, but Captain Trujillo said afterwards, with a sad shake of his head, that they would have lost their positions long before the pictures could reach them no one ever stayed long there was always someone to carry reports to castro of treachery and plotting and there would be new faces on the ponton to stay a little while and then to disappear like their predecessors now for many days the sloop was our home and the innumerable gleaming canos of the delta our highways by day we explored the mangroves in our curiara or dugout and by night we slept the dreamless sleep of healthful outdoor life safe from the persecution of the humming anopheles outside our netting on the after deck when midday heat or sudden rain drove the wild creatures from our view i studied our motley crew and found them a never failing source of entertainment the tally of the crew must begin with Philo, the mate, a huge black creole, speaking Spanish besides his own strange vernacular. Then there were two sailors from the island of Margarita, and Antonio, cook by profession, admitting some Dutch blood, but of unknown extraction and decidedly uncertain disposition. The cook on board a Venezuelan craft is always given the respectful title of maestro so maestro he always was to us maestro as an individual was an interesting psychological study although he probably never heard of such a thing as a labor union yet he was the embodied spirit of one he declared in terms that left no possibility of misunderstanding that he was cook not sailor and that he would do nothing but cook he would cook cheerfully over a stove that smoked like dante's inferno but when called upon in an emergency to help hoist a sail he would fly into a violent torrent of angry spanish later when the temper had spent itself he would often go and do what was asked of him. I have seen many high tempers, but never one that quite equaled maestros. There were times when he would draw his huge cutlass or machete on the captain. For a long time, these were all false alarms, but at last maestro threatened once too often, and so seriously that he was discharged on the spot and left marooned in a little indian village with no means of returning to trinidad but this was at the end of our voyage maestro in his patched and faded shirt with sleeves rolled to the elbow still more patched trousers rolled to the knee bare as to feet crownless hat on one side of his head an ancient and odiferous pipe hanging from his mouth a big machete at his side in the capacity of cook would make the most shiftless housekeeper gasp with horror i often wondered why he so persistently declared himself cocinero not marinero 
for he could hardly have been a greater failure in any calling than he was in that of chef among the most valued of my memories are some mental pictures of maestro which while i live i can never manage to forget i often shut my eyes and see him with streaming eyes stirring some fearful concoction over the little stove or again on his knees mixing dough for the leaden dumplings to be boiled in the pigtail stew which appeared at every meal we so often wished we had brought graham flour white flour does show the dirt so still another picture is maestro washing the tablecloth this was a piece of oil cloth originally white and maestro's method of washing it was to spread it on the deck pour water over it dance upon it in his bare feet to the accompaniment of some weird chant and finally hang it on the rail to dry no doubt after this proceeding he felt as self-satisfied as the most pompous and well-trained english butler in justice i must say that maestro did make one or two edible dishes he could boil the native vegetables yam tania and kush and he made very good cornmeal mush then after a long happy day on the canos we were always hungry and happiness and honest hunger overtook a multitude of sins besides whatever was lacking in maestro's bill of fare was compensated by the dried soups cocoa crackers and preserves from our own stores so we managed one way or another to keep the wolf from the door or perhaps more appropriately i should say the crocodile from the companionway as in two weeks the crew had consumed provisions planned by the captain to last a month the captain purchased a hundred pounds of beef from a dugout full of indians which passed us one day on the river this maestro salted plentifully and then hung up in the sun to cure long strips of it were suspended from the rigging from the boom and over the railing and whole entomological collections buzzed noisily about them for a few days we felt as though we were living in a butcher's shop and a butcher's shop in a tropical climate is a thing to be avoided at first we were inclined to resent this impromptu meat market it was not only disagreeable but it was in the way then came the thought suppose it were fish and we were so grateful to be spared that that we cheerfully submitted to a sloop draped with strips of meat as a house is festooned with similax at christmas as long as the larder was low the captain had known no peace of mind for fear his crew would desert us and the sloop so the purchase of such a delicacy as meat was a successful piece of strategy with all their faults there is among the venezuelans as among the mexicans a certain chivalry towards women and so i never felt the least alarm at being left alone on the sloop with the crew while the captain and my husband went off up the river the great dusky creole mate would put my stool in a shady spot and figuratively lay himself at my feet to serve me and maestro even pugnacious maestro would weave wonderful baskets for me of the roots of the mangrove baskets in nests of twelve each fitting snugly within the other and all gaily dyed with the venezuelan colors the pigments being extracted from the leaves or stems of unknown wild plants the time passed all too quickly with each day spent on the guarapiche river a gleaming stage with a setting of green trees brilliant flowers and fragrant orchids and an ever-changing plot with ever-changing actors of them all man was the least important there were populous villages of hoatzins 
and other wandering tribes of scarlet ibises and plovers, herons, much occupied with their unsocial and taciturn calling as fishermen, stood silent and solitary in secluded pools. With all this wild life, the river teemed. It was only with the rising and falling of the tide that man entered upon the scene, and so quietly, so much a part of nature, that one hardly felt any difference between him and the forest folk. In a silently, swiftly moving curiara, he would glide under the shadows of the overhanging mangroves. Sometimes the curiara would be a merchant vessel, laden with ollas, fruit, etc., with its destination Maturin, many miles away in the interior. Again, its only occupant was a fisherman, as silent as the herons themselves. Like a heron also, he would station himself near a shady pool and sit all day motionless, save for the changing of bait or the pulling in of a fish. With the turning of the tide, the line would be drawn up, the fish covered with cool green leaves, and the curiara would move away, the bronze figure of its owner skillfully guiding it up the winding river. Occasionally the fisherman was accompanied by his squaw, hardly to be distinguished from him, and in the bow there was often the little naked figure of a child playing with a mite of a tame monkey, or both sound asleep with their arms wrapped about each other. All that these simple folk ask of life is one fish to eat, another with which to buy cassava and a yard of cotton cloth. In the brief tropical twilight, we would hastily make preparations for the night, spreading our air beds on deck, hanging over them a white mosquito canopy, and putting our electric flashlight and revolver at hand. After the first two nights, we had abandoned the cabin, which had added to its other discomforts the fact that all the mosquitoes of the caño had selected it as their abode. Never were nights more beautiful than those which we spent on the deck of that little sloop, and never was sleep more dreamless and peaceful. In the darkness of early evening, before the moon rose, we would sit on deck munching sugar cane, while the captain told us many a tale of his younger days, when he was the prosperous owner of a schooner twice the size of the Josefa Jacinta, and when smuggling brought adventure and yellow gold in abundance. He was full of legend and superstition. He told us of aged men and women, both among the Indians and the Spaniards, who, he declared, can by a peculiar whistle call together all the snakes in the vicinity, and then by incantations so hypnotize them that they can be handled with impunity. The owner of a hacienda will sometimes employ one of these charmers to call together the snakes, which can then be killed. The performers themselves, however, will never harm a snake. He told many a story of black magic arts, in which he firmly believed, of sending to one's enemies scourges of rats or deadly diseases or departed spirits to make life unendurable. Finally, the crew would roll up in their blankets in the bow. The captain would disappear beneath his mosquitaro, which would tremble and quake in the moonlight while he lay quiet in his hammock. We would creep beneath our tent of netting to write up the last notes of the day or to listen to the sounds of the night. From the bow would come a low murmur of voices in some weird chanting song until the captain roared out for all hands to go to sleep. But he would not practice what he preached, for he always talked himself to sleep, sometimes in English, or in Spanish, or again in Creole, while now and then he would mingle all three. By day one would not have suspected Philo, the mate, of being a person of romance, but under the spell of the tropical moonlight, he would often tell stories to the crew, 
stories in which the heroine was always muy preciosa muy joven muy linda very charming very young and very beautiful she would set difficult tasks for her many lovers and her favorite suitor would be the one who most bravely bore himself under the tests i remember one tale to which the crew listened with awe in which one of the lovers was to lie all night in the cathedral stiff and still like a corpse another was to go to the same cathedral on the same night dressed in winding sheets like a ghost another was to represent the angel of death while a fourth impersonated the devil and a fifth was sent as an ordinary man of course none of them were to know of the others having been sent by the fair heroine of the story and of course the fortunate lover was the one who showed no terror and passed the night quietly in the church returning in the morning to claim his bride the story had its dramatic situations and philo made the most of them even maestro was moved to utter a low dios mio at the description of the entrance of the ghost the angel of death and finally the devil at which the poor corpse who had been shaking with fear through it all started up and fled in terror philo's story lost nothing in its telling and the superstitious crew went soberly to rest that night william and i lay as we so often did staring wonderingly out into the night the marvellous tropical night it was all like a dream the shining water of the cano the deep mysterious forest growing down to the water's edge the cries of unknown birds and beasts the impressive southern cross and the extraordinary brilliancy of the moonlight shining down upon the tiny deck of the josefa jacinta and upon us and the sleeping forms of its dusky crew we were sometimes awakened in the night by a sudden bright light in our faces it was maestro making a fire in which operation he used alarming quantities of kerosene to prepare the midnight repast for the crew who whenever they woke in the night would call loudly maestro cafe again the sound of an unusually heavy downpour of tropical rain on the tarpaulin overhead would awaken us and i would occasionally discover that my feet were in a puddle of water a shifting of beds to prevent our being drowned while we slept would invariably result in our feet being higher than our heads and because of the horde of mosquitoes which found their way in while the beds were being moved the rest of the night would be sleepless with the dawn came the roar of the howling monkeys a dainty tigana picked its way among the mud flats a flock of hervidores which being translated means boilers an appellation perhaps suggested by the notes of these black cuckoos bubbled away as cheerily as a bright kettle on a breakfast table and with these sounds of the dawn all our troubles of the night were forgotten after weeks of solitude in the mangrove jungles our prow was headed inland and a long night of silent drifting with the tide brought us to the mouth of the guanoco river here the captain and the unruly crew at dawn had their usual heated argument as to the management of the boat with the result that they nearly ran her aground one of the many narrow escapes which had happened so often as to create but little interest on our part guanoco was a river of bends around each one of which the captain assured us we would see the village but it was twilight before we turned the final bend and saw picturesque guanoco at the hour of vespertino a hill rising steep and blue with the silvery river at its foot and a cluster of little thatched huts perched one above another on the hillside it was delightful to feel solid ground under one's feet again and we could hardly get over our accustomed walk of three steps and overboard end of chapter three part one
Chapter 3, Part 2 of Our Search for a Wilderness by Mary Blair Beebe. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Here in our wilderness we found an unexpected home. Through the kindness of our cordial friends in Trinidad, Mr. Eugene Andre and Mr. Ellis Grell, we had letters to the men in charge of the Pitch Lake at Guanoco, and it was to this great lake that the tiny settlement of Guanoco owed its being. As soon as we reached the wharf, a young Venezuelan came on board, introducing himself as Senor Bernardo Lugo y Escobar, one of the officials of the Pitch Lake Company, and explaining that Mr. Grell had written him that we might possibly come to Guanoco, and that we were to be entertained at the headquarters for as long as we chose to stay. Mr. Lugo was most urgent in his hospitality, and I knew well of what the sloop dinner would consist. Maestro and I would hold a perfectly futile consultation in which we would decide upon the only possible menu, funche, which is the Venezuelan name for cornmeal mush, dried pea soup, and cocoa. I must explain that the lack of variety in our larder was due to the fact that we had expected to be able to supplement our canned goods with fresh fish and game, both of which proved difficult to obtain, the latter because of the impossibility in this vast swamp of ever finding the game after it was shot. The experience taught us the useful lesson which every camper and explorer learns sooner or later sometimes alas too late never to depend upon the game of the country but always to plan your provisions as if game did not exist then when one gets it it becomes an unexpected luxury but to return to my visions of a good dinner in the preparation of which i had no part or responsibility perhaps there would also be the luxury of a real bath I was roused from these attractive reflections by the voice of the captain, politely refusing Mr. Lugo's invitation for the night, and saying that we would not go ashore until the next day, whereupon I diplomatically remarked in English that Mr. Lugo might not understand, that I thought Mr. Lugo's feelings would be hurt if we refused, and as long as we were to go the next day, and there was nothing to be gained by spending the night on the sloop, why not gratify him by going at once? And so it came about that in a few minutes more we were at headquarters. As the house was quite invisible from the water, we had imagined that we were to go to one of the thatched huts which we had seen from the river. To our surprise, around the base of the hill, we found ourselves going up a pretty palm-bordered walk which led to a low, massive, fort-like building. In the broad open hall were comfortable rocking chairs, in striking contrast to the sloop on which we had taken turns sitting on the one stool which the little craft possessed. In the patio was a table laid for dinner with a big black Trinidad Negro bringing in steaming dishes. There is no hospitality anywhere quite equal to that of the wilderness. Your host does not arrange your visit from the Saturday to the Monday, fitting you in between a multitude of other engagements. A wilderness welcome is as genial and inevitable as the tropical sunshine. Your visit is an event, a milestone in the long road of lonely months of exile months which sometimes lengthen into years. Our very interesting friend, Mr. Eugene Andre of Trinidad, told us that on one of his many orchid hunting expeditions, he had chanced to land at a certain godforsaken little port on the west coast of Colombia. Mr. Andre had wondered why the fare to this port from Panama should be $30, while the return passage was one hundred dollars. The problem was solved after he had seen the port. Desolate, barren, inaccessible, and fever and insect-ridden. 
one might be induced to pay thirty dollars to get there provided one knew not what manner of place it was but to get away one would pay any sum and gladly so it is that the little coastwise steamboat company calmly demands one hundred dollars to return the unfortunate traveler to panama and gets it at this forlorn spot there were stationed two young men i forget now in what capacity who for many months had not seen an intelligent human being into the empty monotony of their lives mr andre appeared it mattered not to those lonely young men who he was nor where he came from his welcome was stay with us stay a year or ten years we know all about each other we've talked about everything until there is nothing left to say we even know how much sugar we each like in our tea and who our great-grandmothers were and who we think wrote shakespeare's plays and we are so bored and so glad to see a new face thus it is that everywhere in the south american wilderness the english-speaking stranger is made welcome by his kind and we found guanoco no exception to this rule the pretty spanish greeting is the house is yours and during our stay at the pitch lake the headquarters became really ours we were given the best room the servants were put at our disposal and best of all we were perfectly free to come and go as we pleased and with everything done to facilitate our work all this we owed only to the instructions of mr ellis grell who was then financing the pitch lake company and to the kindness of mr lynch and mr stout two young west indians employed by the company we were tired that first night at guanoco the night before had been a hard one sailing all night long with the boom swinging back and forth and making impossible the hanging of our mosquito nets all through the night the captain and his crew worked down the narrow river the captain skillfully guided the sloop in the darkness of a moonless night following the line of the trees against the sky to mark the channel his commanding old voice rang from stern to bow the orders being there repeated by the mate to the sailors who were towing us and who paused in the wild melody which they chanted through that wonderful night to listen and obey it was a difficult and dangerous task the guiding of that sloop down so narrow and winding a river and even the unruly crew were obedient that night rendering the homage which in time of danger the ignorant unconsciously yield to a superior intelligence when we wondered at the captain's confidence he replied in his deep voice ah yes but i am old here and i know these conyos as i do my house and indeed here the curtain had risen upon his life and here it was likely to fall at the end of the last act when finally quite exhausted we had laid down upon the deck to sleep it was to fall into so profound a slumber that the mosquitoes devoured us unmolested in spite of our head nets which proved insufficient protection so it was that on the first night at guanoco we were very tired i sat lazily rocking in the cool evening breeze anointing my irritating bites with tango a preparation dependent upon faith cure for its healing properties and listening to the desultory talk of the young men the conversation was desultory however only so long as the venezuelan element of the household was present on this occasion that element was represented by the young mr lugo who had met us at the wharf after he had gone out on some errand the story of pitch lake was poured into our interested ears it was a story of intrigue and revolution and treason quite worthy of some medieval court first there was the passive venezuelan possession then the active enterprising money-making reign of the north american having as its natural result 
the jealousy of castro his oppression and injustice to the american company their rebellion in which they aided a great revolution against castro his revenge being to seize the property and put it in charge of venezuelans then came the departure of the american company which had done so much to develop the pitch lake followed by the arrival of the venezuelans appointed by the government men who knew just about as much about managing a great pitch lake as they did about guiding an aeroplane we were told of the time long before the advent of the lugo family when for weeks it was necessary to live always on the alert with revolver ever ready for defense when the very men with whom one sat down at table were capable of attempting to poison the food in order to free themselves of english-speaking men who might perhaps witness some ugly deed of treachery or defalcation this is the very long story in a nutshell we began then to understand why the house was so fort-like in structure it had been built to withstand assault only a few months before our visit it had been attacked by a party of revolutionists who hoped to find money in the company safe and five men had been killed and several injured this thrilling tale was told in the emotionless matter-of-fact way in which one might describe the moves in a game of chess from the moment our sloop sailed out of the harbor of port of spain the memory of the old familiar everyday world had seemed to grow dimmer and dimmer was it possible that there really was such a place as new york city with its clanging street cars its trains and subways and elevated roads thronged with people in mass all as much alike as an army of ants at that very hour the new york theatres were pouring their gay crowds into the brilliantly lighted streets how far away it all seemed down there in the great primeval forest of another continent we walked out under the stars to the edge of the forest black and mysterious teeming with the hidden life which we were so eager to study our world for the present was this forest wilderness stretching unbroken for mile upon mile with only the twinkling lights of guanoco to remind us of human habitations i dreamed that night of being stabbed in the back by a howling monkey while the safe of the pitch lake company was broken into by a band of shrieking macaws on the morning after our arrival at guanoco we sorrowfully said good-bye to the josefa jacinta as we watched her sail away we consoled ourselves by planning another and a longer trip on her a trip which never took place looking back after almost two years i realized that life can bring me few experiences more full of interest and charm than those days on a little venezuelan sloop exploring the mysterious untrodden mangroves how could you enjoy it i am often asked but the trifling discomforts were all in the day's work and more than compensated by the beauty and freedom and wonder of it all they served to make us know that it was not all a dream our days at guanoco began early and were full to overflowing of interest and work in the heat of midday we pressed flowers skinned the birds and wrote up our journals but in spite of being so busy we found time to get a little into the atmosphere of the human life here is the daily program at the lake of pitch this little outpost of humanity deep hidden in the tropical jungle at daybreak the group of sheds and thatched huts gives up a horde of trinidadian negroes great black fellows giants in strength children in mind amid a perfect medley of excitement and uproar breakfast is prepared we hear sounds which must mean at least the violent death of several and as one listens to the shrieks and groans 
the imagination easily supplies the terrible blows and struggles but a closer look only shows one of these great children down on his knees calling on everything which occurs to him or enters his vision to witness that he did not steal the sixpence from napoleon of which someone has accused him perhaps in jest yet all this is calmness compared to the later rush for the best cars to use in the day's work it would delight a sophomore's heart to see the melee but somehow all is straightened out and off go the hand trucks crawling along the rickety rails out over the lake like beads sliding along a string here a car has reached the end of the line the negro selects a place fairly clear of vegetation takes his broad adze and shears away the upper few inches of roots and mold then with deep swift strokes he outlines a big chunk of the shiny black gum cuts it loose and carries it on his head to his car so malleable is the pitch that by the time he has half filled the little iron truck the pitch has settled down and filled all interstices he trundles back the car and dumps it into one of the larger wooden trucks which will take it to guanoco he now receives a check which is redeemable for fifteen cents and the first link in the commercialization of the pitch is finished along the wavering line of temporary rails over which the hand cars are pushed back and forth are dozens of grave-like holes those nearer the railroad end are smooth edged and filled with soft pitch on which as yet no vegetation has taken root further along they are filled with water and still further we find them in the process of being excavated the men dig down until they have reached a depth of five or six feet and then start in a new place the hole is filled by the first rain water bugs fly to the little pool frogs lay their eggs in it queer fish wriggle their way to it and for a brief space it supports a considerable aquatic life then new soft pitch begins to ooze up and in a few more weeks the plug of viscid black gum has reached the level of the ground and the scar is soon healed over by a thin growth of grass in the rainy season the holes fill at once with water and indeed the whole plain is immersed to the depth of a foot or more then the men have to work up to their waists in water chopping beneath the surface prying the pieces loose with their toes and tearing the chunks off by taking long breaths and reaching far down for a few seconds at a time when we cross our asphalt streets and smell the tarry odor and feel its softness under a midsummer sun let us think of the strange lake in the tropical wilderness the table talk at headquarters was often most amusing torrents of spanish eloquence and gesticulations kept our english ears ever on the alert to follow the meaning and our sense of humor ever under strict control to preserve well-bred gravity when such statements were made as venezuela leads not only all the south american countries but all those of north america as well in literature art science and commerce when our general blank went to new york the greatest ovation ever paid any general in the world was given him new york remained amazed once only did i look amused and i have never quite recovered from my mortification at thus disgracing myself whatever the faults of the spaniard may be he never smiles when he is not intended to not even at the laughable mistakes which we foreigners make when we are learning his beautiful language i try to say in extenuation of my unseemly mirth that the spaniard has no sense of humor and that we should very much prefer having him laugh at our mistakes and letting us correct them but all to no purpose i know that i did not behave like a well-conducted venezolana and nothing can alter that fact the three venezuelans had been put in charge of the pitch lake because their 
sister's husband's niece, had power in the court of Castro. Among their regular duties they included singing airs from the operas, reading Don Quixote and the Caracas newspapers, and playing dominoes. They had provided themselves with elaborate costumes for the role. They carried big revolvers and wore huge green and white cork helmets, khaki riding clothes, putties, spurs, and carried riding whips. There was not a horse within fifty miles. No horse, even had there been one, could penetrate the tiny forest trails about Guanoco. In the dancing sunlight and shadows, and the orchid fragrant air, it was hard to picture spilt blood and intrigue and treachery, and harder still to prophesy the sad times that were to come upon Guanoco. Yet while we were there, the air teemed with revolutionary rumors. The jefe civil, as the chief magistrate was called, was off day after day, investigating first one suspicion and then another, returning utterly spent with the exhaustion of unresting days and nights upon the trail. Revolutionists had attempted to land guns on the nearby coast. There had been a skirmish and several men had been killed. All the available guns and ammunition were gotten together, and every night the doors were barred securely, for what the revolutionists chiefly needed was money, and should there be an uprising in northeastern Venezuela, the Pitch Lake headquarters would be the first point of attack. It was in charge of Castro sympathizers. There might be large sums of money in the company's safe and it was practically unprotected. In the meantime, diplomatic relations between our United States and Venezuela had been severed, and one morning a United States battleship was discovered lying quietly in the harbor of La Guaira. The numbers of La Constitucional, a month old when they reached us, were beginning to talk of war and to boast the ease with which Venezuela would erase the United States of America from the face of the globe. Bitter things were said about the sister republic in the north. And there we were, living on the bone of contention itself. It was about this time that I began to see the advisability of being more than ordinarily civil. And so it happened that I was led into playing cards for the first and only time for money, and that on a Sunday. We had been working almost incessantly, and I had begun to feel that, even if it was to Mr. Grell that we were indebted for the hospitality, it was not quite nice for us to appear only at feeding time, particularly as our long days out of doors gave us such appalling appetites. So on this occasion, when I was asked to make a fourth at cards, I saw no way out of it. Moreover, the battleship lay in the harbor of La Guaira, and my countrymen were in sad disfavor in Venezuela. William had ignominiously deserted and gone to bed, so there was only one sleepy little woman left to uphold the honor of a great nation. The game was siete y media, seven and a half. I forget the rules now. I only remember that they seemed very intricate, as explained to me in Spanish. Fortunately for me, the stakes were low, but I steadily lost all the time. Grano por grano la gallina come, quoted Mr. Lugo. Grain by grain the hen eats. Later he remarked how he hated to win from the senorita, but the senorita observed that he hated it much as the famous walrus wept for the oysters while he sorted out those of the largest size holding his pocket handkerchief before his streaming eyes. I was woefully tired and sleepy. I did not at all know the etiquette of gambling, and I thought the loser must not be a quitter, even if the extent of her losses was only dos reales, or twenty-five cents. So I played on until at midnight the game was declared over. It is well that virtue is its own reward, as it has no other for I was told the next morning by a husband who had had a perfectly good night's sleep 
that I was a very foolish person indeed to sit up playing cards with those men, and that the loser could always stop. It was the winner who must not propose it. The negroes from the Pitch Lake always came down on Saturday nights and serenaded us with wild Creole airs, and at the sound of the quaterns and violins, huge hairy tarantulas would come forth from their hiding places in our rooms and creep briskly here and there over walls and floor. We were greatly interested in this effect of the vibrations of sound, but we never bothered the great creatures in their strange tarantelles, and they paid no attention to us. The venomous effect of the bites of all these eight or hundred-legged beings is greatly exaggerated, and there is absolutely no serious danger to a healthy person with good red blood in his veins. In some of the half-starved rum-drinking natives, the scratch of a pin would induce blood poisoning. Labor was easily secured in Guanoco. The morning after our arrival, we expressed a wish to employ a boy to act as attendant, carrying camera, gun, butterfly net, etc., when we went on our long tramps. One of the young men at headquarters went to the door and called Muchacho, and at once a small boy appeared. I should have judged his age to be between eleven and twelve, but he himself did not know. He said his grandmother was keeping his age. A charming idea is that Venezuelan custom of having some responsible member of the family keep all the ages. Think of being able to say truthfully that you really do not know how old you are. But then a Venezuelan woman never confesses to more than 27, no matter what may have been the flight of time. Our small servant's name proved to be Maximiliano Romero, and with supreme self-possession, boldly spitting to the right and left, he professed himself willing to enter our service. Like a true Venezuelan, he used expectoration to punctuate all his remarks. What a quaint little figure he was, topped by a huge straw hat with a high-peaked crown. The hat, the work of the little brown hands of Max himself, for he was a hat-maker by profession. His face was alert but very grave. He rarely smiled, but when he did, it was in no half-hearted way, but with the abandon of childish glee. I found myself devoting a good deal of valuable time to trying to bring into being that charming smile of Maximiliano's. One never knew just what would touch the right chord. Once he went off into gales of merriment at the escape of a lizard which we were trying to photograph. He always saw the funny side of our mishaps. Max showed plainly in what esteem he held naturalists. The first day he went out with us, he was neatly dressed in dark blue jeans. When he appeared on the second morning, we did not recognize him. A small ragamuffin stood before us, stamping like a pony to drive away the flies which hovered about his ankles. His clothes were a mass of rags. It was impossible to say what had been the original color or material. Max had taken our measure and decided that people who tramped through the bush as we did were not worthy of anything better than rags. Sometimes in the jungle we would meet Indian women who, living far in the interior, were on their way to Guanoco to buy machetes fish hooks, and other articles of civilization. They would always stop and make friends with us, with childlike curiosity asking where we came from and why we wanted birds and lizards and butterflies, and murmuring the words dear to every woman's heart in all lands, que jovencita, which literally translated is, what a little young thing. Very simple-hearted are these poor Indian women, and so hard are their lives that at a very early age do they cease to be jovencita. We would often meet the wandering tribes of Guarauno Indians who live nearly always upon the march, carrying all their worldly possessions upon their backs 
and sleeping wherever night happens to find them. They very rarely knew even a word of Spanish and shunned any intercourse with strangers, scorning the inventions of civilization and using the poisoned arrows of their ancestors. One Sunday morning, one of the laborers at the nearby Pitch Lake, bearing the pious name of Jose de Jesus Zamoro, came into headquarters to invite us to a dance that afternoon at his house. The house of Zamoro had nothing particularly to recommend it as a ballroom, for the floor was of dirt, the ceiling low, and the walls windowless. But it was crowded, the air stifling, and the dancers dripping with perspiration. The music was wild and strange. The man who shook the maracas, an instrument consisting of two gourds, filled with dried seeds, which is shaken in time to the music, often breaking into a weird song, making up the words as he went along with some joke about each dancer. As the songster's zeal waxed high, he described himself as being so great that where he stood the earth trembled. Between dances, the ladies' last partners were supposed to take them into the next room where drinks were for sale. This was the explanation of Zamoro's zeal for dances. Music and dance hall were free, but a substantial profit came from the drinks. The ball gowns had but one beauty, that of originality. There was always an unfortunate hiatus between bodices and skirts, which was partially concealed by the long, straight black hair which hung down the backs of the women. The shoes were in a piteous condition, never the right size, very seldom mates, and not infrequently both were for the same foot. But all the skirts had trains, and all the ears bore earrings. We were told that these women often danced all day and all night until they became perfectly dazed, their feet moving mechanically in time to the music of the national dance, the haropa which is a cross between a clog dance and a waltz. We saw dancing the women whose curiara had so narrowly escaped a fatal collision with our sloop in the Guarapiche. The captain had said they were leaving Maturin to operate some speculation in Guanoco, perhaps even to find husbands. And here among so many men, for the population of Guanoco was chiefly composed of men employed at the lake, Surely there was hope, even for adventuresses so black and uncouth as these. Here also we met one of Guanoco's most amusing characters, a big black Trinidad Negro. He was full of the superiority of one who had seen the world, for he had once been to England as stateroom steward on one of the big steamers. He now dropped his H's, called his wife Lady McKay, and on Sundays wore a monocle. It was twilight as we walked home through the little settlement. At one of the huts, two little naked babies were playing rock a in the great curved sheaths which protect the blossom of the moriche, or eta palm. At another, a child came out and sang a little Spanish song for us, all about her sins and the confession she must make to the priest, the refrain being, mi penitencia, mi penitencia, and she sang it with her little hands clasped and her head devoutly bowed. A few coins made the wee penitent superlatively happy. Her mother must have taught her the song, for in Guanoco there was no priest, no school, no doctor. The two young West Indians at headquarters, neither much more than twenty years old, officiated at all funerals, being Catholic or Protestant, in Spanish or English, as the case demanded. They prescribed for all the diseases, from the prevalent fever to the woman who was suffering greatly, but could give no more definite description of her trouble than that she had a pain that walked. I could never understand the fever so common at Guanoco, for I never knew a place more free from mosquitoes and from insects of every description. We were continually in the sun and often in the rain, yet we both kept in perfect health. 
the women of the village had converted a small open shed into a chapel with an altar on which were all the offerings they could make a few candles some bits of gilt paper and tinsel a rude wooden cross and a wretched little chromo of the virgin here as we passed we saw the women kneeling for where else could they take their troubles at last our venezuelan experiences were a thing of the past and we were homeward bound leaving behind us the dear delightful never know what's going to happen life and realizing as our ship cut her way through the countless knots of dashing waves that as maximiliano had said with a shake of his head when we laughingly asked him if he did not want to go with us está tan lejos it is so far much has happened at guanoco since the days of our visit very soon after our departure castro fearing the smouldering revolutionary plots in trinidad ordered all the ports of eastern venezuela closed later came the deadly bubonic plague sealing for many months all the ports of the unfortunate country then indeed trouble descended upon poor little guanoco it was an essentially non-agricultural part of the country the one industry had been the digging of pitch the company's boat plying between guanoco and trinidad having brought all necessary supplies now with all communication cut off the people were in a piteous condition in the revolution of the wheel of fate which whirls so rapidly in venezuela the lugo family had been deposed and a new venezuelan administrator appointed in their place having known the lugos i like to think that they would have been less heartless than their successor who so the report goes sold what supplies there were to the starving people at cruelly exorbitant prices no matter how much one may love nature one cannot help feeling how unmoved she is in the face of suffering human beings might starve and sicken and die at guanoco but the sunshine would be just as warm and glowing and the wind in the palm trees just as musical as ever with the cutting off of communication between venezuela and trinidad captain trujillo's occupation was gone the josefa jacinta no longer plied busily back and forth between port of spain and maturin driving a brisk trade in hammocks groceries and hides and so at last she passed from the possession of captain trujillo to that of some more prosperous trader who could afford to wait for the reopening of commerce for a year our old captain watched his little vessel guided out of the harbor of port of spain with a strange hand at the helm and a strange voice in command then one day she sailed away never to return but to be run aground and lost on a desolate and lonely part of the venezuelan coast what became of her new captain and crew we never heard we knew only that the josefa jacinta was lost and that we could never sail her again except on dream canos in a phantom wilderness end of chapter three chapter four part one of our search for a wilderness by mary blair bb this librivox recording is in the public domain georgetown another year has slipped past and again we are southward bound toward that mecca the tropics which never ceases to call us the time is the fifteenth of february nineteen o nine the place the royal dutch mail steamship Copenhagen. nine days out from new york at three o'clock in the morning we are roused suddenly from sleep by a gentle roaring in our ears when we have gained partial consciousness we realize that it is the basso profundo whisper of good captain hosnoot summoning us to the bridge 
we ask no questions for we have learned that the voice of the genial dutchman means something worth while whether it is raised in a thunderous roar of hofmeister or as now in gentler aspects wrapped in flapping blankets we climb the steep ladder to the bridge there to enjoy for half an hour a most wondrous display of phosphorescence even excelling that visible in the bay of fundy the captain in all his world-wide seafaring has never seen anything to equal it we are only a short distance off the shore of british guiana and the ocean is thick with sediment from the rivers the sky is overcast and no light comes from the moon and stars and yet the whole sea is plainly visible the horizon glows with a dull yellow flare against the jet black sky and the myriad foam caps shimmer as with brighter flames the quenching of these in the opaque water gives a vivid impression of an enormous conflagration half hidden behind billows of smoke at daybreak georgetown is in sight a low flat line of wharfs with a background of galvanized tin roofs and tall bending palm trees never was a fairyland set in so prosaic a frame with what mingled feelings our little ship's family lean on the rail and scan the shore to some the thought comes of the miracles of yellow gold and precious stones hidden deep beneath the primitive forests to other sea-weary travelers the stability of the shore appeals most while we too watch for the first hint of bird life our desire is gratified before that of any of the others for over the water there comes the first morning call of the great yellow tyrant kiskadi bringing a hundred memories of the tropics as we steam slowly up to the wharf a small flock of gray-breasted martins twitters above our heads a black vulture swings over the tin roofs the jubilant song of the guiana house wren reaches our ear and our second search has begun to those who seek for wildernesses there is not much of interest in georgetown save the museum and the botanical garden yet there is no doubt that the city is one of the most attractive in the tropics and when the inhabitants are aroused to a sense of the opportunities which they are throwing away it will become a famous tourist resort awakening the country to new life and bringing shekels to the coffers of its merchants hotels and mosquitoes are the two keys to the situation the one to be acquired the other banished when this is done the many popular winter resorts will be hard put to it to retain their lucrative migrants from the north the inhabitants of georgetown have one regrettable failing an unreasoning fear and dread of their own country they cling to their narrow strip of coastal territory where they work and play live and die many of them without ever having been five miles away from the sea the majority of the inhabitants of french guiana are convicts chained for life to their prisons here the good people of british guiana bind themselves with imaginary bonds and picture their wonderful land as teeming with serpents and heaven knows what other terrors another unfortunate failing is the firm conviction of some of the influential citizens that there is no truth in the mosquito theory as a cause of malaria and yellow fever a distinguished english scientist recently sent to investigate yellow fever in barbados and british guiana was holding up as an example to the citizens of georgetown the barbadian custom of keeping fishes in their water cisterns explaining that the fishes devoured the mosquito larvae and thus kept down the number of mosquitoes a barbadian who chanced to be in the audience interrupted the scientist by saying oh but that is not the reason they put fishes in the cisterns 
it is to make sure the water has not been poisoned by some enemy until the mosquito is exterminated in georgetown the tourist will prefer to go elsewhere even though that be to a less beautiful spot we were advised to spend all our time in georgetown where we might drink pink swizzles than which no worse medicine exists or read in the cool library or study the natural history of the country impaled on pins or stuffed with cotton both of which are improving occupations but can be done quite as well in new york every moment spent in streets of human making seemed sacrilege when the real wilderness the wilderness of waterton of schaumburg and of off im thurn beckoned us just beyond armed with proper letters of introduction and traveling in the name of science one is treated with all courtesy by guiana officials the customs gave no trouble save that one pays a deposit of twelve per cent on cameras guns and cartridges we were glad to find that the most difficult privilege to obtain is a permit to collect birds and the very stringent laws in this respect are an honor to the governor and his colonial officials thanks to the absence of the plume and general millinery hunter the game hog and the wholesale collector birds are abundant and tame we were in the colony just two months and shot only about one hundred specimens all of which were secured because of some special interest we brought home some two hundred and eighty live birds which are now housed in the new york zoological park once off the single wharf lined business street of georgetown one is instantly struck by the beauty of the place green trees flowering vines and shrubs are everywhere half hiding the ugly tropical architecture the streets are all wide some with gravel walks down the center shaded with the graceful salmon trees others with central trenches filled with the beautiful victoria regia here a native two species of big tyrant flycatchers are the english sparrows of the city and white-breasted robins palm and silver-beaked tanagers perch on the limbs of trees at one's very window although we were anxious to start on our first expedition into the bush as the primeval forests of the interior are called yet a week passes very pleasantly in the city itself the street life is a passing pageant full of interest and of the charm of novelty for the northerner carriages roll past in which sit very correctly dressed and typical english women still others are filled with creoles some to all appearances perfectly white others in which the infusion of negro blood is very apparent many of the creole women have a certain languid beauty and a good deal of grace and self-possession the passing of the liveried carriage of the governor causes a ripple of excitement it is five o'clock the fashionable hour for driving and all these equipages are bound for the sea wall where the occupants sit and listen to an excellent band enjoy the sea breeze and chat with their neighbors about the all-important happenings of the social set of georgetown while the pale-faced children dig in the sand or run shrieking with glee from an incoming wave just as do their rosy contemporaries of the north another picture is the coolie in his loose white garments and turban and his sinewy bare brown legs he gazes at you as calmly and as unmoved as though you were not even the lowest coolie bears about him this unconscious dignity of an ancient race and a civilization that was old when we were but beginning the coolie women make a vivid spot of color in our pageant like some glowing tropical flower many of them are beautiful in feature and all are graceful in bearing there never were women 
who so perfectly understood the art of walking. They swing along, erect and lithe, with a springing step and perfect coordination of every muscle. Their heavy bracelets and anklets tinkle musically as they move. Their gay red and yellow and blue scarfs flutter in the breeze. The poise of their bodies reflects the perfect calm and repose of their smooth brown faces. What an antithesis these are to the ponderous old black women who are striding along with bedraggled skirts gathered up in a roll around their massive waists. They are untidy and slatternly in dress, heavy and awkward in movement in comparison with the straight, slim, coolie women. They are full of loud laughter and talk and song. At every street corner they gather in friendly, jovial groups, while the coolie women are strangely silent and reserved. No wonder that these two races so hate and scorn one another for in temperament they are as far apart as the poles. The British Guiana blacks were to us an unending source of interest and amusement. They were always courteous and kind and most original. Even when swearing at each other, their manner was always polite, and each anathema ended with a civil sir. Their dialect was at first very difficult to understand, but when our ears became familiar with it, we found it singularly attractive. All the A's are broad, even in such words as bad and man, while the intonation is indescribable, the verbs in a sentence being always emphasized and given a slight rising inflection, as, for example, I have been to Burbisi. An interrogation is often not at all indicated by the form of a question, but merely by the rising inflection, as, these are nice. The general effect of their speech is very musical and distinctive intonation. Always the irrepressible spirit of the black rises serenely above all the vicissitudes of life. A black woman from Arakaka was sentenced to a month in jail. Upon her return, she was welcomed by a crowd of friends, all eager to hear something of that mysterious jail, to which none of them were sure they might not some day go. To their questions, how was it? How was it? The heroine of the occasion replied with great dignity. A child, they see I was a lady, and they didn't give me the same work as the other prisoners. Later, on a trip down the river, the same woman, meeting the magistrate who had sentenced her, proudly remarked, Now I travel by myself. Her only previous experience in traveling having been under the escort of the police. Many of the blacks have far advanced cases of elephantitis. In a five minutes walk one will see a half dozen examples of this deadly disease but it takes more than elephantitis or jail to sadden the volatile spirits of the negro cosmopolitan as is the street pageant of georgetown it is however not so much so as that of port of spain the coolies are even more numerous there than here and in addition to the same sort of english and negro life there is also an american spanish and French element. One hears on all sides the pretty French patois, and the musical Spanish of the South American is a constant delight. This large Spanish and French population make Port of Spain a decidedly Catholic city, and priests and nuns in unfamiliar garbs are always a part of the picture. It is very hard for us northerners to realize that the course of a tropical day is much the same the year around. Here is a Georgetown day as we found it in February. At 5.30 a.m. it is still dark, and the only sound is an occasional raucous crow from the Chanticleer. Soon a subdued murmur of sound is heard, and this remains unchanged in volume for some time. 
Then the sunrise gun booms in the distance. A kiskadee shrieks just outside our window. A score of others answer him. Church chimes ring out. Noisy, coolie carts rattle past. Negroes sing, dogs bark, an excellent brass band strikes up a two-step, and amid all this pandemonium of sound, the sun literally leaps above the horizon and instantly fills the world with brilliant color. The scene changes like magic. There is no dawn or dusk. Night gives place to day without intermission. The temperature morning and evening is about 76 degrees. Woven amid all the harsh cries of kiskadees and tanagers is heard the sweet warbling of the little house wrens, reminding us of our singers of the north, and bubbling over with the same crisp vocal vitality which we hear in early spring in our own country. Like the morning, the tropical day itself is one of extremes. The morning dawns fresh and bracing. Until nine o'clock, one walks briskly, breathes deeply, and can hardly realize that he is at sea level within seven degrees of the equator. It is April and May in the calendar of one's feelings. Then, for an hour or two, June reigns. And finally, from 11 to 5 o'clock in the afternoon, it is hot, sultry August. In the shade, however, it is always comfortable. From 3 o'clock on, we experience the coolness of October, and until darkness shuts suddenly down about half past six, like the snuffing out of a candle, the temperature is perfect. The nights are delightfully cool. Mosquitoes are bad only in the houses, and at night one's net is a protection. The humidity is high, but it is far more bearable than that of a summer in New York City, contrary to our visual idea of the tropics. The manner of rain in the tropics is peculiar. The atmosphere may be ablaze with brilliant sunshine when a slight haze appears in the air, and suddenly one realizes that a fine, gentle rain is falling. This may cease as imperceptibly as it began, or increase to a terrific downpour, to give place, perhaps a few minutes later, to the clear tropic glare again. End of Part 1 of Chapter 4Part 2 of Chapter 4 of Our Search for a Wilderness by Mary Blair Beebe. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Before taking leave of Georgetown, we must mention the three chief points of attraction. The sea wall comes first, and as we have said, a most pleasant custom of the natives is to drive there in late afternoon and sit in their carriages. The concrete breakwater is of vital importance to the town itself, as a portion of the streets are below sea level. The broad summit forms a mile or more of promenade, with a sandy beach on one side, lapped with waves which strive ever to break, but cannot because of the thick sediment which they hold in suspense. On the other side, a double row of tall, graceful palms adds a touch of tropical beauty. The residences near the seawall are the coolest and most pleasant in the town and are practically free from mosquitoes. We spent more than one delightful evening in the garden at Kitty Villa as the guests of our charming American friends, Mr. and Mrs. Howell. From the open veranda-like rooms, one may watch the yellow orioles, the brown-breasted pygmy grosbeaks, the anis, and kiskadees going to roost. Just before dusk, scores of the small black vultures appear, flying singly, or in twos and threes low over the trees and palms, westward to some general roost. About this time the bats and the lightning bugs arrive. 
large numbers of very tiny bats hawking about after insects and several large fruit eaters with wings spreading almost two feet across these haunt the fruit laden sapadillo trees and as the method of feeding of these curious creatures does not seem to be generally known we watch it with interest one of the big fellows flits here and there nipping first one fruit and then another at last when a sweet or fully ripe one is found the bat swoops up to it alights head downward and half enveloping it with its wings bites away frantically for two or three seconds and then dashes off this is repeated until darkness settles down but never does the wary bat linger over his feast in the north the sight of a single bat darting along on his eccentric way is not uncommon but here we were soon to become accustomed to the sight of scores some pursuing insects or feeding on fruits or waiting and watching for a chance to drink the blood of men and animals more than twenty-five species have been found here within a few miles of the coast small owls and nocturnal insectivorous birds are somewhat rare and thus the bats have few foes and little competition in their aerial life late in the evening as we drive slowly homeward from the sea wall we discover another interesting microcosm of the tropics the road is well lighted with arc lamps sources of irresistible attraction to numberless insects many of which drop stunned to the earth beneath some genius among the georgetown toads has discovered this fact and passed the word along until now one finds a circle of expectant amphibians squatted beneath each arc light with eyes and hopes lifted to the shining globe overhead now and then an unfortunate insect falls within the magic circle when a toad leaps lazily forward and devours the morsel with one lightning-like flick of the tongue many of these toads bufo agua are enormous fellows a good hatful standing fully eight inches from their pudgy toes to their staring eyes all comical dignified fat and sluggish barely hopping aside in time to avoid the horse and carriage to a visiting naturalist the museum is the place of greatest interest and although the animals and birds are faded and poorly mounted yet they are representative of the fauna of the country and are hence of great value in accustoming one's eyes to the strange forms of life the present curator mr james rodway did everything in his power to aid us and we were indebted to him for many kindnesses although he is primarily a botanist entomology occupies his attention at present and the supply of species of the various orders of insects living in this region seems well nigh inexhaustible mr rodway is a good example of the healthfulness of british guiana for he has lived there thirty-nine years and has been ill only one day he accounts for this by his teetotalism but perhaps the next person we meet will inform us that a half dozen swizzles a day are absolutely necessary to keep the breath of life within the body the botanical gardens under the able direction of professor j b harrison are a great credit to the colony with beautiful vistas of palms and ornamental shrubs they combine smooth expanses of green lawns a rare feature in a tropical landscape ponds and ditches are filled with victoria regia and lotus save one where a number of manatees keep the aquatic vegetation cropped close a wonderful palm was in blossom at the time of our visit a taliput with a mass of bloom twelve feet in height which had begun to flower the month before governor hodgson and professor harrison gave us the freedom of the garden 
and placed at our disposal five circular aviaries which proved of an inestimable value in housing the living birds which we were able to secure. Here Mr. Lee S. Crandall, our assistant, made his trapping headquarters after our return from our first inland expedition, and here we spent many afternoons among the fields and bypaths. We soon found that bird trapping in the tropics is a task beset by many difficulties. The extreme heat between the hours of 10 and 4 o'clock make even the tackiest lime nearly as thin as water and hardly capable of holding even the diminutive doctor bird as the natives call the hummingbirds. The call birds which are confined in very small cages or cribs cannot endure the high temperature under these conditions and soon succumb if left out in the sun. Operations therefore must be confined to the few hours immediately following sunrise and preceding sunset. Another feature very trying to the bird catcher is the habit which most of the birds have of going singly or in pairs. A few of the icterine birds, such as the yellow-headed blackbird, cowbird, little boat-tailed grackle, and most of the caciques feed mostly in flocks, sometimes of great size. In the deep bush of the interior, it is the habit of birds of many species to search together for food, following a set route and keeping closely to their time schedule. But ordinary call birds and setups are not for these. This gregarious habit among widely varying birds is, however, at times a great aid to the trapper. A cage containing a yellow-bellied caliste was one day placed in a tree about 20 feet high and limed twigs arranged on neighboring branches. In two hours in the morning, two specimens of the same species, three blue tanagers, two black-faced calistes, two tuatuas or brown-breasted pygmy grosbeaks, and one yellow oriole were taken. The various species of tanagers and orioles are much more gregarious in feeding habits than the finches, hence the variety caught. The tua tuas were purely accidental visitors. The finches can rarely be taken by a call bird not of the same species. The black or coolie boy who makes his living at catching birds at tuppence each sets out at daylight with his two or three call birds in their cribs arranged on a stick. Arrived at some secluded spot where he has heard the song of an intended victim, he sets his call birds on upright sticks of two or three feet in length and places on the top of each cage a strong wire heavily smeared with the gum of the sapadillo. This wire is very carefully twisted so that it cannot by any possibility become loosened. This is, of course, contrary to the ethics of all good bird catchers, for if the bird falls to the ground with its stick, it is much more certain to be secured and less liable to injure itself. However, this is British Guiana. Having made his setup, the youth steals softly back and conceals himself a short distance away. As soon as left to themselves, the birds, if they be experienced, commence their song. Soon an answering call is heard. Instantly the decoys cease their song and send forth their sharp call notes. Soon the curious stranger appears, perhaps a fine adult male, full of eagerness for a battle. If this be the case, the songs are again resumed, and the climax of the concert is almost certain to be the capture of the challenger. If the visitor be a coy female, the seductive call notes are continued, and though the time required may be greater, she is nearly as certain to be captured. Callow youngsters out for their first exploring trip are, of course, the easiest victims. 
but when the trapper has taken a bird or two from this locality he must move on or give up for the day for he will take no more the trapping methods of these people are of course very primitive they know nothing of clap nets they laugh at the idea of catching birds with an owl as practiced successfully in the north a black boy will bend his gummed wire securely on a likely twig and lie all day on his back in the shade hoping that a bird may light on it birds to whose capture they are not equal are very apt to be licked stunned by a bullet from a slingshot and foisted on the unwary purchaser these unfortunates of course rarely live more than a day or two no regard is shown for nesting birds or nestlings caciques and orioles are captured by adjusting a string about the mouth of the long pendulous nest and closing it tightly when the bird has entered to hover its eggs in two instances a black boy was seen to capture the female from her nest by creeping up and dropping his hat over her some use is made of primitive trap cages which are baited with plantain or sliced mangoes tanagers or sackies and various orioles are taken in this manner these simple people have of course no knowledge whatever of proper food for insectivorous or frugivorous birds various fruits preferably plantain are used and it is truly surprising how long some individuals will survive on this too acid food mr howie king government agent of the northwest district actually kept a specimen of the yellow oriole for over seven years on a strictly fruit diet birds and other creatures were very abundant and tame in the botanical gardens guiana green herons or shypooks as the coolies call them spur-winged jacanas and gainules walked here and there the latter leading their dark-hued young over the regia pads small crocodiles basked half out of the water none over three feet in length as abundant as turtles in a northern mill pond several huge water buffalo imported from the east indies looked strangely out of place in this hemisphere butterflies were scarce although a great variety of flowers were in profusion everywhere april seems to be the height of the breeding season for many birds in one tree we found two wasps nests and nests with eggs or young of the following six species of birds the red-winged ground dove the great and lesser kiskadees white-shouldered ground flycatcher or cotton bird gray toady flycatcher or pipituri and cynercus picard chestnut cuckoos of two species all four kiskadees caracaras black-faced tanagers or bucktown sackies elaneus and other flycatchers are a few among many birds which we were sure of seeing on every walk while anise both great and small were everywhere the botanical gardens are ideal for experimental botanical work and sugarcane in scores of varieties is being kept under observation it is hard to believe that the delicate grass which we see springing up in the ditched fields will grow into the lofty and waving stalks of sugarcane it is exceedingly variable and should afford excellent material for experimental study the original yellow stalked cane develops red and purple streaks in many combinations due apparently to difference in soils cane sent to louisiana will within 12 years produce much larger nodes owing to the plant having to fruit in six months instead of eleven or twelve the stock however does not gain correspondingly in diameter so there is no increase in sugar capacity tropical plants can in many cases 
adapt themselves to shorter northern summers but temperate perennials soon die in the tropics from exhaustion lacking their annual period of rest the climatic conditions along the coast of british guiana are peculiar in that they simulate conditions usually existing at an altitude of two or three thousand feet one result of this is seen in the flourishing tree ferns planted in the botanical gardens insects were not particularly abundant in georgetown that is for a tropical country one day mr rodway with his accustomed kindness brought us two very interesting chrysalids of the swallow-tailed butterfly papilio polydamus illustrating the remarkable color variation in this species both were found in his yard a few feet from each other one suspended among green leaves and the other on a wooden stairway which was painted a brick red one of the chrysalids was leaf green in color while the other was brown with brick red trimmings there was one remarkable exception to the scarcity of insects in georgetown late in february a moth-like homopterous insect poicillotera phaleonoides was present in enormous numbers on the salmon trees which line many of the streets the largest individuals had wings almost an inch in length of a light cream color covered for about half their expanse with two masses of black dots these were the males the females were wingless and their bodies were covered with a long dense cottony secretion the eggs and larvae which lined thousands of the twigs were also protected by this white material one could hardly walk without crushing these insects so numerous were they the only birds we observed feeding on them were anise and domestic fowls the middle of april found these insects as abundant as ever still hatching in myriads but by the twenty-second of the month the broods on the main streets seemed to be diminishing although the hordes infesting the trees at the entrance of the botanical gardens were on the increase noticing that there seemed to be interesting nodes of variation in the number and patterns of the dots on the wings of the males we set a coolie boy to gathering them for future study and he soon had a thousand or more in a jar of alcohol end of chapter four part one of chapter five of our search for a wilderness by mary blair bb this librivox recording is in the public domain steamer and launch to hoorie creek when we left new york we had planned to go up the demerara river from georgetown and spend our time on the essequibo and potaro we had the good fortune however to take the same steamer with mr and mrs gaylord wilshire who were paying their annual visit to their two large gold concessions the previous year they had traveled over many of the larger rivers and when we heard their glowing accounts of the northern and western wilderness compared to the rather thinned out bush and more traveled route of the demarara and were asked to join their party in going first to the huri mine in the northwest and then to the aremu mine in central guiana we hesitated not a moment. We left the Georgetown Stelling, or wharf, at noon on March 2nd on the little steamer Mazaruni for the long coastwise trip to Morahana. Leaving the harbor flock of laughing gulls behind, we steered straight out to sea for several hours before turning to the northwest. The water all along the coast is very shallow and is so filled with sediment that even in a heavy gale the waves break but little we passed the mouth of the essequibo thirty-five miles in width with the two great islands waknam and leguan fairly in the center of the mouth the night was rough and windy 
and the little tub rolled wildly. At five o'clock next morning, we were steaming slowly between two walls of green, which brought vividly to mind our Venezuelan trip of last year. A few other plants were intermingled with the mangroves, but the solid ranks of the latter were unbroken. The colors were as wonderful as ever, the rich dark green on either hand, bright copper beneath and azure above. A few hours later we entered Mora Passage, and here palms began to rear their heads over the other foliage. The air was cool and bracing. We breathed deeply and watched for the first signs of life. A half dozen Muscovy ducks swung past, the giant master of the flock in the lead, their white wing mirrors flashing as they flew. Two Amazon parrots rose ahead of us, and the shore was alive with tiny white moths fluttering over the water. Morahana is within five miles of the Venezuelan boundary, and politically is important as being the chief government station for the Northwest District, and being the entrance post for the gold fields of this region. As we tied up to the primitive wharf, Indians in their dugouts or wood skins appeared in numbers, bringing fish, rubber, and other things for trade to the little Chinese store. Morahana itself consists of a struggling line of thatched huts, extending irregularly along the bank and inland between the marshy spots. A short walk on shore showed the inhabitants to be Indians, blacks, and half-breeds. Birds were abundant, especially yellow-bellied calistes, honey-creepers, tanagers, and the four commoner species of Kiskadee tyrants. A large skimmer flew past the boat, and later we saw several flocks. We expected to meet the launch from the Hoori Mine, but as it had not yet arrived, we boarded the steamer again and went on with it to the end of its route at Mount Everard. We left Morahana at half past ten in the morning and reached our destination five hours later. Although all this country is low and marshy, yet the white mangrove and the corrida, or red mangrove, here gave place to a variegated forest growth, and we soon saw our first mora trees. Huge, we thought them, but to be dwarfed by the inland giants of our succeeding expeditions. The walls of vegetation were 70 or 80 feet in height, draped by vines, while dead branches protruded here and there from the water near shore. Many snake birds were perched on these snags, from which they dropped silently into the water at our approach and swam off with body immersed. Blue and yellow macaws were common, always as usual in multiples of two. We observed them a half dozen times in different reaches of the river, four in the first group, then eight, two, six, four, and two. A trio of American egrets kept flying ahead of us for several miles, hemmed in by the lofty walls of foliage, alighting now and then and waiting for the steamer. At last, when only ten yards distant, they rose and floated over our heads. Once a splendid Guiana crested eagle flew past, and alighted on a dead tree, and twice we saw small colonies of yellow and red-backed caciques nesting in isolated mora trees out in the water, a new method of protection on the part of these intelligent birds. At occasional intervals a nesting pair of white-throated kingbirds was seen, but no other of the tyrants which are so common about houses in this region. The event of the day came when we caught a flash of white from a buzzard floating high overhead and our stereos showed a king vulture circling slowly around, craning his wattled head down at us as he drifted past. We had never expected to see this bird near the coast and indeed we saw no others during our entire stay in Guiana. As we steamed past a windbreak, 
we caught a momentary glimpse of two wee naked Indian children paddling away in a wood skin while behind them their bronze skinned parents watched us silently. Mount Everard lies about 50 miles from Morahana up the Barima River and consists of a ramshackle hotel and several logies, the latter being mere open sheds from whose rafters hammocks may be hung. The whole country hereabouts is low, except at this point where two small conical hills arise, one on each side of the river, bearing the high-sounding names of Mounts Everard and Terminus. The forest has been partly cleared from these, and we attempted to explore the neighboring country. We soon gave it up, as the underbrush was too thick, and even when we forced a way through it, there was no footing but muddy water. Cow paths led over the mounts, which seemed to be composed of red, sticky clay. Halfway up Mount Everard, we found an enormous terrestrial ant's nest, some 15 feet across, bare of vegetation, and with well-marked roads four to six inches wide leading out into the jungle. A little prodding with a stick brought out scores of huge-jawed soldiers, Atta cephalodes. The most interesting birds were the well-named magpie tanagers, which flashed past now and then. The long graduated tail, the glossy black and white plumage, and the conspicuous white iris mark this as one of the most striking of the tanagers. The call note was loud and harsh, but the tones of those we saw in captivity and of one individual which we brought back alive were pleasant and modulated. Euphonias, blue, palm, and silver-beaked tanagers, and red underwing doves were all nesting close to the settlement while in a good-sized tree, whose branches were brushing against the, quotes, hotel, quotes, windows, were some hundred nests of caciques, the red and the yellow-backed in about equal numbers. When the two were seen fighting, the red-backed seemed invariably to have the better of it. The natives here think the different colors mark the two sexes. Just before sunset, the wharf at Mount Everard began to show signs of life. All day it had been deserted. A few small flat-bottomed boats, which we came later to know by the native name of Ballyhoos, being moored idly against the dock. But now, as the day drew to a close, groups of Indians and Negroes gathered. We hung over the railing of our boat and watched them as lazily and as curiously as they watched us. Then the quiet air was rent with a medley of grunts and squeals and brays, the cries and shouts of human beings rising above all the other sounds. As a large party of men appeared, escorting one scrawny cow, one lean but energetic hog, and finally one donkey, in whose being was concentrated all the stubbornness to which his race is heir. The problem was to load these beasts into one of the waiting ballyhoos. The ballyhoo was small, the current was moving it to and fro, and the cow and the donkey and the hog were not minded to go a voyaging. As the negro always talks to his beast of burden as though it were his intellectual and social equal, so in this case the men approached the animals with all manner of reasonable argument, explaining where they were going and the importance of an early start, and appealing to all that was noble and estimable, emphasizing everything with a choice selection of expletives combined with physical force. Finally, after pushing and prodding, the ill-fated cow they succeeded in half-shoving half throwing it into the boat. After many struggles, the loudly indignant hog followed. When at last the donkey had been safely embarked, we wondered if that little craft would ever reach its destination with so heavy and protesting a load. 
when to our surprise the big black who had been most vociferous and active in the recent melee wiped his dripping forehead and stood calling passengers passengers all aboard with as grand an air as though he were the chief steward of a great ocean liner the passengers proved to be half a dozen buxom negresses who with many a coy glance and feminine shriek of terror allowed the big black proprietor to help them from the dock to the boat now rocking violently beneath the restless feet of the animals finally the ballyhoo moved slowly upstream bound for a distant mine in the far interior and another boat laden with bananas followed an indian paddled swiftly past in his wood skin then darkness fell as suddenly as the dropping of a stage curtain and we turned away from the river drama back to our life on board the mazaruni while awaiting the dinner bell we slung our hammocks along the deck that through the meal we might know that they were swinging gently in the velvet night air all ready for our comfortably tired selves the night was clear and the blacks worked for several hours in the moonlight unloading cargo not a mosquito came to mar the beauty of the night indeed the natives said they were never troublesome here at mount everard in our hammocks as we rocked to sleep we thought drowsily of our dear venezuelan wilderness of last year we were so glad to be sleeping again in the open under the canopy of the southern sky at last we felt that we were on the threshold of another wilderness at four o'clock in the morning we awoke and heard far off through the jungle the old familiar howling of the red baboons about five a rooster crowed on board and was answered by several on shore and this seemed to awaken a black who began singing from his hammock in a logie when a score of others took up the wild refrain and kept it up until daylight with the sudden rush of light came the distant bubbling of twatwas those little thick-billed pygmy grosbeaks and the cackling hubbub of the cacique colony returning to morahana we were made welcome at the home of mr howie king the government agent while waiting for our hoorie launch the government house is well built and belonged formerly to sir everard m thurn it is surrounded by a garden which must have been magnificent and which mr king is attempting to restore clearing away the undergrowth which has long overrun the beautiful shrubs and flowering plants the house is built on the extreme southern end of a great island which extends in a northwest direction for about fifty miles far into venezuelan territory mora passage lying between it and morahana proper flowers were abundant attracting many insects and these in turn birds of a score or more species kiskadees were nesting in low boy immortelli trees yellow-backed caciques or bunyas in a great salmon overhanging the house while in the garden were seed eaters of several kinds together with blue and palm tanagers and the beautiful moriche orioles guiana house wrens were nesting indoors on the ceiling rafters and under the deep eaves of the half veranda half sitting room was a beautiful pendant nest of the feather-toed swift composed entirely of feathery seed plumes it was a straight symmetrical column about three inches in diameter and fourteen inches long suspended from the palm thatch not half a foot from a hanging open comb wasps nest the upper ten inches of the nest was built and occupied just six months ago in september and a brood of two were reared now the birds had returned and were preparing to nest again having already added four inches of pure white seed plumes easily distinguished from the older browner weathered portion they came to the nest every hour 
with a beakful of plumes and pressed them into position while fluttering in mid-air evidently utilizing their saliva as a cementing substance in the interims between their visits hummingbirds sometimes two at once came and filched nesting material from the lower end fraying it out very appreciably their nests were attached to the lesser stems of a dense clump of bamboo in the garden this swift was common on all the guiana rivers hawking with swallows over the water seen on the wing it appears glossy black with a white throat and collar it was the height of the season of courtship of the palm tanagers and they were noisy and bold a caged female proved to be a source of great attraction and several wild ones kept coming to the cage we trapped two and they made themselves at home within a few minutes there was considerable variation some being gray almost a bluish gray while in others the green was strongly dominant the chickens and ducks were taken by two kinds of opossums one large ill-smelling and living in the bamboos and the other very small and rat-like game was abundant here and tapirs tinamous and guans were shot for food the mud flats were inhabited by a host of crabs most of them exactly like our little fiddlers while others were larger and blue or yellow in color sand flies and mosquitoes were present in small numbers the latter troublesome enough for hammock nets at night but the worst pest hereabouts was the bet rouge which abounded in the grass both at mount everard and here nowhere else did we suffer so much from the fiendish little beasts like seasickness or an earthquake bet rouge is a great leveler of mankind like a common disaster doing more to make men quotes, free and equal than all the constitutions and doctrines ever signed in a bet rouge infested region the conversation is sooner or later sure to turn upon the subject of these little red mites everyone you meet has his or her particular pet remedy to prescribe the subject under discussion may be the coolie immigration laws or the proper scientific name for some species of orchid or who is to be the next governor but some sharp-eyed fellow sufferer is certain to detect the guilty look upon one's face which translated into words would be my ankles are devoured by bet rouge and then the assembled company begins to discuss the topic of really vital interest we tried all the remedies scrubs ammonia dry soap wet salt wet soda alcohol resinol ointment chloroform camphor to little purpose beyond very temporary relief finally we reached the stage when good manners were thrown to the winds and every victim scratched at will despite the fact that it eventually aggravated the trouble there was developed an individuality in the method so that at long distances we were able to recognize one another by the characteristic motions of discomfort then came the discovery of crab oil which is an ounce of prevention and not a cure rubbed on before going out no sane bet rouge will attack you crab oil is made of the nut of the crab wood tree and it is greasy and sticky and has a disagreeable rancid odor which is very lasting one of us hinted that it was a question whether the remedy were not worse than the disease she even objected to having bottles of crab oil rolled for safety in packing in her very limited supply of clothing she was promptly pronounced finicky by her quotes better half who was righteously indignant and surprised at discovering so unexpected a quality in her 
but then he more than anyone else was afflicted with bet rouge and so could not be expected to see anything at all objectionable in the odor of the crab oil to which he owed so much relief it does unquestionably give relief well protected with crab oil one can bid defiance to the annoying little pests which an old gentleman whom we chanced to meet in our travels persistently and seriously called bet noir under the delusion that that was their proper and very appropriate name mr king's garden was a constant source of interest because of the flowers the insects and the birds in the top of a dead shrub a good-sized yellow flowered orchid had been tied this during the last rainy season had evidently dropped seeds some of which had clung to the branches beneath and then sprouted when we saw them there were twenty or more of these diminutive orchids scattered over the shrub each with four tiny clinging rootlets a three-parted leaflet and in the center one blossom as big as the entire plant the whole not larger than a shilling two large species of lizards lived in the garden the common iguana which climbed the trees and fed on leaves and buds and another called locally salapenta teus nigropunctatus which included carrion chicks and even fish in its bill of fare they would now and then dive into a small pond and appear with a small fish in their jaws the last evening of our stay at mr king's we spent sitting on the wharf looking out over mora passage the ripples died from the wake of the steamer as she vanished around a bend on her way back to georgetown a cool refreshing breeze blew toward us as the sun's light faded and a dense flock of more than a hundred amazon parrots flew overhead our shadows changed from sharp black outlines thrown on the water before us to faint gray shapes moon cast on the crabwood boards behind the tangle of palms and liana draped trees across the passage became more indistinct and the brilliant moonlight lit up the swirling brown current an indian boy passed silently in a narrow curiata we were his friends we had given him sixpence and he was off to the little store amid the low thatched huts a few hundred yards down the river which marked morahana we knew him only as frederick for no white person would ever be told his real name that of some animal or bird as such disclosure is against all indian custom from the fear of thereby giving others civil power over them he gave us a quick shy half smile and then all light died from his mongolian features as he peered sternly into the darkness ahead well had he need of fear and caution we may be sure his purchases were made stealthily and his quick return was certain for death watched for him in a hundred places the day before he had testified against three of his tribe the caribs for the murder of his father and now the stern hand of english justice had closed and the chief murderer was eating his heart out somewhere in a cell beyond the bend of the river no more could frederick mingle with his tribe and on his knees and in tears he had begged mr king to keep him and shelter him on the government island the vendetta would follow him through life and it was almost certain he would be killed sooner or later the calm of the evening was perfect undisturbed by all this hidden tragedy when the moon was well clear of the trees some great frog hidden in the swamp began his rhythmical crunk 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 and tiny bats dashed about splashing the surface of the water as they drank or snatched floating insects the yap yap of a passing but invisible skimmer came faintly and the throbbing roll of a second kind of frog rumbled out of the dusk across the river the moonlight became ever stronger 
and now a kiskadee called sleepily from his great untidy nest in the distant village. A sharp whiplash of sound came to our ears, and we knew that a parauque had awakened from his diurnal slumber. An answering cry sounded near at hand in the garden, and we could distinguish the two connected tones. The splash of paddles announced the return of the rest of our party, as an Indian woman began a droning song from the fire before her, but a few yards away. Impatient as we were to get into the real bush, the days at Morahana were delightful. From Mr. King we learned a great deal about England's government of this out-of-the-world colony. We were especially interested in the protection of the indentured coolie. In the first place, the coolie labor market is never allowed to become overcrowded. Each employer sends in an order for the exact number of workmen which he requires, so that the supply brought over is never greater than the demand. The coolie gets free passage from India to South America and is guaranteed work at a minimum wage of a shilling a day, including his food. On his arrival, the immigration agent assigns him to a certain estate where his term of indenture is five years, his wage being increased as his capacity for work becomes greater. During his term of service, he can leave the estate only by permission, and he must never be found at large without his passbook. At the end of five years, the coolie is free to work where he pleases, or to take up a grant of land on his own. After five years more of residence, he may return to India free of charge if he so wishes. As the coolie is very thrifty and can live on three pence a day, his menu being rice and water, at the expiration of his ten years, in addition to having earned his living and supported his family, he has often saved up as much as two thousand dollars. Throughout his term of indenture, the English government looks after him. He always has good medical care free, and the law watches over him with scrupulous vigilance, seeing that he is justly treated by his employer and that no advantage is taken of his ignorance and inexperience. When the coolie leaves India, he of course loses caste, but as they all fall proportionately, each moving down one in the social scale, a proper balance is preserved. The coolie returning to India, however, finds himself a disgraced outcast. To regain his position in society, he must pay large sums of money to the priests, and so it is that he returns to his native land only to be robbed of his hard-earned savings often returning to South America as a re-indentured man to start life again. In order to discourage his return to India, the government offers him the money equivalent to his return passage. Many of the coolies take advantage of this and make South America their permanent home, taking up grants of their own and living in greater peace and prosperity than would ever have been possible for them in India. The population of Morahana is composed of coolies, Indians, and blacks, who look to the magistrate as a sort of all-powerful father to whom they bring troubles of every conceivable kind. As we were sitting at breakfast one day, an aged coolie man was seen hanging around the door. He must see Mr. King on a most important matter which proved to be a delicate one indeed. His wife had fallen in love with another man, and what was he to do? Such troubles are very common among the coolies. Instead of avenging himself upon the man who dared to alienate his wife's affection, the coolie invariably murders his wife, the favorite method being to chop her up particularly small. In this instance, his wife was young and good-looking, and her grievance was that her husband expected her to assume the entire support of him and his family, and she declared she would rather die than go back to him. The only solution of the problem was 
to hurry the woman off on the afternoon boat to georgetown in order to save her from murder and her husband from execution they are all very fond of bringing their wrongs into court an irate indian woman will appear bringing a charge against the dressmaker who has made her wedding dress too short dress of any description is the most recent of acquisitions with the indian women but having acquired it she intends that her wedding gown shall fulfill all the requirements of dame fashion so far as she knows them the gown in question has been brought into court as incontrovertible evidence should she not put it on and prove to the magistrate who cries in despair that he knows nothing of the proper length of wedding gowns and calls in another dressmaker for expert opinion the two dressmakers stand together and the case is dismissed this is quoted to show the infinite patience with which the magistrate treats each case however trivial the commissioner of health brings a charge against a coolie man on the ground that he has allowed the drains near his hut to become clogged and so endangered the public health mr king reads the indictment in impressive magisterial tones accusing the offender of having permitted his drains to become foul foul is evidently the one word which conveys any meaning to the coolie who exclaims in a tone of relief that he has never kept any fowls in british guiana the arm of the law must have a sense of humor as well as of justice we often wondered what was going on behind the impassive face of little frederick did he live in constant terror or did he sometimes forget it all in the light-hearted pleasure of a child the man convicted of his father's murder was a peaman or medicine man who is held in great awe and reverence by his tribe so frederick's betrayal was doubly criminal in the eyes of the superstitious indians frederick had been brought down to morahana at christmas a little naked savage knowing not a word of english when at a loss for a word he always fell back upon the civil sir which mr king had taught him as white women were rare in morahana he had never learned the feminine of sir it was very amusing to see him serving at table going all around asking with great dignity what will you have sir regardless of the sex of the guest mr king had taught him to knock before entering a room he was childishly delighted with the new accomplishment and knocked upon entering and leaving the room we discovered that he had spent our sixpence on a belt which it seems was the desire of his heart already so sophisticated the dazed stoicism of the convicted indian was infinitely pathetic to us this terrible thing called the law is so incomprehensible to him he cannot understand it when a convicted comrade is taken down to georgetown to execution his friends and family realize only that he has gone away in a boat to some mysterious place from which he never returns as far as the moral effect of an execution is concerned there is none into the absolutely natural life of the indian with the simple and perfectly comprehended tribal laws has come so much that is confusing the new religion the relations of the laborer to the employer the wearing of clothes and the strange and powerful law the indian is a creature of the present moment instantly acting upon every desire working when he wishes to work and quietly dropping all work and departing when he so desires what can he the creature of nature know of all this puzzling civilization end of part one of chapter five part two of chapter five of our search for a wilderness by mary blair bb this librivox recording is in the public domain at noon on march sixth we embarked 
on the three days tent boat journey from Morahana to Hurry Mine. A 30-foot launch was the motor power, and alongside this the big tent boat was lashed, while several Indians hitched their wood skins behind, as boys hitch sleds to a passing sleigh. The baggage was stored fore and aft, and perched on a pile in the bow, we prepared for our first real day of observation along the rivers of the northwest. We retraced our way northward through Mora Passage, frightening as we went a flock of seven scarlet ibises. They kept close together and were evidently a single family, as two were in fully adult plumage, while the others were only three quarters grown and feathered wholly in brown and white. About three o'clock in the afternoon, we reached Waini River. But instead of turning toward the mouth and the open ocean, which we could see to the northwest, we steered eastward upstream. Although the outlet of several large rivers, the Waini in its lower reaches, is little more than a great salt water tidal inlet or cano. At Mora Passage, the Waini is about two miles wide, and through the choppy waters of the falling tide, we steered straight across to the north shore. Between the waters of this river and the ocean extends a long strip of marshy mangrove for at least 40 miles. Both the white and the red mangrove are found here, the latter predominating, and this is the breeding sanctuary of the hosts of birds which haunt the mudflats at low tide and fill the trees with a gorgeous display of color when the feeding grounds are covered at high tide. For the next three hours, we were enchanted by a constantly changing panorama of bird life, which in extent and variety can seldom be equaled elsewhere. While crossing the Waini, several swallow-tailed kites soared screaming overhead, occasionally swooping past for a nearer look at us. As we skirted the great mangrove forest, birds flew up ahead, few at first, but in constantly increasing numbers, until several hundred were in sight at once. They showed little fear and were apparently content to vibrate slowly along between launch and shore, accompanying us for 15 or 20 miles. By far the greater number were little blue herons, the pure white immature and the slaty blue adults being equally numerous. The latter were very inconspicuous among the foliage, while the former stood out like marble statues against green velvet. The coloring showed great asymmetrical variation, and one young bird with a single blue feather in the right wing was so tame that it kept almost abreast of our flotilla. The irregularity of molt resulted in most remarkable patterns, as in several birds, each of which had one white and one bluish wing. Half a dozen yellow-crowned night herons were seen, and twenty or thirty of the ill-named Louisianas. A few great-billed terns accompanied the herons, and later in the afternoon we began flushing snowy egrets in ever-increasing numbers. No American egrets were seen. All along the coast were small flocks of scarlet ibises, from three to thirty in number. And in an hour we had driven together no less than four hundred. The majority were fully plumaged birds clad in burning vermilion, but many were young in molt. We secured a young female in an interesting condition of molt. In the stomach were found the two chelae or claws of a small crustacean, each about one-third of an inch in length. The wings were wholly of the immature brown, except for one tiny under-edge covert in the right wing. The back, lower breast and under-tail coverts were fairly scarlet and active molt was in progress on the head and neck. 
we know that in captivity these birds fade out usually in a single molt from the most vivid scarlet to a pale salmon hue but as to the cause we are still in the dark the same is true of american flamingos and spoonbills during this trip we made certain of a fact which helps slightly to clear this problem this being that scarlet ibises fade as quickly and completely when in captivity in their native country as in the north this is confirmed by many birds kept formerly in georgetown and also on the island of marajo at the mouth of the amazon we have noticed an interesting fact in regard to this fading out of birds in captivity whether the salmon tints appear in the first molt or more gradually in several the lesser wing coverts and the upper and under tail coverts are the last to lose the scarlet color retaining it sometimes for five or six years these feathers in the nearly related but pale roseate spoonbill are those which are normally scarlet and this resemblance may be more than a coincidence about four o'clock we were surprised to see a large black and white bird with long gray beak and red legs fly up from a mud flat ahead and swing outward and around us the glasses showed a maguari stork in full breeding color even the red caruncles around the eye and the long filmy neck feathers being visible we had never expected to see the bird away from the pampas of the interior and the sight of the splendid stork was most exciting it is almost as large as a jabiru white with black wings scapulars and tail and is one of the most picturesque of the large waders we have had a pair of these birds alive for some time and have observed a curious thing about the tail the real tail feathers are forked swallow-like while the intervening space is filled up with the long stiff under tail coverts in flight the whole are spread making a party colored fan of some eighteen feathers instead of the usual six pairs these under tail coverts are a full inch longer than the regular tail feathers and seem to be usurping their function two old friends of northern waters appeared in small numbers ospreys circling about high in the air with now and then a meteor like dive while spotted sandpipers looped from one headland to another ahead of us at half past four in the afternoon we had our first sight of the great flocks of birds which seem characteristic of this season quite high in air clear of the tops of the tallest trees we saw a black cloud of birds approaching we soon made them out to be greater anise or as the natives called them big witch or jumby birds when first seen they were in a dense compact mass headed straight toward us their flight was uniform each bird giving three to six flaps and then sailing ahead for several seconds hundreds doing this at once made the sight a most striking one while it was enhanced by their long wedge-shaped tails high arched beaks bright yellow eyes and the iridescence of their dark plumage as the slanting rays of the sun struck them we counted up to a thousand in the van and then gave up there were at the very least four thousand birds in the flock the approach of the puffing launch and our great escort of ibises and herons disconcerted them and the entire company broke up most of them descending turning on their course and fleeing ahead of us for several miles their mode of flight changed completely the birds flying close to the water barely skimming its surface and swinging up every few yards to alight on a low branch a piece of wood thrown among a mass of them would cause great dismay and they dashed down into the nearest foliage as if a hawk had appeared 
Little by little they drifted past, flying rapidly near shore and continuing in the direction which they had originally chosen. A few of the birds were molting, but by far the greater number were in perfect plumage. The flock had the appearance of being on some sort of migration rather than assembling at a nightly roost. About Georgetown and the settlements and clearings in general, this greater ani is much rarer than the small smooth-billed species, twenty of the latter being seen to one of the former. These aberrant cuckoos are most interesting birds, and several females are said to combine, building a single hollow nest of sticks in which the eggs are hatched. Hardly had the last ani passed out of sight when a second cloud of birds appeared far ahead, and before we had approached near enough to identify them, a shrill chorus came to our ears. A horde of blue-headed parrots were on their way up the coast. They behaved in much the same way as the anis, but were more numerous. An estimate far below the truth gave 8,000. Closely massed, though most of them were, yet the eternal two and two formation of the tribe of parrots was never lost, and even when the vanguard, terrified by our puffing launch, wheeled and dashed back through the ranks behind, each parrot flew always close to its mate. Once later on, when only a few scores were left near us, we saw several perched in a bare tree close to a hawk, like a sparrow hawk in size, but neither species paid any attention to the other's presence. The parrots screamed unceasingly, and near the main body the noise was terrific, a shrill, deafening roar, as from a dozen factory whistles. Until long after dark, they flew back and forth around us, sometimes attempting to alight in a tree and falling from branch to branch, almost to the water, before securing a foot or beak hold. For several hours, perfect pandemonium reigned around us. Whether these two phenomena of flocking birds indicated merely a nightly roosting habit or an actual, more or less local migration, they were of the greatest interest and spectacular in the extreme. Our opinion inclines decidedly towards the latter theory, as they both differed greatly from the regular roosting flights which we observed elsewhere. Long after dark, about nine o'clock, in the faint light of the cloud-dimmed moon, we caught glimpses of occasional ghostly forms flitting silently past, and when we flashed our powerful electric light upon them, the feathered ghosts would emit frightened squawks, revealed as snowy egrets or young blue herons. Here and there, among the mangroves, large lightning bugs flashed. At last, we rolled up in our blankets and slept on the thwarts to dream of the unnumbered legions of anise and parrots far off behind us in the blackness of the mangrove jungle. In a soft, steady rain, we steamed all next morning up the Waini, seeing few signs of life except three toucans which flew across at Baramani police station. At noon we reached Farnham's at the junction of the Waini and Barama rivers. Mr. and Mrs. Farnham live in a small house perched on the very summit of a symmetrically rounded hill, the first elevation we had seen in this flat region. There is a tiny store at the foot of the hill and a sawmill and in the grass of the clearing, Bet Rouge lie in patient wait for the passerby. Mrs. Farnham told us that hummingbirds flew into the peaked roof of the house almost every day and died. The natives call by this name all the species of honey creepers, and a yellow-winged male was picked up from the floor during our visit. We found later that this was such a common occurrence that in almost all the houses there were instruments for getting rid of the bewildered, fluttering birds. The more cruel used only a stick with which the birds were struck down. 
but the more humanely inclined had nets on the end of long poles. As many as seven honey creepers are occasionally entrapped at one time. They do not seem to know how to fly toward light and liberty after getting up among the dark rafters. The fauna of this exceedingly marshy region was different from that higher up. Agoutis and pacas are abundant, but capybaras do not come this side of Baramani police station. Deer and peccaries are very rare. Jaguars are unknown, but ocelots are occasionally found, a young one having been killed under the house at Christmas. It lived in a burrow and took a chicken each night until it was killed. Many fish were seen playing about the tent boat as it was tied to the wharf, and among others were scores of small pipe fish. Mr. Crandall caught a small round sunfish-like form, brilliantly colored and with a most wicked-looking set of triangular teeth. As he was about to take the fish off the hook, it deliberately twisted itself in the direction of his hand and bit his finger, taking a piece out with one snip of its four razor-like incisors. This was our introduction to the famous perai, or carob fish, Cerasalmo scapularis, which seems to fear nothing man, crocodile, or fish, and a school of which can disable any creature in a very short time. At this point we left the Waini and turned off into the Barama. We had followed the Waini day and night for about 60 miles, until from a stream of two miles or more in width, it had narrowed to little more than 100 yards. We left Farnham's at three in the afternoon, and steamed slowly up the Barama for twelve hours, tying up to the bank from three to seven in the early morning. We slept but little for the strange wonderland which opened up before us. At nine o'clock the full moon rose, and the beauty of the wilderness became indescribable. In the north, along the rivers of the Canadian forest, the spruces and firs are clean-trunked, tapering to tall, isolated symmetrical summits. Here the very opposite conditions exist. Solid massive walls of black foliage with almost never a glimpse of trunk and bark. Most characteristic are the long slender bush ropes or lianas. In the forest they are thick, gnarled and knotted. There we get the vivid feeling of serpentine struggles in the terribly slow but nonetheless remorseless striving for light and air. But along the rivers the lianas are pendant threads or cables, straight as plummets and often a hundred feet in length. These give a decorative aspect to the scene unlike any other type of forest, temperate or northern. In the moonlight the appearance of the walls of foliage is like painted scenery. Their blackness and impenetrability give a feeling of flatness, and the summit outlines are crudely regular. The dominant sound at night along the Barama was a sweet tinkling as of tiny bells, all in unison and harmony, but with a range of at least four half tones. The tree toads clinging here and there to leaves and flowers throughout the jungle fill this whole region with the melody of their chimes, striking the minutes as if with a thousand tiny anvils, and only too often leading some enemy to their hiding places. We woke at early dusk, and climbing out upon the bow of the tent boat, watched the coming of the tropical day. The medley of fairy bells was still bravely ringing. But as the dawn approached, the little nocturnal musicians ceased tolling, and the chorus died out with a few faint final tinkles. Six o'clock, and the sunshine upon the treetops brought a burst of sound from the wood hewers, a succession of twelve to twenty loud, ringing tones in a rapidly descending scale, canyon wren-like and taken up continuously from far and near. The very tang and crispness of the early dawn seemed to inspire the quality of their notes. 
As soon as it was light, swallows were seen in numbers. Small, dark, steel blue in color, with a striking band of white across the breast. These beautiful banded swallows kept at first to two levels in the air, close to the water, fairly skimming its surface, and high up above the tallest trees, marking, I suppose, the early morning distribution of gnats and other insects. Most delicate and fairy-like they appeared when perched on some great orchid-hung dead branch protruding from the water. We can find no adjectives to express the beauty and calm of the cool early morning on these tropical rivers. Myriads, untold myriads, of leaves and branches surround us like the lofty walls of a canyon. We have used the words wall in this connection many times, and no other word seems to be so suitable. All sense of flatness is lost in the light of the dawn, and instead we see these living walls now as infinitely softened. But still, the eye cannot penetrate the intricate tangle. Not a breath of air stirs the smallest leaf. It is like the fairy river of an enchanted country, all nature quiet and resting, with only the brown current ever slipping silently past, here and there foam-flecked or bearing some tiny aquatic plant with its rosette of downy leaves. Then the lush tropical nature rushing ever to extremes comes a deluge of virile life upon the scene. A great fish leaps far upward, shattering the surface, pursued by a fierce brown-coated otter, almost as large as a man. A half-dozen green parrots throb, screaming past in pairs. Two big red-breasted kingfishers spring from their perch and come leaping toward us through the air suddenly wheeling up almost in a somersault and down like two meteors into the water. We leave our bushy moorings at last and keep on up the river with the tide, passing the English mission of Father Carey Elwis, which, like Farnham's, is built on a hill, isolated amid the great expanse of flat, marshy jungle. A dozen little naked Indian lads shriek in sheer excitement and rush down to the water's edge to watch us pass, peering fearfully out from behind trees like little gnomes. From here on, butterflies become very abundant. Many large yellows and oranges and morphos of two kinds, one altogether iridescent blue, the other blue and black. As the little vocal messages of the tree frogs are carried far and wide through the jungle at night, so, in the sunshine, the morphos, like heliographs of azure, flash silently from bend to bend of the river. Conspicuous among the great mora and purple heart trees were the white-barked silk cottons, large yellow tubular blossoms, and masses of purple pea blooms tint the trees here and there. The Indians along the river were catching two kinds of fish, one a silvery mullet about six inches long called bashu, and a catfish of the same size. The latter was most formidable in appearance, but actually harmless. Four slender barbells of medium size depended from the lower jaw, while two pigmented ones extended forward from the upper jaw and were so long that when pressed back they reached to the tail. Rain fell irregularly during the day, but so gently and so softly that we hardly knew when it began and when it ended. It never chilled, but rather refreshed. About noon a third migrational flocking of birds was noticed, seventy-two large South American black hawks, circling slowly around, setting their wings after a while, and sailing off to the west as one bird. The action and reaction among the vegetation was often as striking as among more active organisms. 
where parasitic aerial roots had descended 70 or 80 feet and touched the water near shore vines had somehow managed to reach out and throw a tendril about the roots take hold and climb circle upon circle to the top the palm trees alone of all the forest growth seemed universally free from parasitic plants and climbing vines above the mission coincident with the increase of butterflies and the appearance of occasional sand banks palm trees disappeared without apparent reason the river narrowed as we ascended until it was only fifty yards across and the bends increased in angle and number now and then we passed a cutoff where the stream had cut through one of its own bends and made a new bed for itself a small opening in the wall of verdure was hailed as hurry creek and dropping behind the launch we were towed a mile or more up its tortuous length now and then running aground or rather a tree as it was only thirty feet wide and as sinuous as a serpent we tied fast to a big overhanging tree which marked the end of our journey by water and all excitement leaped ashore end of chapter five part one of chapter six of our search for a wilderness by mary blair bb this librivox recording is in the public domain a gold mine in the wilderness we loaded our tin canisters clothing bags guns and cameras on a cart which was waiting and set out along the bush trail three and a half miles to the gold mine the trail led through a great swampy forest with a clear brook occasionally crossing it and for the sake of the wagon which had to transport all the supplies it was corduroyed in the worst places with small saplings and quartered trunks we had all donned cheap tennis shoes which proved on this and all later occasions to be perfect footwear for the tropics the rubber soles allowed one to obtain sure footing in slippery places and a wetting matters nothing if one walks far enough the shoes dry on one's feet or at camp a new pair may be slipped on in a moment and next day the old ones are none the worse for the soaking here snake proof and waterproof shoes are as useless as they are uncomfortable it was amusing to see how quickly the regard for mud and water left even those of our party who were taking their first dip into the real bush for the first few yards all picked their way carefully there was even a pair of storm rubbers leaving its checkered print on the forest mold then someone stepped on the loose end of a corduroy sapling which rose in air and fell with a sharp spat everyone dodged the shower of mud and straight away went over ankles in water the cool fluid trickled between our toes and we all laughed with relief the rubbers found an early grave in the mud hole and we all strode happily along wishing we had a hundred eyes to see all that was going on around and above us a perfect medley of calls and cries came from the treetops high overhead as we tramped along in places the trees were magnificent looking like a maze of columns in some great cathedral roofed over with a lofty dome of foliage on this first walk the final impression was of a host of strange sights and sounds a few of which we were able to disentangle on succeeding days we had poured over waterton schaumburg and bates but we realized anew the utter futility of trying to reconstruct with pen and ink the grandeur and beauty and forever and always the mystery of a tropical forest then from the heart of the wilderness we came suddenly upon man's handiwork the tiny twenty-acre clearing of the gold mine 
On the outskirts of the forest were the frail, frond-roofed shelters which marked the homes of the Indians and the rough mud and thatch huts of the black laborers. A dam was thrown across the narrow valley and on the rim of the jungle lake thus made was the powerful electric engine. The great thing of vibrating wheels and pistons seemed strangely out of place in the wilderness. As we watched, it seemed to take on a semblance of dull life. Stolid-faced, naked Indians fed it vast quantities of cordwood, and in return it sucked up a great pipeful of water from the lake. The pipe lay quietly on trestles, winding up and around a low hill out of sight, giving no hint of the terrific rush of water within. Following the pipeline, we turn a sudden corner on the hilltop, and the heart of the clearing lies at our feet. At the end of the pipe, far below, a man stands, barely able to guide and shift the mighty spout of water which gushes forth. Half the hill has been torn away by the irresistible stream, which shoots upward in a majestic column and dashes with a roar over the cliff of clay and rubble. The ever-widening gorge which the water has eaten into the hill glows in the sunlight with bright-colored strata. On each side the red clay is dominant, while between runs the strip of pale gray which holds the precious nuggets. It is an ochreous clay carrying free gold. The rock is in place and perfectly decomposed to a depth of 75 or 100 feet. This decomposition is the result of the constant infiltration of warm rains carrying carbonic acid and humus acids from the rapidly decaying tropical vegetation. Through the clay are scattered nodules of impure limonite. In a tumbling, falling mass, the muddy water washes backward upon its path, confined in a trough under the pipe, and as it goes it gives up its yellow burden. As the grains and nuggets drop to the bottom, they touch the mercury, and, behold, to the eye they are no longer gold, but silver. As we had been impressed by the grandeur of the forest, so we now begin to see the romance of the wonderful gold deep hidden beneath the centuries of jungle growth. Gold, which we had known only in form of coin or ring, now assumed a new beauty and meaning. Here amid the great trees, the beautiful birds and insects, the Indians as yet unspoiled by civilization, one could thoroughly enjoy such, quotes, money-making. One hears of gold mines all one's life, but until one actually sees the metal taken from its resting place, where it has laid since the earth was young, the word means but little. Beyond the golden gorge with the roaring little giant, ever filling it with spray, was a second hill topped with the bungalow which we were to call home. Beyond this, the jungle began again. After a delicious shower bath, we slung our hammocks on the veranda and sat on the hillside in the moonlight for an hour or more, watching the night shift at work, one or two men guiding the stream beneath flickering arc lights, others puddling the downrushing torrent. Just beneath us in the dark shadow of a bush lay the coolie night watchman, with the inscrutable face of his race keeping watch over the long snaky flume at the bottom of which the quicksilver was ever engulfing the precious metal. Later, we slept the dreamless hammock sleep of the tropics, lulled by the dull droning roar of the water dashing against the clay, a sound which echoed through the jungle and gained in volume until we drowsily knew we were listening to the howling of the red baboons. Even this invasion of man merged harmoniously with the sounds of the wilderness. Life about the bungalow. We remained at Hoori just seven days, only long enough to begin to look beneath the surface and realize what a veritable wonderland it was for scientist or nature lover. 
On the last day of our stay, we wrote in our journal, Hoori is a perfect health resort, temperature good, no mosquitoes, food excellent, splendid place for laboratory work, interesting insect life super abundant, birds and lizards abundant, snakes rare, perai, electric eels and manatees in the creek, peccary, deer, red howlers, armadillos, sloths and anteaters within short distance of bungalow. What more could be asked? The bungalow was a well-built house with wide veranda, perched on the cleared summit of a low hill sloping evenly in all directions. The thick bush and scrubby undergrowth beginning about 100 feet down the hillside. We shall not attempt to describe or even mention the many varieties of creatures which haunted the clearing, but leaving these for our scientific reports, we shall speak only of those which are especially interesting. When one enters a vast forested wilderness such as this and makes a good-sized clearing, the inmates of the forest are bound to be affected. The most timid ones flee at the first stroke of the axe. Others, swayed by curiosity, return again and again to watch the interlopers. A third class, learning somehow of the new settlement, come post-haste and make themselves at home. These are chiefly birds which, seldom or never found living in the heart of the jungle, are as keen as vultures to spy out a new clearing. They must follow the canoes and trail, else it is impossible to imagine how they learn of new outposts, whether a simple Indian hammock shelter and cassava field, or a great commercial undertaking such as this gold mine. To begin with the birds, the Hoori clearing possessed two pairs of blue, three pairs of palm, and five pairs of silver beak tanagers besides six blue-backed seed eaters. None of these are forest birds and all nest in brushy places. The blue tanagers are clad in delicate varying shades of pale blue, the palm tanagers in dull olive green, but both make up in noisy sibilant cries what they lack in color. The silver beaks are beautiful, shading from rich wine color to black, and with conspicuous silvery blue beaks. The little seed eaters were the most familiar birds about the bungalow, coming to the steps to feed on fallen seeds. One of the first things which caught our eye were several brilliantly iridescent green birds, insect catching, among the brush near the house. These were paradise jacamars, and they had their homes in the clay banks of the rivulets, deep buried in the narrow valleys which abounded in the forest. Each bird had two or more favorite twigs. When bug hunting flagged at one post, they flew with a long swoop to the second point of vantage. Our assistant, Crandall, observing this, laid a limed twig across the lookout perch and in a short time had caught two male birds. Their mates called loudly for a time, then disappeared. Before night, both had returned with new mates, which we left in peace. They were tame and allowed us to approach within eight or ten feet before flying to their alternate perches. Their feet are small and weak, and they have a hunched up look as they perch in weight turning the head rapidly in every direction and now and then swooping like a flash after some tiny insect, engulfing it with a loud snap of the mandibles. Their call note is a sharp repeated pip, 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 pip. These birds welcome the clearing as it means an increased supply of insect food. They learn the value even of the opening made by the fall of a single tree deep in the jungle. And here and elsewhere, we notice that a single pair of jacamars would keep busy day after day in the patch of sunlight let in by the death of some forest giant. Jacamars form a rather compact 
group of some twenty species in habit like flycatchers in appearance and nest like kingfishers but in structure more closely related to toucans and woodpeckers even in the short time which we spent at hoorie we learned to expect a regular daily movement on the part of many of the birds early each morning a flock of about a dozen splendid jays worked slowly around the edge of the clearing at last disappearing behind the bungalow into the woods in the north this would not be an unusual sight but it must be remembered that members of the jay family like the wood warblers are rarely seen in the tropics crows and ravens are entirely absent from south america and but two species of jays find their way into british guiana our hurry birds were lavender jays and although so far from the home of their family they were no whit the less jay-like they constantly hailed each other with a varied vocabulary of harsh cries and calls and now and then held a morsel of food between the toes and pounded it vigorously. They flapped but seldom, passing with short sailing flights from branch to branch, not far from the ground. At night they returned rather more rapidly, less absorbed in feeding, probably to some roosting place of which they alone knew. With them, night and morning, were a few red-backed bunyas or caciques, early nesters from the colony at the dam, of which more anon. The two species seemed to associate closely, although it was evident that it was the bunyas which had taken up with the sturdy pioneers from the north. A short distance away from the bungalow, a huge mora stood in the forest looking down on all the trees around. The lightning bolt which had torn off its bark and killed it had also consumed its dense clothing of parasitic vines and bush ropes. So now it stood with naked, clean wood high above the sea of foliage, and within a day after our arrival we had christened it the Toucan Mora. In the evening, about on the stroke of seven, the first comers would arrive a trio of black-banded aracaris, which alight and preen their feathers. These may remain quiet for about twenty minutes, but more often take to flight at the approach of a screaming flock of eight or ten mealy Amazon parrots, which scatter over the branches. But the other species of toucans are now awake, and soon the parrots are in turn driven off and four or five big-billed fellows usurp the dead mora and sun themselves or call loudly to the vultures swinging high overhead. There are two species of these larger toucans, the red-billed and the sulphur and white-breasted, and they seem to live together amicably, but war with the smaller aracaris. The notes of the red-billed toucans are like the yapping of a puppy uttered in pairs and differing slightly thus yap yip yap yip the great mandibles are opened and thrown upward at each utterance the brilliant white-breasted birds call loudly kyok kyok in a high shrill tone very unlike that of their fellows morning and evening the toucans and parrots pass always alighting on the dead mora while during the day we detect them deep in the jungle, feeding in the tops of the trees and sending down to us their calls, yap, kyok, or squawk, as the case may be. A fourth species, the red-breasted toucan, was occasionally seen high in the treetops. These birds had two distinct utterances, one a frog-like croak and the other a double-toned shrill cry the two tones being B and B-sharp above middle C. Early in the evenings, about six o'clock, all the banded swallows of the surrounding region passed overhead in a dense flock, two or three hundred in all, soaring with a steady half-sailing flight 
very different from the dashing swoops which carry them over the lake when feeding during the day. Now they are headed northward to some safe roosting place and with no thought of passing gnats. The myriads of graceful, glossy blue forms, each crossed on the breast with a band of white, make a most beautiful sight. In the morning their return flight was by twos and threes, with rapid darts here and there. Hunger now permitted no dressing of ranks or close formation. During the day none were to be seen about the bungalow, but only on the lake or along the creek bed. The unfortunate gnats which hummed in the bungalow clearing were attended to by the little feather-toed palm swifts, which were most abundant. Among the hosts of smaller birds which haunted the treetops at the edge of the clearing, the black-faced green grosbeaks were especially noticeable. In color they reminded one of immature male orchid orioles, being yellowish-green with black throat and face. They fed morning and evening on the reddish berries of a great vine which ripened its fruit in the treetops, and here their song was repeated over and over, a rattling buzz like the rapid stroke of a stick along the palings of a fence, followed by three liquid whip-like notes, thus high C, A, B. The buzz part of the song also did duty as the call note. Once or twice each day we would be treated to a glimpse of the wonderful Pompadour Catingas. A flock of four male birds would flash overhead and swing up to some lofty perch, wary, silent, but of exquisite color. The whole body was of a brilliant reddish purple, rich wine color, with wings of purest white. Silhouetted against the blue sky as they were perched close together, they might have been starlings or blackbirds as far as color went. But when they all shot off into the air and showed up against the green leaves, they fairly blazed. Their yellow eyes, the scintillating purple plumage, and the dazzling white wings. The last flash of the wings before they were folded out of sight was a most efficient protection as it seemed to hold the vision so that several moments elapsed before the perching bird itself could be located. The somber, ashy females were not observed. Certainly they never joined in the flights with the quartet of males. In the latter sex, a half dozen or more of the greater wing coverts are stiffened and the webs curved around almost into little tubes. We know practically nothing of the wild habits of the Pompadour Catinga, but a most remarkable thing about the color is that, by the application of a little heat, it turns from deep reddish purple to pale yellow. It is rather interesting to compare this with the changing of the purple finch from rose red to yellowish in captivity. The chatterers, or cotingas, form one of the most interesting tropical families of birds, and we lost no opportunity of studying closely all which we observed. At Huri, besides the pompadour cotingas, we saw the black-tailed tatyra, in Mexico, we had seen a closely related species, and here again were the strange frog birds with a little more black on the cap and tail. We first observed a pair near the colony of red-backed bunyas in the creek bed, but as we were leaving the bungalow for the last time, our farewell was made all the harder by discovering that the tatyras had begun to nest in a small dead stub standing alone in the center of the vegetable garden and not twenty yards from the bungalow. The birds were having a hard time of it, carrying stiff four-inch twigs into a three-inch hole, but they were succeeding, showing that they knew better than to hold the twig by the center. The whole head to below the eyes and including the upper nape was black while the bare skin of the face and the basal two-thirds of the beak were bright red. 
the male was uniformly pale bluish white while his mate was distinguished by many rather faint streaks of black on the breast sides and under parts both birds alternated in carrying the nesting material and in arranging it remaining silent as long as we watched them the nesting stub was about six inches in diameter and the hole thirty feet above the ground these birds lack the bright hues of most of their relatives but have the family trait of possessing some queer trick of plumage while the first flight feather of the wing is perfectly normal measuring about three and a half inches in length the second is a mere parody of a feather tapering to a point and reaching a length of less than two inches only the true lover of birds will realize what an effort it took to tear ourselves away from this pair of birds whose eggs and young appear to be as yet undescribed two morile guans and a trumpeter were interesting inmates of the hen yard and made no effort to escape although they were full winged and had the run of the clearing the trumpeter went to roost each night at five thirty as punctually as if he had a watch under his wing he slept standing on one leg resting on the first joints of his front toes his head drawn back under his wing often on our walks we would come across an indian hut so hidden away in the depths of the dense forest that its discovery was merely a matter of chance most of these huts consisted simply of four poles covered by the rudest sort of a palm thatched roof the house furnishing was as primitive as the house itself a hammock for each member of the family varying in size in proportion to that of their owners like the chairs of the historic nursery characters the three bears one or two calabashes or gourds several hand-woven baskets of cassava bread some strips of dried fish and a smoky fire completed the picture the entire domestic life of these indian establishments went on perfectly openly and quite unaffected by our curious scrutiny we rarely saw the indian men at home they were off hunting or fishing or perhaps employed by the mine as woodcutters the women were always busy cooking planting cassava spinning cotton weaving hammocks and baskets and bead aprons necklaces and bracelets we could never resist the temptation to stop and make friends with them the gift of a cigarette won their hearts and we invariably found them very gentle and kindly their costumes were extraordinary those who had been presented with the garments of civilization proudly wore them though they were nothing more than short loose slips but the majority wore their native dress consisting chiefly of beads certainly far more healthful and suitable for them than the unaccustomed clothing given them by the missionaries the children were lovable little pieces of bronze very smooth and glossy they would often come softly up and slip their small hands in ours looking up at us with shy wonder in one of the huts we watched with amusement the weest of indian girls trying to drive away a huge rooster who was pervading the hut the child could not have been more than two years old but she was already thoroughly feminine waving her small arms valiantly at the intruder and then running away terrified to bury her head in her mother's hammock until she could summon courage for another attack upon the enemy as time went on and news of our arrival spread indians from huts far distant in the forest made expeditions to come and look at us as curious about us as was the small boy living up on the essequibo river who saved up his bits and took a long journey down the river to see a horse he had heard there were such creatures but he wished to investigate for himself so tours were made to see us and we were inspected by wondering eyes to whom white women 
were as strange as were horses to the little bush lad. One day at the bungalow we found a group of Indian children gathered about the door of the modern bathroom which Mr. Wilshire had fitted up. It was all a great puzzle to the little dwellers in the forest. To amuse them we took them in and turned on and off the shower bath trying to explain what it was but all to no purpose. To them a bath meant knee wash skin in river while the shower bath was merely an interesting scientific phenomenon. The mysterious white beings were making rain at their own will. We were disappointed at not getting more photographs of the Indians. Their prejudice against being photographed is a deep-rooted superstition. They feel that it gives you a superhuman power over them. Indians often ran like deer through the woods when we pointed the camera at them, and it was only by passing around candy to those who came to the bungalow and so diverting their attention from the dreaded camera that we secured any pictures at all. We encountered but one poisonous serpent, and that one by proxy, a big bushmaster, or Kuanakochi, all but dead, was brought to the house one day by an Indian who had speared it. It had been found coiled up on the forest leaves, and was so like them in color that the Indian had nearly trod upon it. Although we searched thoroughly, we could never find a second specimen. End of part one of chapter six. Part two of chapter six of Our Search for a Wilderness by Mary Blair Beebe. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Day in the Jungle Near Hurry. The region about Hoori consists chiefly of small but steep hills, some isolated with a few hundred yards of flat land about them, others close together and separated by deep, narrow valleys with running water at the bottom. All drain into Hoori Creek, which from the mine clearing runs in a fairly straight direction through flat, marshy land to the Barama River up which we had come. The whole country is, of course, completely covered with a thick forest of good-sized trees, which are heavily draped with vines and parasitic plants, although these are not dense enough to shut out the sunlight. Thus, in many places, a heavy undergrowth is found, making it difficult to get about, while the steep ascents and equally precipitous descents into the numerous intersecting valleys make extended exploration an arduous task, especially in the directions away from Hoori Creek. But in this land of superabundant life, one needs but a short walk to fill one's notebook with interesting facts. Let us spend a day in the jungle. In light marching order, with glasses and notebooks only, we started out in the direction of the great pit of golden gravel and finding Nasua, the coolie, we persuaded him to pan a few shovelfuls of earth from the surface of the ground within reach of the spray of the water spouting up towards us. It was fascinating to watch his slender, deft fingers and his skillful manipulation of the gold pan. Filling it to overflowing with gray or red clay, he half sank it beneath the surface of a little pool and began rocking and turning it. Soon the large pebbles were all eliminated and only a muddy sediment left. This was washed and revolved until there seemed nothing but clear water, when as the last dirt was flowing over the rim, there came the flash of the golden grains. Pressing his fingers on these, the pan was reversed for a moment and then, dipping his fingertips in the clear water of our glass vial, the yellow grains sank swiftly to the bottom. Sometimes only a half penny's worth would reward us, while again as much as a shilling's value would be shown. Passing over the ridge, we saw before us a deep and very narrow valley with precipitous sides, down which we slid and crawled. 
hanging on to vines and saplings to break our descent. At the bottom we found an interesting advance in the evolution of gold mining over the simplest form of gold panning. Two blacks were operating a long tom, which in mining vernacular is the name for a six by two heavy coarse metal sieve set obliquely in the channel of a small brook. The gold bearing gravel and clay is shoveled into it and puddled with a hoe and the gold settles to the bottom to be later panned. Thus division of labor enters in, one black shoveling while his partner puddles. We asked them how much they were getting out, and as usual they said almost nothing, or a few shillings worth at the most. This was to avoid any danger of their tiny holdings being considered too valuable and taken away from them. Mr. Wilshire took a pan here on another day and unearthed a tiny nugget worth perhaps two shillings, much to the blacks' discomfiture, who hastened to explain that such an opulent find was indeed rare. The poor fellows at best make little enough, and it was pitiful to see the tiny packets of gold dust which they brought to the company's store at the end of the week to exchange for food or credit checks. The universal Guianan name for this type of independent miner is pork knocker, the explanation being that by knocking the rocks to pieces they find just enough gold to procure the pork upon which they live. They are allowed to work on side streams near the large mining operations, their total taking of gold being relatively insignificant while they sometimes locate valuable deposits in the course of their wanderings. They are a jolly, happy-go-lucky type, apparently careless of their luck and invariably optimistic of the future. A naturalist would find it difficult to keep his attention fixed on pan or long tom in this narrow glade, for great iridescent blue morpho butterflies are floating about everywhere among the lights and shadows. From some tall trees a continual shower of whirling objects are falling, some white, others purple. Catching one we find it to be a narrow petaled, five-parted star-like blossom, Petroia arborea, weighted by a slender stem. When thrown up into the air they revolve like horizontal pinwheels, falling slowly and forming a most remarkable rain of color. Forcing our way up the opposite slope and on through the underbrush, we come out on a corduroy road half a mile from the mine. As a corduroy sapling turns and splashes the water underfoot, a cloud of orange and white butterflies arises and scatters through the woods. Suddenly, through the warm, damp stillness, there rings out a piercing, three-syllabled cry, which was to become for us the vocal spirit of the Guiana wilderness. Day after day we heard it, wherever the unbroken primeval forest reigned, but never near the haunts of man. This, with the roar of the red baboon and the celestial theme of the quadrille bird, forms the trilogy most cherished in our memory of all the Guiana sounds. We are listening to the call of the gold or green heart bird, another member of the Cotingas or chatterers, which is as remarkable for its voice as it is lacking in brilliant colors. Loud as the call is, it is very ventriloquial and difficult to locate. When directly beneath the sound, it seems to come from the tops of the highest trees, a hundred feet up, whereas in all probability the bird is not more than twenty-five feet above our heads. It sits motionless, but the violence of its utterance makes the whole branch vibrate. We soon learn that to search and find the bird directly is impossible but by letting the eyes take in as large a field as possible, the vibration from the vocal effort is easily discernible.
the male goldbird is uniformly ashy or slate colored, slightly darker above, very solitaire like both in color and size. The female is distinguished by a shade of rufous on the wing coverts and the tips of the flight feathers. With such coloring, it is not strange that the bird becomes invisible amid the dark shadows of the lower branches. The natives know this bird as the PPO from its call and gold bird from the fact that all pork knockers believe it is never found far from deposits of gold, while the theory that it usually utters its call from a green heart tree accounts for its third name. Its note is typical of our American tropics, where highly developed song is rare, but single, loud, metallic, or liquid syllables are the rule. The bird has two introductory phrases, which heretofore seem to have escaped the notice of observers. Indeed, until one noticed the invariable sequence of the two sets of notes, it would never be suspected that they proceeded from the same bird. The introductory phrases are low and muffled, and yet have considerable carrying power. They possess the indescribable vibrating chord-like quality of the Viri's song, which defies all description. Almost instantly follow the three notes of the call or song. They are of tremendous strength and exceedingly liquid and piercing. The nearest imitation is to whistle the syllables whee, whee, oh, as loudly as possible. We never tire of listening. The bird overhead calls so loudly that our ears tingle. Another answers, then a third and a fourth far away in the dim recesses of the forest. Many miles inland, near the wonderful plateau of Roraima, lives another species of gold bird, similar to ours except for a bright rosy pink collar around the neck. We saw nothing of this beautiful Cotinga, but one of the gold birds which we secured has a distinct but irregular collar of rufous, hinting of a not distant relationship. A short distance along the corduroy road we came upon a half dozen naked Indians cutting away underbrush preparatory to making a new road bed. It was a delight to watch their sinewy bodies bend and strain, moving here and there through the thorns and sharp twigs with never a scratch. They came across many curious creatures among the rotting trunks and leaf mold, and when they learned we were interested, they would tie their captives with liana threads or imprison them in clever leaf boxes and save them for us. The most weird looking of these were gigantic whip scorpions or pedipalp spiders, Admetus pumilio, like Brobdignanian daddy long legs, which crawled painfully about on their slender legs and never showed an inclination to bite. They were of great size stretching some eight and a half inches across. The three hinder pairs of legs were normal and used for walking, while the fourth pair was attenuated and functioned as feelers, the whips measuring full ten inches in length. The jaws were most terrible organs, three inches long, dovetailed with wicked spines, while the tips ended in villainous fangs. A few hundred yards further, we came to a small clearing where the squaws were cooking dinner. The houses of these happy people are of the simplest construction. Four poles support a roof covered with loose palm thatch, open on all sides. The hammocks are hung beneath this, and an open fire is built in the center. The Guiana Indians are unequaled exponents of the simple life. In the deep jungle, we are constantly impressed with the straightness of all the trunks. The lianas and bush ropes may be scalloped or spiral, or with a multitude of little steps like the monkey ladder, and still easily reach the life-giving light high overhead. But the trees can afford no bends or curves or gnarly trunks. They rise like temple columns 
cell must be on cell each to aid in the life race upward there are seldom high winds here in the great calm hothouse everywhere between the great trunks whitish in the crab wood smoothed and noted in the congo pump and deeply fluted in the paddle woods beneath all these mast like forms are draped the slender rat line threads and cables of the aerial rigging we seat ourselves on a prostrate trunk free of scorpions at one side of the corduroy road and watch and listen beside us on a tiny dull red mora sprout eating voraciously is a caterpillar branched and rebranched with a maze of nettle hairs while near it is another a fuzzy fellow who gives us one of the most unexpected surprises of the whole trip as we first see him he is palest lavender in color covered with long straight hairs longer than those of our familiar black and brown woolly bear caterpillar of the north five minutes later we look again and see a third caterpillar or no it is the second one but remarkably changed a creature flat and immovable covered with a score of recurved pink tufts of curled hair the caterpillar chameleon has flattened his long pelage of lavender into a thin line of prostrate down bringing into view the recurved pink tufts and thus has become an entirely different object both as to shape color and pattern there must be a special set of muscles controlling these hairs even if a bird had appetite to digest such an unsavory here sweet object it would well be dismayed at the transformation everywhere we observe examples of protective form or coloration on the underside of a branch in front of us are what appear to be many tufts of blackish moss until we brush against some of it and a few of the tufts resolve into dense bunches of caterpillars others which we touch on purpose to see if they be caterpillars or not deceive us doubly by retaining their vegetable character on the ground at our feet are scattered seed sheaths which have fallen from the branches high overhead there are myriads of them suddenly one takes legs to itself and moves and only after examining it closely do we know it for a beautiful brown elater a beetle semiotus ligneus embossed with pale ivory a perfect living counterpart of the arboreal seed sheaths strewn all about words completely fail to give an idea of the wonder and delight of having one's senses set at naught by these devices of nature after being taken in by several we imagine we see them everywhere in innocent leaves or a bit of lichens many travelers wallace and bates among them speak often of the scarcity of flowers in the tropics but here at hoorie and on our later expeditions we were hardly ever out of sight of blossoms a few feet behind us as we sit on the log are two solomon seal like plants castus species eighteen inches high with the stem and leaves growing in a wide ascending spiral making one revolution throughout its course a sheaf of flower heads appears at the top of the plant with a single white open flower giving forth the sweetest perfume bell-shaped it is formed by a single sweeping petal the edges opposed along the summit and the mouth rimmed with the finest hair-like fringe the slit in the upper part is protected by a second narrow petal recurved at the tip showing the heart within such a blossom would be a splendid addition to our conservatories and a vast harvest awaits the grower of tropical plants other than orchids now the morning half gone rain falls a gentle mist light as dew 
refreshing and pleasant through the drops to the blossom comes a great morpho butterfly of blue tinsel soon followed by a big yellow papilio a tiny white butterfly bordered with black dashes up and attacks the papilio with fury driving it away as a kingbird vanishes a hawk just as we are about to arise a gold bird calls in the distance and then without warning a beautiful song rings out close at hand six or eight clear descending notes like the early morning chant of the wood hewer but even more liquid running together at the last into a maze of warbling which continues for eight or ten seconds then ceases and the liquid notes form an exquisite finale of a trio of sweet phrases the singer is invisible we never learn what it is but it deserves a place near the head of the songsters even of temperate climes as we walk along toucans and other birds fly high overhead with whirring beats of their drenched wings wood hewers loop from trunk to trunk and peer at us as we pass while ant birds fly here and there in all our tramps through thick jungles these two latter families are in the majority the former hitching up the trunks like brown woodpeckers of various sizes the latter simulating wrens warblers and sparrows in action and often in voice one a white-shouldered pygmy ant bird now flits ahead of us tiny as a wren slate colored with white dots on the lesser coverts of the wings and a dotted bar across the wings the flanks and under wings are white and although ordinarily concealed yet the little fellow flirts his wings every second thus flashing out the color and making himself most conspicuous his call note is low and inarticulate but he occasionally lisps a pleasing little song choo choo chooey we enter a deep narrow gully our feet sinking deep in moss and mold trip over a hidden root and looking back see a magnificent rhinoceros beetle which we have disturbed feebly kicking his six legs in the air in these deep valleys the air is saturated with reeking odors woody spicy and moldy and altogether delightful moss grows on the stems of the plants like wide radiating fans of delicate green lace in these places we find the commonest palms which grow near hoori stemless with fronds springing fern-like from the ground leaving the vicinity of the trail we start out through the heart of the jungle keeping by compass in a general northwest direction here the trees increase in size and grow almost thirty feet apart the intervening space being filled with lesser growth parasitic lianas and huge ferns eight to twelve feet in height tree ferns in size but not in mode of growth the rain now increases and we plod happily along drenched to the skin giving ourselves up to the delight of a walk in a tropical downpour serenely oblivious of pools and dripping branches we trudge along until finally a tacuba over a creek breaks with our weight and we splash in up to our waists indeed we had long ago become accustomed to such drenchings for during our stay at hoori the days were alternate sunshine and shower in starting out for a long tramp we never thought of taking any protection against the rain the only thing to be shielded was the precious camera what matters a wetting when one is perfectly dressed for whatever may happen a word must be said here from the woman's point of view about the costume which was adopted as being absolutely suited to the bush life in the first place it was light so light that one never felt the burden of a single superfluous ounce of weight and when thus freed from the drag of heavy clothing one would come in unfatigued from tramps which would have been impossible for a woman in orthodox dress 
no matter how short the skirt. But in the light khaki knickerbockers, loose negligee shirts of scotch flannel or fibrous cellular cloth, stockings and tennis shoes and a waterproof felt hat one was ready for anything if soaked by a sudden downpour a few minutes walk in the sun would dry one if walking difficult tacubas or clambering over huge fallen trees of which there were any number throughout the forest or climbing precipitous and slippery hills one was never hampered by unsuitable dress of course there are many wildernesses where it is unnecessary for a woman to wear knickerbockers and there is no reason why she should defy public prejudice by doing so but the woman who attempts to tramp through the south american jungle will find that safety and comfort make them absolutely essential one realized as never before with what handicaps woman has tried to follow the footsteps of man with the result that physical exhaustion has robbed her of all the joys of life in the open returning to our day in the jungle we tramped silently over the sodden ground now and then sending some panic-stricken macaw or parrot screeching from its roost after an hour the rain ceased and the sun shone brightly but where we were many yards beneath the vast mat of treetop foliage only single spots and splashes of light broke the solid shadows for a long distance we trod silently on deep mold and moss and not a sound of beast or bird broke the stillness as we were crossing a swirling creek on the trunk of a mighty fallen tree something fluttered ahead we could not see what it was Closer we came, and still the object remained indistinct. We seemed to see a butterfly, and yet it appeared impossible. At last we marked it down on a fern frond and crept up until our eyes were within two feet. Nothing was visible but the graceful lacery of the frond until a slanting beam of sunlight struck it, and there, close before us, was the ghost of a butterfly it spread fully three inches but was wholly transparent save for three tiny spots of azure near the edge of the hind wings hytera piera as we looked it drifted to a double-headed flower of scarlet and when it alighted the scarlet of the flower and the green of the leaf were as distinct as if seen through thin mica while the faint gray haze of the insect's wings were marked only by the indistinct venation. The appearance of this ghostly butterfly amid the silence and awe-inspiring stillness of the reeking jungle was most impressive. Then came an interruption, so sudden and unrelenting that it seemed to reach to the very heart of nature. A red baboon raised his voice less than fifty yards away and even the leaves seemed to tremble with the violence of the outburst of sound a long deep rasping vibrating roar followed by a guttural inhalation hardly less powerful after a dozen connected roars and inbreathings the sound descended to a slow crescendo almost died away and then broke out with renewed force we crept swiftly toward the sound, treading as softly as possible, and soon in a high bullet wood we saw three of the big red monkeys. The male passed on out of sight, and the second a medium-sized animal followed. The third was a mother with her baby clinging tightly to her back. She climbed slowly, showing her rich, light, golden red fur and beard while the arms and legs of her dark furred baby were revealed as lines of darker color around her body twenty minutes later we stalked another roaring male and found four in this troop we saw two of the females giving voice with the leader shrill falsettos 
which became audible only during the less deafening inspiration. We tried to think of a simile for the voice of this monkey, and could only recur to that which always came to mind, the roar of wind ushering in a cyclone or terrific gale. And yet there was ever present to the ear the feeling of something living, as if mingled with the elemental roar was the howl of a male jaguar. No sound ever affected us quite as this, seeming always to prestige some unnamed danger. While it lasted, the sense of peace which had been inspired by the calmness and silence of the jungle gave place to a hidden portent of evil. Yet we loved it, and the savage delight which we took in this and other wilderness sounds made our pulses leap. End of part two of chapter six. Part three of chapter six of Our Search for a Wilderness by Mary Blair Beebe. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Drowned Forest At the engine house, a ten-foot dam had been thrown across the Hoori Creek bed, and the apparently slight cause had brought about wide-reaching effects. This slight raising of the water throwing back the creek in many directions. One could hardly call it a lake, as there was no wide body of water, and yet it had the shoreline of more than ten miles, reaching out a long, finger-like extension up every side valley. The original creek was only a few feet wide, and the jungle grew down to the very bank. So now the trees were deep under water, all which were below the new level were dead, standing like an array of tall, bare ghosts compared to the luxuriant forest all about. When on a rise of ground, one could trace the course of the lake by the lines of naked branches, and when steering one's canoe between the leafless trunks, the effect was most startling. The sunlight came through in a way different from any tropical forest. Every leaf had fallen, leaving the trees as bare as in a northern winter, and stripping the vines and bush ropes. But the condition of the parasites and air plants was most interesting. All which were truly parasitic, living on the life sap of their hosts, were of course also dead. But the orchids and other air plants were flourishing, showing as large tufts or sprays of light green here and there. In places the branches had a beaded effect, so numerous and yet so isolated were the epiphytes. We drifted silently along by the impetus of a touch of the paddle on a passing trunk. Orchids were in blossom, and ferns, mosses, and lichens ran riot in orange, brown, and ivory patches on the tree trunks. Miracots and the fierce perai were abundant here, and now and then some fish broke water, throwing rings of light into the shadowy places. Spiders, ants, and a host of other wingless insects were crawling on many of the trunks, made captive by the flood. Their inability to walk on the water was evident when we knocked some of them off so they must have lived on their island trees for the last year, the time of existence of the dam. The spiders were legion in species, hardly two alike, from minute ones shaped like nothing else under heaven, with relatively enormous hooks and thorns on their brightly colored abdomens, to giant tarantulas who stood up and threatened us before beating a dignified retreat. The increase of water had attracted many water-loving birds, and great rufous kingfishers swung past us, strong-winged, beautiful birds, carrying on their business of life in a virile, unhesitating way. Between the trunks flashed the white-banded swallows, now hovering before a trunk and snatching a spider, 
now dipping at full speed for a floating gnat. A hollow rattling drew our attention upward, and there, gazing intently down at us, was a splendid woodpecker, the Guiana ivory bill, close kin to our ivory bill of the Florida swamps. Imagine a big woodpecker with dark brown back, wings, and tail, while the long erect crest, head, neck, and breast are bright scarlet, shading into rich rufous on the underparts. Such a beauty looked down at us, and then, without sign of fear, dived into a hole. The Indians, passing several times a day with loads of cordwood in their ballyhoos or flat-bottomed boats, were familiar with the woodpecker and asserted that the bird had no mate. It was a male, and although we visited the place several times, no female ever appeared. The dead tree which held the nest was called Aramaca by the Indians, and was about a foot and a half in diameter, with the entrance not less than sixty feet above the water. A living tree, like it on the bank nearby, had obtuse entire leaves and large brown, slightly curved pods. The trunk was rotten, especially at the water line, and as it could not have remained standing much longer, we decided to investigate the home of this little known bird. We hailed the first Indians who appeared and set them to work felling the tree. The woodpecker flew out at the first stroke of the axe and remained close by, showing little fear or anxiety. We landed, and the Indians made the trunk fall in our direction. It struck the water with a terrific splash, breaking into several lengths, and finally coming to rest with the hole upward. Running out along the floating log, we found that the nest contained a single bird with no trace of addled eggs or other young. The opening was a circle, four inches in diameter, and the cavity fourteen inches deep. The young bird was about five days old, featherless and downless, but the sprouting feather tracts were very distinct. On the edge of the branches of the lower mandible, about three-quarters of the way to their base, were two round white knobs or warts, and a large white patch like an abnormally large egg tooth, was at the tip of each mandible. These structures were undoubtedly direction marks for aiding the parent in finding the mouth of the young bird in the darkness of the nest chamber. When the mouth was open, they formed the four corners with the throat cavity in the center. A most remarkable collection of creatures gathered on the upper side of their wrecked tree, tenants of the bark and wood for the last year. Two small green-headed lizards made flying leaps and escaped ashore, but marooned for life were several species of bark beetles, Dicobates giganteus and Paxillus leachii, a huge boring beetle, and spiders galore. We noticed a slight disturbance among the bits of floating bark and pith and scooped up a most wonderful creature, a true bug, perfectly flat, with the sides of its body drawn out into irregular flat serrations, while in color it was the very essence of lichened bark or dead leaf. Placed on a piece of wood, it instantly drew in its legs and clung tightly. If it had not been frightened by the water, we could have handled it a dozen times without knowing it was an insect. A few yards away, a pair of mealy Amazon parrots were shrieking and flying restlessly about a great mora tree, but we could not discover their nest. On our way home, a dainty blue honey creeper alighted on the bow of our canoe, rich deep blue except for wings, tail, and throat which were black. The feet and legs were clear yellow, showing most conspicuously against the plumage. 
a pair of great green caciques had swung their four-foot pendant nest from the tallest limb of a tree standing in the water and we spent ten minutes watching the male court his mate as he uttered his incoherent medley of liquid cowbell like notes he bent his neck thrusting his head far downward and forward and at the same time throwing both wings forward and around in a semicircle as this curious action was completed the vocal utterance came to a close and the performance was over the early stages of the evolution of such a courtship may be observed in our common cowbird of the north and a further developed stage in the little guiana cowbird the city of the caciques on the first day of our arrival even before we came in sight of the clearing we heard the cries of the splendid big orioles or caciques known all over guiana as bunyas in the creek bed below the dam but within the radius of the clearing stood a medium-sized tree and among its branches a colony of scarlet-backed caciques were flying back and forth from their nests we made a mental note of them at the time but passed on giving them more than a glance later near the bungalow we occasionally saw them in small numbers associating as we have already stated with the lavender jays as we wished to take a number of young caciques back to new york with us and to study the colony as thoroughly as we could in the space of a week's time we started out early one morning for the caciques tree the long pendant nests were all seventy feet or more from the ground taking the rusty climbing irons from their case we recalled vividly the last time they had been in use a cold june day in nova scotia when the nesting hole of the three-toed woodpecker had been the goal how different were these tropical surroundings bravely the start up the tree was made jab and pull jab and pull while the straps pressed in on ankle and knee giving that peculiar sensation that cannot be described but which every climbing naturalist knows so well ten twenty thirty feet were scaled and then one's hand on the opposite side of the trunk broke through some tiny earthen tunnels and like many an unfortunate telegraph line man struck a live wire at least the sensation was very much the same only the electric shocks were here progressive and when they had reached the elbow they were seen to be a numerous and enthusiastically defensive horde of ants at one end a pair of jaws gave a firm point of leverage and attachment whereby the insect could secure a footing while operating the sting from the opposite end of his anatomy there have been martyrs to science as well as religion but much as one might desire to look at those nests only forty feet above it may be doubted if any man could have controlled his feelings and coordinated his muscles sufficiently to continue the ascent the details of the descent were hazy an exceedingly rough trunk seemed to shoot upward through one's embrace until the ground was reached and the caciques screamed their delight they had seen many of the four-footed folk foiled in a similar manner and now this new enemy who scaled the trunk with two hands and two spurs was equally baffled by the tiny allies of the birds but study the colony we must and selecting a line of soft springy underbrush we had an indian drop the tree on it a cloud of screaming caciques followed it to earth scattering only as we ran up and began to gather the young birds out of the first nest there rushed a lizard about a foot in length 
brown with head and forelegs bright green. He scurried like a streak of light across the red tailings, the speed sending him up on his hind legs so that his track was bipedal. Before we describe the condition of the colony as we found it when we reached the fallen tree, it will be interesting to record its early history as far as we know it. This was the first year of this colony of caciques, as last year there were none nearer the clearing than the mouth of Hurry Creek, three and one-half miles away, where in a tree overhanging the house of a black, a colony has been in existence for two years. Three months ago, in January, one scarlet-backed cacique was observed in the clearing at the mine, but it soon vanished. Within a few days, however, a number of these birds appeared, perhaps guided by the solitary scout. They set to work at once, establishing their new colony in the tree which we had cut down. So at the time we began to study this colony, it could not have been older than three months. The tree stood alone in the center of the tailings from the gold washing, and twenty or thirty feet away from all the surrounding trees. The finely sifted sediment of the tailings had broadened out the water of the creek bed so that it flowed delta-like on both sides of the tree. With their characteristic intelligence, the caciques had taken advantage of this unusual condition and were thus guarded from enemies by the water, by the isolation from other trees, and by the far more formidable stinging ants, which for many years had had their home on the trunk of the tree. The little bird city, as we found it, contained 39 houses, three quarters of which were on one branch, 70 feet from the ground, while 10 were suspended from a smaller branch, a few feet lower down. Of the 39 nests, four were only half finished, while ten were empty, having been already used and deserted this season. The others may be divided as follows. One nest contained an addled egg, white with brownish spots, chiefly at the larger end. One nest had one egg containing a weak old embryo. Two nests each had a skeleton of a well-grown young bird, one of which had been caught about the neck and the other about the legs by fine flexible tendrils which had caused their deaths. There were altogether 28 young birds, nine full-fledged, 16 with feathers just appearing, while three were recently hatched. They were distributed as follows. 14 nests containing one young bird, seven nests containing two young birds. The special distribution was as follows. Two well-fledged young in two nests, one well-fledged young in five nests, two partly-fledged young in four nests, one partly-fledged young in eight nests, two newly hatched birds in one nest, one newly hatched bird in one nest. The nests were typically cacique-like, made of stout rootlets and grasses, while at the lower end was a cup-shaped lining of very fine grass and root hairs, forming a soft bedding. The nests varied from 13 to 18 inches in length, and all but five had an upper roosting chamber built on above the entrance. These five were built directly beneath a group of others, and the bases of the ones above served as protecting roofs. This was a most interesting adaptation in varying conditions. Just before felling the tree, we noticed in several instances that both parents shared in the work of bringing food to the young ones. Almost all of the young were uninjured by the fall of the tree. Three were thrown out of the nests, and these we chloroformed in order to find what their food had been. The stomach of one was crammed with white seeds of two kinds, one nearly round and about as large as the head of a pin, while the others were longer, perhaps one-third of an inch in length. 
mingled with these seeds were remains of numerous insects beetles grasshoppers and caterpillars the two other birds which were younger and almost bare of feathers had received chiefly animal food as follows one a three inch smooth caterpillar medium-sized spider many small bugs and a mass of berry seeds number two several one inch cutworms spider small iridescent beetle yellow butterfly a few berry seeds the young birds were almost without down the adult plumage being outlined very shortly after hatching in a bird of only four or five days the dull orange or yellowish color of the rump feathers shows plainly when these break through their sheaths the color is a dull rose becoming redder as the feathers increase in length but not attaining the brilliant scarlet of the parent birds until the succeeding molt when full grown these birds measure about ten inches in length and are glossy black in color save only for the brilliant scarlet rump the bill is a conspicuous greenish white while the feet are black the eyes of the nestling are dark hazel in color while in the old birds the iris is of a most beautiful greenish blue the voice of the very young birds is a shrill incessant peep peep when they are gaping for food but the half-fledged youngsters utter solitary harsher notes under the same conditions the five fully fledged birds had learned what fear was and instead of feeding crouched down at the bottom of the artificial nest which mr crandall made for them but hunger overcame fear and before night all had taken food we kept an indian busy gathering a berry or fruit which looked tasted and smelled much like a miniature tomato the leaves of this low plant are large deeply incised and studded above and below with numerous thorns the plant is from three to six feet in height is abundant in the clearing and forms the favorite vegetable food of the caciques in addition to this the young birds had a few mealworms and ants eggs from our small store and all the soft insects which our indian could capture after two full days of grasshopper catching the pride of the noble red man began to feel itself injured and additional inducements in the way of tobacco were needed to sustain his interest in his orthopterous pursuits on the following day the oldest of the young caciques flew feebly to a low perch and nothing could induce him to return to his fellows again he uttered isolated call notes which however at the approach of food merged at once into the baby scream we had carried the young caciques a third of a mile to the veranda of the bungalow where they were put out of sight and sound of their parents yet early next morning four caciques had discovered their offspring and were flying back and forth close to the house carrying food in their beaks in an hour no fewer than twenty caciques had collected and on placing the young out in a low tree the parents came at once and fed them one bird which we watched carefully brought masses of caterpillars which it inserted within the wide mouth of the young although the young birds were mixed up five or six of the same size being placed together in one artificial nest yet there was no question about recognition on the part of the old birds at least there was no reckless undirected feeding certain young were fed by certain adults the second day after we had taken the young birds no caciques came to feed them and we found the reason was that the entire flock had begun to found a new colony in the very nearest tree to the one we had cut down about twenty feet away this too was isolated and protected both by shallow water and by the vicious tunneling ants some of the new nests must have been started the day before as the roost chambers were complete and in several the top of the nest itself was finished the rains had been rather heavy for a few days 
and may have influenced the early building of the shelters above the nest. To the three or four inches of nest, the birds were bringing beakfuls of fibers, both sexes working energetically. We were glad to know that our wholesale destruction of the first colony site had wrought no permanent change. At the rate the birds were building, the second colony would be in a flourishing state in another two weeks. These red-backed caciques, together with their near relatives, the yellowbacks, are most interesting birds, and a careful study of the growth and daily routine of a colony would yield most valuable results. They seem to trust more to the presence of man as a protection against enemies than to the guardianship of wasps, but both methods are to be found. We traced these birds all the way up the Barama, and from what we could learn, none were found higher up, the colony at Hurry Mine being the furthest outpost. Nightlife. Owing to our brief stay and the difficulty of exploration in this hilly and densely underwooded country, we gained little thorough knowledge of the vertebrate fauna hereabouts. The phase of tropical life which, during the week of our stay, was most striking was the wonderful host of insects attracted by the electric lights in the evening. The bungalow contained four large rooms, two on each side of a wide central passage extending through the house, a kind of interior veranda, open front and back. This was the dining room where every day we feasted upon delicious dishes of peccary, tinamou, curassow, and paca, or bush hog, mam, powie, and laba, as we learned to call them in the vernacular. Here during the evening meal, after the lights were turned on, came legions of the most curious, the most beautiful winged creatures imaginable. We all turned entomologists and never tired of admiring the wonderful colors and bizarre shapes which night after night were revealed in never-ending array. The first night Crandall sent up an excited call of, Get a vial! Get a vial! And this became our Vesper slogan. From the yard or veranda or room or kitchen hut would come the call from some of our party, Get a vial! and the one nearest the array of bottles in the improvised laboratory would hasten to the aid of the discoverer, who would probably be found with eyes glued to some strange creature and blindly reaching out behind for the approaching vial in which to capture his prize. There were few insects of very small size, and many indeed were gigantic, as judged by our standards of the north, None were unpleasant, and they seldom attempted suicide in soup or cocoa. They were content to flutter a moment about the electric globe and drop quietly to the white tablecloth. Praying mantises, or raw hosses, as our southern negroes call them, would whir in and climb awkwardly over the bouquets of flowers, swaying from side to side, and now and then reaching out for some passing insect with a sudden unflexing of those murderous, deceptive forelegs. One which flew on the table was a new species, which has been named Stagmomantus hurry. If exercise during meals is good for one's digestion, then we were hygienic in the extreme. For twenty times in succession, we would have to go to the veranda laboratory to chloroform our captives. The second evening, although a heavy rain was falling, a bewildering number of moths, mostly small but of exquisite patterns, dashed in between the drops. There were almost never two alike. Indeed, among one hundred species captured on two evenings, there were but two duplicates. It is folly to try to describe with any exactness the beauty even of the commonest, plainest insect, and how much more impossible to convey an accurate idea of these tropical beauties. 
think of a sapling near an electric light covered with 50 or 60 exquisite moon moths, Thysania agrippina, pale, creamy white, banded and looped with lines of brown, none less than nine inches in spread of wing, and many reaching an even foot across. The hawk moths that came to our table were all different, all beautiful, one a study in pale yellow, another variegated green with blended purples and red, Argeus labruscae on the hinder wings. This one, too, bore on its eyes the long shaft of a pollen stalk from some night flowering orchid. Then a moth would come, recalling somewhat the Promethea and Polyphemus of our childhood's collecting, but with great transparent mirrors in the center of the wings, Attacus, Hesperia, Ericina. Next, two as different as possible, but which we learned later were sexes of the same species, Dirphia tarquinia, the female, large, plain brown, with a forked streak of light across the forewings, her mate a full third smaller, with rosy hind wings and forewings frosted white, save for two conspicuous circles at the fork of his white lightning. On the third evening there were fewer moths, but many more beetles and grasshopper-like insects. Green was the predominating color among the moths this evening, from palest yellow-green to darkest bottle-green. In some the green had a border sending ray-like lines across all four wings. Yellow and white were the colors almost always present in combination with the green the yellow being usually confined to the hinder wings. A stain of gold was sometimes laid over the green, and in one beauty the green seemed to have spattered a hazard over a milky white surface. This proved to be a female of a species known only from a single male, Rachiolopha nivectata, the female proving to be twice as large as her mate. Instead of burying the insects in envelopes or mounting them in the orthodox way with the four wings raised unnaturally until the hind edge is at right angles to the body, we merely supported the wings and allowed them to dry in the natural position. By doing this, we usually lost sight of a part of the hinder wing, but we gained the true relation of the spots and patterns on the four wings to those on the thorax, and the result was in many instances surprising. For example, when spread, the four wings of one tiny moth, Pronola fraterna, showed two meaningless black spots forming each one-third of a circle. When closed naturally, these united with the black abdomen to form a perfect black circle stamped upon a mat of velvety cream color. All words are inadequate to describe these exquisite creatures, one with the lightning flash of gold across its cloudy background, another inscribed with Chinese hieroglyphics, a third of lavender, yellow, and russet mosaics set about large transparent windows of opalescent blue. One of the most exquisite was a little moth, Chrysocestus fimbriaria, spreading less than an inch with wings of iridescent mother-of-pearl, rimmed with dull golden, on which was set a score of embossed beads of the most brilliant gilt, flashing as no gem ever flashed. If one could spend a season here, studying the motions alone of these insects, it would well repay him. One moth iridescent with a broad border of black, Eudioptus hyalinata, curled the abdomen straight up into the air and separated its extremity into a widespread tuft of hairs. These radiated like the tentacles of a sea anemone, and when the hole was waved about, it looked like some strange crawling caterpillar holding its head high above the prostrate wings of the moth. 
The last evening, as if to make our departure still harder, the insects increased in number. Walking sticks, five and six inches in length, skimmed through the air. Their bodies, legs, and wings dark in color and ornamented with irregular scales and projections until their resemblance to a jagged barked twig was perfection. If this species were represented by thousands of individuals in its haunts, birds or four-footed enemies would soon learn to detect even such an exact counterfeit and the protective value would be lost. But in the tropics, the infinite variety is the keynote to success in protective adaptation. On the tablecloth at one time would be perfect green leaves, Katie did like orthopters, green leaves with large worm-eaten defects or spottings, some of the mantises, and many brown lichened leaves and twigs, moths and walking sticks. Even if two of the same species appeared at once, the chances were that one would be much the larger and of an entirely different shade with a distinct individual pattern of mimic defects. Big owl moths, Hypercheria liberia, Hypercheria nausica, Automeria cinctistriga, and others, alternated with tree hoppers of all sizes, with branched and rebranched horns rising from their thoraxes. Hemicticha umbonia spinosa, and others. The prize of one evening was a grasshopper, Terochroia ocellata, which came in on the sleeve of the coolie butler. It had alighted on the white cloth as he crossed the yard between the kitchen and the house. Its wide, jagged forewings met closely above the back, forming a half green, half brown leaf complete even to the mid and side ribs. On the hind wings were what we would merely guess were either sexual ornaments or warning markings, visible only in flight. The ground color of these translucent wings was a finely mottled yellow and brown, while painted on the pleated surface were two eye spots, like those upon the feathers of a peacock pheasant, a dark, velvety shaded portion with a delicately shaded ocellus at one edge. The last insect captured was a tree hopper, as big as a cicada, mottled and marbled on the forewings and stained scarlet on the hinder. In Appendix C, pages 397-398, I have added a list of a few of the moths and orthoptera collected on the dining table at Hurry which have been identified. End of chapter 6The most interesting observation we made on the launch trip from Hoori Creek down the Barama River was of a flocking of more than 200 big green caciques, the birds of the liquid cowbell notes, which passed low overhead with a roar of cackling voices and a loud whistling of wings, bound for some safe roosting place still another species to exhibit this common roosting habit. We found Farnham's deserted, the family having gone down to Georgetown, so we took possession of the empty house, swinging our hammocks on the porch and watching the sun sink over the river with the dark forest beyond growing ever darker. As we had been told that there were no mosquitoes, we had not hung our hammock nets and the droning hum of these miserable pests kept us awake for hours. From across the river came the discontinuous labored puffs of an overloaded freight train pulling up a grade. Now and then the wheels would slip and four or five chugs would come in quick succession. One could imagine the heavy trail of smoke and sparks, 
the shining rails and the long line of heavy slowly moving cars then the sound ceased and far down the river another frog took up the chugging now and then the voice of a red baboon came to our ears and continually the mosquitoes zoomed and on the floor below our hammocks the dog whined unceasingly as he scratched his bet rouge when we opened our eyes lightning bugs of several candle power flashed above us in the thatch of the porch and by their light we could see big tarantulas dragging their prey here and there seeming ready to drop with fatigue at any moment all the sounds of the wilderness are lulling save that of mosquitoes when one is netless many times that night we wished ourselves back in the boat we had heard that there was a coast-wise way of returning to georgetown threading little known rivers and creeks in a small canoe the idea of exploring those charming little creeks at which all through the journey we had looked with longing was fascinating to us and we owe this realization of our dreams to mrs wilshire who planned the trip and gave it to us as a surprise this proved to be the most wonderful canoe voyage which any of us had ever taken for five days we were paddled portaged towed and pushed through a wonderland abounding in rarely beautiful birds butterflies and orchids we slept at night under our tiny tarpaulin or invaded and were made welcome at little isolated indian missions our pen falters at the thought of attempting to give any idea of the wonders of that trip but day by day we set down our impressions as best we could and here are some of them it was almost noon on the sixteenth of march before we had our men luggage and canoe in readiness to start pushing off we said good-bye to the rest of the party including crandall and his precious cargo of red-backed caciques and other live birds they were to return via morahana and the mazaruni direct to georgetown we secured a little canoe or ballyhoo about fifteen feet long with a tarpaulin stretched over the center in the bow were four indian paddlers two men and two boys while in the stern as steersman and paddler was a splendidly built carib indian marciano chief of the hoori woodmen amidships we piled our luggage and we distributed ourselves over and around the clothing bags and larder boxes mr and mrs wilshire and we too composed the list of passengers and the unceasing pleasure of those five days was a good test of mutual congeniality and adaptability to bush travel the stroke adopted by our indians was a peculiar one which we were to hear all day and often throughout the night for these men of the wilderness short and stocky in build seemed tireless and hour after hour they would keep hard at work sometimes for as much as thirty-six hours at a stretch with only a brief nap or two the indian paddle rhythm set by little pedro the younger boy in the bow accentuated every other stroke the tempo of the strokes becoming more and more rapid until when further speed was impossible one stroke was suddenly omitted and the gap thus formed marked the new slow tempo which in turn in the course of fifteen to twenty strokes of the paddle would work up to a climax and the former rhythm begin again all kept perfect time the new change not being inaugurated on any exact stroke but the others seeming to know instinctively when it would come whether they were eating talking or looking behind them it was the same all changed as one man two or three hours after starting we made a landing in order that the indians could cook their breakfast invariably composed of a combination of pork dried fish rice and cassava 
this menu was varied only when one or more of the ingredients happened not to be procurable sometimes for many days the guiana indians worked hard upon nothing but cassava the jungle was thick about the little clearing which they made for a fire and word passed rapidly along the lines of parasol ants that manna was available in the form of rice and breadcrumbs a few minutes after a bit of food was thrown down it would mysteriously take legs to itself and begin to walk away the motor power being myriads of these interesting insects big-headed soldiers patrolled all along the winding trail of foragers troubling no one unless they were disturbed or the workers attacked several species of orchids brassias and others unknown to us were in blossom all about us on we went again becoming more and more delighted with our method of travel there was no puffing smelly kerosene engine no clatter of many tongues and we were close to the water with nothing overhead between us and the sky or the overhanging branches the typical river birds paid little attention to our silent craft and we were able to watch giant kingfishers guiana cormorants snake birds parakeets and swallows at close range in sheltered places along the bank our canoe pushed through unbroken masses of the floating rosettes of leaves known as the shell flower Pistia stratiotes. The leaves are shell shaped, thick, strongly ribbed, and light velvety green in color, covered with a coat of short, dense hairs which repel the water so that when pushed beneath the surface the plant bobs up as dry as before. Thousands of these little plants become detached from their sheltered bays and are carried out to sea where they decay and disappear small water hyacinths were less common the river was full from recent rains in the interior and in some places for several hundred yards the surface was thickly covered with innumerable small yellow blossoms splashed with scarlet at their hearts while every now and then a large purple pea blossom would be seen these had doubtless fallen from the treetops where the river was narrower and the vines and branches overhung the stream. Many insects were carried down afloat on the blossoms, and now and then a great hairy tarantula would appear with each of its eight feet in a blossom, trying to keep his balance until he could reach solid ground again. Agami herons, beautiful in their plumage of glossy green, chestnut and blue were standing here and there in the shallows snatching the insects from the petals as they floated past at four o'clock in the afternoon we left the baramani river which had averaged about two hundred feet in width and entered the charming little biara which was only about sixty feet from shore to shore here the vegetation was very dense water lilies in hundreds with curious serrated leaves and a profusion of the sweetest of flowers we were paddling through literally a river of water lilies clavelina blooms hung low over our faces wild cocoa pods showed rich brown among the foliage mucka mucka with its great heart-shaped leaves was everywhere a plant which on a later trip was to interest us as forming the food of the hoatzin the air was filled with the sweet penetrating calls of the gold birds and wood hewers and now and then the puppy-like yaps of toucans pendant nests were numerous built so far out over the water that we could touch them as we passed thus safe from marauding monkey and opossum the stream was dotted with islets varying from a few inches to as many yards in circumference crowded with ferns and graceful sedges all perfectly reflected in the mirror like water one such islet of the smallest size was crowned with a single petaled white calla lily 
surrounded by a host of tiny purple orchid blossoms a square foot of perfect beauty and perfume set in the ebony water seldom were we out of sight of flowering orchid vine bush or tree orchids were in the ascendant and our tarpaulin brushed against long golden showers graceful shoots of cattleyas and curious green spider orchids there seems to be no autumn in this land and death comes only to single leaves while the variegated scarlet and yellow hues of new sprouting foliage made brilliant every bend of the stream the moriche or etta palm is dominant here and the vegetation of these lesser streams is dense and bushy intimate and delightful rather than grand and awe-inspiring as along the forest rim of the barama toucans and ant birds darted across the water ahead of us tree ferns stretched out their graceful fronds and sifted their pollen down upon us the bird songs of this region are not long and elaborate but there was no dearth of most delightful liquid phrases usually loud and penetrating six songs all wholly unlike one another reached us that day all unknown mysterious we steered close to the bank and picked a wild cocoa pod but found it unripe and the beans had only a raw aroma two long snouted weevils crawled from the heart of the pod one of the myriad hidden forms of life in this wonderland now and then we passed a little open grassy savanna where the water was no longer brown but a clear black from the steeping of the decaying vegetation in many places the water leaves showed where manatees had been browsing and occasionally we caught sight of the huge ungainly creatures as they swam slowly upstream or nosed the vegetation along the bank all this and much else we passed in an hour and at five o'clock entered a third stream the barra barra the whole country hereabouts is swampy so when at dark we stopped for our evening meal we did not land but rested quietly among the lily pads the indians ate as they did everything else silently with only now and then some low guttural ejaculation we flashed our powerful electric light upon the lily pads and found that the water was full of active life scores of little fishes were resting motionless in the thin film of water covering the lily leaves some with the basal half of the body and two lines up and down from the eyes black marciano called them salaver in addition to other very slender fish there were numbers of little freshwater prawns shooting about among the maze of fanwort beneath the pads the glint of strange shapes came to us tiny cyclops and others which the human eye was powerless to name without a microscope we sat in the darkness listening to the sounds of the swampy jungle not a mosquito hummed and the frogs eclipsed all other lesser noises calling in basso and treble with tinkling bells and a clear ringing chime like the aeolian singing of a telegraph wire marciano climbed back to his seat in the stern gave an order and the paddles pushed sluggishly through the pads carrying fear and tumult to thousands of little aquatic lives the next four hours we shall never forget as long as we live on and on we went through the pitchy darkness guided solely by the light of the little bow lantern the bush ropes ahead stood out in sharp silhouette like giant serpents coiled in mid-air across our path the night seemed to press in on our tiny atom of life the shadows of the waving arms of the paddlers were thrown on the foliage behind the boat looking like some huge spider-like thing forever following it the sheets and drops of water thrown up by the indians gleamed like molten silver the open savannas increased in size 
and extended further on each side than the shaft of electric light could carry great tufts of pampas grass towered high above our heads drooping gracefully outward in all directions the channel narrowed and the lily blossoms increased until the water was thickly studded with them their odor hung heavy on the air and when one of the blossoms itself was smelled the perfume was as sweet and as overpowering as chloroform during the day they had been all but odorless for miles we pushed through the tangle of water plants in places the men having to drag and push the boat over the reeds and grasses crushing scores of spider lilies with the keel this is the backwater divide between the rivers which flow northward into the waini and those which flow to the south during the dry season this route becomes impassable later we came to open pond like spaces and here we found another species of water lily with a smaller flower and a smooth edged leaf with maroon colored underside owls large moths and bats occasionally flitted across the field of light it was half past ten at night when marciano told us that we were turning into the maruca river we were to follow this river down to the very sea but here it was barely distinguishable as a narrow channel through the grass and reeds another hour passed and several dark forms loomed up in the dim light of our lantern and when we reached them we found that they were boats tied to a rough sort of landing we climbed out and stumbled sleepily about getting the cramped feeling out of our bodies then when the indians had tied up the boat and slung our hammock bags over their backs we followed them up the long avenue of lofty coconut palms which stretched down to the water's edge we felt our way slowly in the darkness walking stiffly and uncertainly after the cramped position in which we had been compelled to sit for so many hours at last marciano held high his lantern and we saw towering before us a huge white cross instinctively we all paused reverently whatever one's faith may be it is impossible to come thus upon the symbol of a great and ancient church standing in the midst of a vast and primeval wilderness without a feeling of awe and reverence there in the teeming ceaseless life of the wilderness was the mystery of creation and there stood the white cross a symbol of man's attempt to solve the tremendous problem of creation and immortality the light revealed a crude little church with an adjoining building standing behind the cross to this other building the indians led us we knocked gently then harder then pounded no response half a dozen dogs gathered and howled mournfully at last finding a side door ajar we entered a spacious room part dining room part schoolroom with a loom and a half-finished indian hammock in one corner we called and shouted we pounded on the floor and walls and at last from the distance upstairs came an answering roar down to us came the jolliest priest we ever hoped to meet two strange men and women had invaded his castle at midnight routing him out of well-earned rest and yet his welcome was as warm as though we were expected friends our jovial host furnished us with lights and gave us permission to sling our hammocks from the rafters of the great schoolroom about one o'clock in the morning we rolled into our swinging couches completely tired out but sleep was not to be had at once an ominous gritting squeak was heard then another and our faces were softly fanned by invisible wings vampires came the exclamation from the furthermost hammock never mind them answered a sleepy voice from mr wilshire's hammock doctors say bleeding is healthful the scientist echoed his sentiments but in vain 
we had to dive down into the clothing bags and pull out the hammock nets now these articles are somewhat difficult to adjust under the best of conditions and this night they were perversity itself we found that in the packing at hoorie the nets had become mixed and two were of an unknown pattern with apparently no entrance hole except at the ends a hammock net is shaped like a buttoned up coat with a hammock running through the sleeve portions it is an acrobatic feat not soon to be forgotten when one is dead tired and in the dark and has to enter his net by climbing up to the end of the hammock rope and sliding down through a small long chute of netting it was two in the morning before we were settled and as we finally dropped asleep a score of fierce little demon faces were squeaking and gibbering at us at six o'clock the following morning we were awakened by a dozen little naked indian boys flitting silently about peering at us like tiny copper elves or like human incarnations of the bats which had hovered about us during the night going outdoors in the dusk we heard a perfect medley of bird notes wrens thrushes tanagers seed eaters all giving voice at once while from the further end of the coconut walk came a chorus from a colony of yellow-backed caciques we saw the mission cat teasing something and took from her a tiny opossum with fur of richest brown and no larger than a mouse the little creature was unhurt but played possum until it recovered from its fear when it made itself at home in a small suitcase when our jolly priest appeared to wish us good morning the little indian lads bowed their bronze figures reverently and kissed his hand some of them busied themselves weaving a hammock while others set the table and later served us at breakfast our priest was like the genial monk of a medieval story he was delightful with his tribe of small indian boys ordering them about in a great voice but with his eyes beaming with affection for them man alive he would shout bring the finger bowls and to our amazement the wee naked valet not only knew what finger bowls were but actually produced them passing them around the table with colossal dignity that man's a linguist the father added he speaks english spanish and several indian dialects the good father's heart was overflowing with kindness toward every living thing he could not even bear to see his cat waiting hungrily for her breakfast but ordered his small butler at once to give her some milk we wondered why the father's indian boys had such straight slim well-proportioned figures instead of the unwieldy cassava stomachs so characteristic of the little savage indians with a twinkle in his eye the father told us that his first step in converting the small indian lad to christianity was a huge dose of castor oil then regular hours and regular meals of nourishing food instead of allowing them to munch cassava all day then one might proceed by teaching them the doctrine and always a useful trade while after that was achieved there was plenty of time for a more literary education if the individual warranted it he had reason to be proud of his method for in all our travels we never met a missionary whose works spoke louder than those of father gillette for the most successful and worthy indians in the colony had been trained by him some of them had become excellent engineers others priests and still others had learned good trades after breakfast the father took us through the chapel followed by his dusky little tribe all crossing themselves piously before the altar he showed us with pride the decorations of the altar and the ceiling all the work of himself and his little indians the ceiling represented the dome of heaven bright blue and dotted with a multitude of white stars when we called our little pedro the youngest of our indian paddlers to tell marciano that we were ready father gillette's eyes filled with tears and he said 
is your name pedro i lost a lovely pedro he died of fever last easter i did not know i could miss him so much he used to talk to me he was not like the other indian boys he loved to talk then turning to us he added simply it is a lonely life sometimes you know end of section fourteen section fifteen of our search for a wilderness by mary blair b b this librivox recording is in the public domain we were told that white women had never before passed through that part of british guiana so unexpectedly did we arrive at midnight and so early did we depart next morning that perhaps our visit seems as unreal to the good father as it sometimes does to us like a very vivid dream which we can never forget he loaded us with gifts of coconuts and fruit and in the fresh coolness of early morning we again set forth on our journey just as we were paddling away the father ordered all his small boys into the water for their regular morning swim head first they went splashing about as gaily as a school of strange copper-colored fish we found as we went on that the maruca changed rapidly in character it was no wider but the water lilies and pampas grass disappeared and a softer finer grass covered the marsh dotted with a host of purple and yellow flowers rising from some aquatic plant isolated trees became more numerous and great woodpeckers resembling our splendid ivory bills looped here and there swallow-tailed kites dipped and soared and kiskadees shrieked near the occasional huts of the indians at noon we lunched on herbs wurst and jam at a protestant mission waramuri where a small colony of red-backed caciques were established a school of about fifty indian children were studying and reciting at the top of their lungs we left in an hour and from here on the maruca widened and consequently lost somewhat in interest the low elevation on which the english mission is built is composed wholly of fine white sand and beyond this mangroves began to appear and the foliage became less diversified we landed for an hour at a small coconut plantation and found a most ingenious method of improving time and space until the main crops should yield rice was planted in long narrow trenches which are flooded twice a day between these trenches the young coconut palms are placed and in the spaces separating the palms cassava and coffee are grown while between them in turn and around the edge of the trenches were plantain and tania the catch crops are thus made to pay for the price of the land and labor land virgin forest can be empoldered and ditched for thirty-five dollars an acre the first year's two rice crops will repay this and continue to do so for five years when the coconuts will yield a regular income for fifty or sixty years this at least is the calculation of the agriculturist deer peccaries and capybara are found on this little clearing and we saw several of the latter animals running about among the underbrush on the bank mealy amazon parrots were nesting in an inaccessible stub ant birds of several species were by far the most abundant birds everywhere the undergrowth was flaming with sharp pointed scarlet blossoms on long stalks which a native called wild plantains below the plantation mangroves composed the only vegetation visible along the banks of the river and before long our canoe began to rise and fall with the swell of the sea for days the smell of the damp tropical marshes had filled the air and now we sniffed eagerly at the invigorating salt breeze we lowered the tarpaulin tied everything fast and prepared balers under the direction of marciano at last rounding a curve of the river we came in sight of the sea a vast stretch of turbulent 
brown water a kakoi heron and an american egret flew away with protesting croaks and we began to pitch and toss as we turned south beyond the outermost sprawling mangrove roots we had been warned on no account to make this part of the trip with other than full-blooded indian paddlers and when we saw the need for steady skillful work we were indeed glad that we had marciano and his good crew the waves were too muddy to break but they rolled high over the low rail of our canoe and we were soon soaked through and had to bail steadily to keep the frail craft from filling in the midst of all the excitement three splendid flamingos flew overhead one close behind the other necks and legs extended to the full we watched them until our eyes ached and then a dash of several quarts of salt muddy water in our faces brought us suddenly back to grim reality after we had paddled three or four miles we entered the broad mouth of the pomeroon turned close in along shore and finding a sheltered bite waited for the turning of the tide and to give our indians a much needed rest the heavily laden canoe had given them a hard paddle against the wind and tide and we were to travel onward throughout all the night as dusk settled down a frigate bird swooped past followed by a large flock of several hundred boat-billed herons croaking like their relatives the night herons and on their way doubtless from some roosting place to their nocturnal feeding grounds for as they reached the water they scattered some going up the river others along the shore from the east straight across the whole width of the pomeroon came another great flocking a host of mealy amazon parrots flying as usual two and two close together by hundreds and by thousands they turned south along our bank and flew inland and were joined almost over the spot where our canoe was moored by another great multitude of their kind coming steadily down the coast at the very lowest estimate there were eight or ten thousand parrots once and only once we saw a solitary individual unaccompanied by a mate while still in view he attempted to attach himself to a pair of birds whereupon both dashed at the unfortunate intruder and drove him headlong out of sight below the level of the branches it is indeed a serious thing to lose one's mate if one is a parrot to be a widow or a widower is to be an outcast at ten minutes past six the parrots vanished in the dusk and true to its name a six o'clock bee a species of large cicada sent out its shrill whistle from the mangrove to which our canoe was tied here for the first time since we left farnham's we encountered mosquitoes and sand flies but oil of tar did much to discourage them it is a curious fact that although the prevailing wind blows in the direction from which we had come yet these troublesome insects are said never to pass beyond the line of the pomeroon's mouth after an hour of paddling we stopped for a supply of water at a tiny portuguese store built on piles and going by the name of pokapu it was a weird little place with rows of tiny shelves on which were bottles of lemon soda which was remarkably good and an assortment of ribbons knives and paddles for trade with the indians we purchased some well-made carob indian baskets and stumbled over a caged guan or maroodie as they called it ordered it sent to georgetown where it appeared the following week and is now a contented inmate of the new york zoological park at nine o'clock we started on our all-night paddle up the pomeroon like most tropical nights near the sea the air was chilly we rolled up in our blankets and anointed our faces with the tar oil the scientist chose as his night's couch one of the long sloping side seats the slope was only a fraction of a degree 
but gravity and drowsiness would invariably cause the downfall of the occupant of the seat much to the disturbance of the canoe's equilibrium as we lay and listened to the strange rhythm of the paddles and watched the brown current swash past the side of the boat we thought of all the exciting scenes this river and this coast had witnessed the ill-fated search for el dorado by sir walter raleigh then the capture and recapture of the colony no less than three times by dutch and british later came a period of great prosperity when hundreds of sugar plantations yielded great profits to their owners and the social life was as gay as that of our old virginia then followed the ruin of the sugar industry bands of runaway slaves taking to the wilderness and now today the chimneys of the old mills are often the only marks of former civilization which the jungle has not obliterated we skirted the mangroves for hours and saw nothing but an endless succession of those weird stilted plants while scores of four-eyed fish skipped and slithered over the mud or dashed across our bow attracted by the glow of our lantern in the electric light they looked pale and ghostly against the black mud at midnight we passed a light which showed the location of marlborough police station two hours later we heard weird music from a tom-tom and a four-toned fife or flute crude as it was it had a wild melody and the syncopated or ragtime was perfect we could see the hut near the water and hear the shouts of the dancers as we passed down the center of the river we were hailed by a canoe of half-drunken negroes who put off and wished to accompany us up the river marciano gave a low command and one of the indians muffled the lantern then all swung together in a new rhythm the full speed paddle rhythm of the caribs and we fairly flew through the water after every five minutes spurt our crew rested for a few seconds to locate our unwelcome pursuers at first they cursed us and paddled furiously but their tipsy efforts were no match for our lithe red men and the negroes soon dropped out of sight and hearing there was no moon but throughout all the night whenever we awoke the southern cross gleamed brilliantly down at us and almost in the zenith orion stood ever poised in his gigantic stride as usual frogs and toads furnished most of the nocturnal music and we spent an hour or more in classifying the various utterances among them was the telegraph toad who spoke in a regular make and break morse code sending his wireless messages to his mate another heard more rarely was what we called the wing beat frog this species gave out a muffled throbbing roar like the hurried wing beats of a swan in full flight it would last for five seconds to be answered instantly by another across the river from the wonderland of the narrow biara we had come out upon the boundless expanse of the ocean passing thence to this splendid river a half mile across but we had far from finished the experiences and variety of this ever to be remembered trip at daybreak we pushed through a tangled mass of lilies and water hyacinths into a tiny caño or creek and in a soft rain while the tired indians slept beneath protecting palm leaves we cooked herbswurst and cocoa the morning chorus was infinitely sweet from flocks of invisible songsters a trembling descending chord of three notes rising at the end in a plaintive questioning way at eight o'clock we went on again the indians apparently perfectly rested after their two hours sleep the pomeroon narrowed to about a hundred yards mangroves disappeared and mucka mucka with its oblong pineapple-like fruit took their place flowers were abundant white convolvulus wild sorrel pink with deep corollas large yellow blossoms with scarlet hearts and many other varieties four-eyed fish were still common 
and great rufous cuckoos, lesser kiskadees, and swallow-tailed kites were building nests. At Pickersgill Police Station, we stopped for lunch. These posts are the sole representatives of law and order in the wilderness, and here the semi-military organization of Negro police have their quarters. Most of them are men of unusually large size, and in disposition they are pleasant and obliging. They never fail to do their best to make us comfortable. The duty of these men is varied. Besides being responsible for the good conduct of the inhabitants of their districts, they keep account of shipments and all passing boats and passengers, and stand ready to run down, or rather paddle down, fugitives from justice. At each post are little rooms reserved for travelers, and here any strangers with proper credentials are at liberty to swing their hammocks and make themselves at home. The sergeant had just trapped a half dozen pretty blue and yellow violet euphonia tanagers in a mango tree near the station. The usual colony of yellow-backed caciques was deserted at the time of our visit, but had been occupied twice during the last year. Lying half in the water in front of the house was an anaconda, fifteen feet long, which had just been shot. We purchased thirty bananas for four pence, and with fried bananas and bacon, the unfailing and never cloying herbswurst, jam, educator crackers, and lime squash, we had a meal fit for the gods. At this point we left the Pomeroon and turned up the Harlepiaca for two hours, then into the last real river of our trip, the Tapacuma. This river was only about 75 feet wide, and with vegetation neither grand nor very luxuriant, principally etta palms and mucka mucka. While cocoa and clavelina blossoms were everywhere, and numerous lesser kiskadees were building, many small deserted estates appeared as the river grew narrower, and morpho butterflies and silver-beaked tanagers haunted the half-overgrown ruins. Catching sight of a snake on an overhanging branch, we persuaded Marciano to steer close to it, but as we reached out to seize it, our Indian's fears overcame him, and he swung out quickly, the serpent making its escape into the water. It was a harmless species, about five feet long and yellow-brown in color, with the exception of the dead anaconda, it was the only snake we had seen on our trip. When we commented on this, Marciano relieved his feelings in two words, me glad. It was dead high tide, although the water was fresh, backed up by the salt tide further down. The surface seemed to be covered with rubbish, and at first glance it looked as unsavory as the water in a New York ferry slip. But when we examined it, the floatsome proved to be composed of a host of various nuts and seeds, many of which were beginning to send out roots and leaflets. They were of all shapes and sizes, from large flat disc-like pods and round vegetable ivory nuts to smaller ones covered with corrugated husks fluted or polished like metal. The river became still more narrow and twisted and turned to every point of the compass. Flowers were abundant and we noted at least twenty species with large and conspicuous blooms. A bluebell blossom was especially characteristic of the Tapacuma, growing up from the water six to thirty inches. There were few lilies, and the predominating tree was one with sensitive foliage, which went to sleep in the late afternoon. Several species of orchids in full flower were common, and from one branch we pulled into the canoe a string of a dozen plants of a most fragrant white orchid, Epidendrum nocturnum. The whole region was very different from that of the Biara, but no less interesting. Just before sunset, we came to the fairyland of Tapacuma Lake. We had zigzagged through many miles of tortuous channels, with copper-colored Indian hunters passing us now and then, silently in their small canoes. 
at last we came to a portage a gentle slope up which our canoe was dragged over the divide and into the great grassy expanse of water savanna in the center of which is the dark deep lake we walked a few yards into the woods to see some falls which turned out to be only a moderately foamy rapid and on the way we disturbed a large troop of monkeys which limbed off slowly through the branches and then hurried back to our boat for we were still far from anna regina where we planned to spend the night on and on we went the darkness settling quickly down a new castanet frog raised its voice this was really remarkable a syncopated oriental rhythm clicking musically and held by one frog for only a minute or two when another instantly took up the little tune this shifting of place the music sounding first here then further on made it seem as if some invisible dancer were swiftly whirling over the reeds and tools we could hear the clicking of the castanets and the tinkling of anklets and the thought was made more vivid as a bejeweled coolie woman passed us in a long narrow dugout paddled swiftly by her husband the water was very high and a wide new channel among the grasses so confused marciano that we paddled for an hour before we realized that we were lost we changed direction and guided ourselves by the stars passing some dense grass through which we had to push laboriously at last marciano sent a clear penetrating call through the night and the coolie answered far ahead and to the left we called twice after that and then came into a canal and soon were alongside two canoes blocked by a lock we would have as soon expected to find a motor car here in the wilderness as a canal lock but nevertheless there was a canal lock with no one to operate it by our combined efforts we opened it passed through and found ourselves surrounded by miles of sugar-cane fields we had entered the back door as it were of the great sugar plantation of anna regina one of the few which are still in operation we were on the home stretch and the indian boys towed us the remaining distance running at full speed tumbling head over heels into the water and forgetting for once their usual indian stolidness they giggled and chattered as if they were out for a lark instead of having paddled a heavily laden canoe on thirty-six hour stretches at midnight we reached the end of the canal and a hundred yards up a road we found the anna regina police station the guard turned out cleared away the judge's bench and witness box in the courtroom and laid blankets for us on the benches as there were no rafters for our hammock ropes our indians would not come near the dreaded prison house but left our baggage at the entrance they said good-bye as they were to start back at once we had grown to have a real affection for these simple men and boys and found them the best of traveling companions silent courteous and wonderful workers may the time come when marciano will again pilot us through that beautiful region to which no pen or camera can do the slightest justice the following morning after a walk through the neighboring coolie village of henrietta where we purchased some yellow-bellied calistes and other birds we secured a carriage with a horse and a mule as motor power and drove to sudi taking the steamer thence down the essequibo river to georgetown end of section fifteen end of chapter seven through the coastal wilderness with indians and canoe